as some people are coming in. Welcome, everyone. I see Don. I see some other people joining us here today. Hi, I'm Bastian. Um, we're going to start today at 9.30. Feel free to hang out and chat amongst yourselves if you feel like it. This uh, is already live on YouTube. Um, anyways, welcome.
Is it before the play? No, this is for my content. Before you play. Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Bastian. Um, we get started just a little while over here. Glad that people are piling in. 
seeing some names for the first presenters already makes me very happy. Thanks for coming. Um, some familiar faces too. Good to see you guys back. Um, yeah, like I said, we'll get started in just a little while over here. Hello. Hey, Stefan, good to see you. We have quite a few people here. That's quite nice. Yes, I'm excited too. No sign of Dan yet. Hoping, hoping he'll uh, join us soon. If not, we'll just get started without him, I say. Hi, Elke, how are you? Hi, thanks, fine. I don't know whether Dan will show up because it's half past four, I think, in the morning. Oh, that's right. That's right. Hi, it's, he's, in, he's on Hawaii time. I forgot about that. You're right. <clears throat> well, um, we, we optimized the presentation slots for the, for the authors, right? Um, we have... Uh, uh, two presentations from Singapore, and uh, I suppose, oh, oh, Christopher is here. Hi, how's it going, guy? Hey, <laughs> we are grateful for the optimization. <laughs> you're, you're welcome. Um, let, let's just say we know the pain, so uh, yeah. we'll, we'll get you guys. We'll get you guys going quickly here, so uh, you guys can have your well-deserved sleep in just a little <laughs> while. And then watch the watch the rest of the conference tomorrow morning when uh, the live stream will be on will be on YouTube, and you can watch it then. Exactly, over breakfast. That's right. Well, my friends, it's 9.30. Good morning, good evening, good day, wherever you are. Um, happy New Year to all of you. Um, very happy that you all joined us here today. i also like to welcome you on behalf of uh, the track chairs, Patrick and Dan, who um, on Hawaii time uh, haven't quite made it yet here yet, but they'll join us soon, I'm very certain. I'd also like to welcome you uh, on behalf of the steering committee members, some of 
which are here, for example, Elke and Stefan, and Don is here. And uh, uh, I'm not sure if I'm seeing anyone else right now. There's so many names. If I miss, if I forget you, I'm sorry. Anyways, welcome to the 33rd Software Engineering Education and Training Conference, part of HICS, the Hawaiian International Conference for System Sciences. This is the second time we're joining HICS in this format. Well, it's the first time we're doing this virtually, but the second time a CC conference is happening virtually. We've had some experience with that last year. My friends, we'll, you'll see the, the program here on your screen, I hope. Um, well, you all made it here, so uh, I'm sure you all found the, um, found the Zoom link. This is great. Just for the record, this meeting is being live streamed to YouTube, so don't don't say things that you'll regret eventually. Um, I'll try to do the same. We've got several talks today uh, in several sessions. Um, uh, Stefan will take care. He agreed um, for to, to chair the first session. So without further ado, I'll give over to Stefan. Yeah, thanks for the nice introduction, Bastian, and also welcome from my side. Nice that we have uh, 33 people and more and more joining in this presentation slots on, on these presentation slots today. I guess um, we will start right away. So I would ask Christopher Poskit um, to take over. I hope you can share your screen and start with your presentation and let us know why we should mind the gap. <laughs> sure, I just need the, the, the current person sharing to stop sharing and then I think it will let me uh, click the link. Let me try one more time. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes. Lovely. So, so you uh, have you uh, 15 minutes in total. Um, please give us uh, some time for questions in the end as well and go ahead. I shall try my best. So thank you very much and good evening from, uh, from Singapore. Uh, so my name is Chris and I'm presenting essentially what's an experience report on behalf of my wonderful colleagues, Kyong Yimeng and Hong Seng as well. Um, so this, is, this paper is essentially about our adaptation of a course to the synchronous hybrid classroom, uh, which was a format that was sort of imposed on us during the, the COVID times, uh, where we're teaching physical and remote students at the same time. Uh, so the gap here is essentially about the, uh, the experience gap between those two halves of the cohort and trying to sort of uh, minimize that gap as much as one uh, possibly can. So as I say in the title over here, uh, we, we were targeting a programming course. And in particular, it was a web development course focusing on front-end stuff. Uh, so for our students, this is uh, quite a lot of things that they have to learn for the first time in this information systems program, CSS, like HTML, JavaScript, Bootstrap library, and uh, Vue. So it's quite technical, lots of concepts that they have to uh, learn at the same time. Um, so the way that we, we taught this course previously, um, before the pandemic hit us, um, was quite nice. So we had these, these kind of intimate uh, seminar rooms at our university, uh, Singapore Management University, and uh, we explicitly don't teach them in a traditional lecture style. So these rooms here, and this is one of the larger rooms, but typically our, our classes have about 45 students. Uh, it's fully face-to-face. And uh, this room sort of makes it very, very interactive. You know, there's lots of peer learning uh, between the people sat together. Uh, there's instructors walking around, TAs walking around. And you can imagine, uh, you know, me standing in the middle somewhere, you know, trying to facilitate uh, an interactive discussion. So it's always been a pleasure to teach in a, at our institution with, with rooms and settings like this. Um, and rather than a lecture and problem classes, you know, typically we had one three hour weekly class, and it would typically be quite multimodal, mixing sort of mini lecture segments with quizzes, uh, coding demonstrations and exercises. Uh, so it keeps, it's a long session, but it's kept interesting and engaging for the students because we're always changing what we're doing across that time. So of course, um, in August, 2020, uh, we were coming to the next iteration of this course. And this was a few months after Singapore's uh, first lockdown. Uh, here we call it a, a circuit breaker. And uh, so we're emerging from this, uh, this, this period of, of teaching 100% online. And uh, because our course was quite technical, the university uh, prioritized us for a scheme to run classes in hybrid mode. And the idea was that we would resume some physical teaching while satisfying national safety guidelines uh, regarding the use of masks, uh, the maximum group sizes, uh, the room capacities and, and so on. 
Uh, so the idea was we try and bring back some of the features of physical teaching, um, but we do it in a safe way. And so we have half the students there and half the students uh, dialing in using a video link. Um, so this is what we were asked to do. And uh, we were given, as you can imagine, a number of constraints that we had to solve. So as I mentioned, we had a limit of 25 uh, students in the classroom. Uh, we had to make sure there was one meter physical distancing between them at the time. Uh, and we had A, B team splits for the students. So they had to do rotations every, every two weeks. Um, so you can imagine that in, in early August, as we were planning what to do, we were sort of pulling our hair out a bit as to how we would make this work. And there were three challenges that we, uh, that we zoomed in on, uh, pun unintended. So first of all, um, the challenge of ensuring what we called uh, equitable participation between uh, those physical and remote students, you know, so the gap between their experiences. You know, we didn't want those students who were dialing in to have a lesser experience than the ones in the classroom. Uh, the second challenge was, as I mentioned, we, we really emphasized peer learning in the old way of teaching, and we wanted to maintain this as much as possible, despite all of these distancing constraints. So teams being split physical online, people sat one meter apart at the time, you know, how do we keep peer learning going uh, when we had constraints like this? And thirdly, the big one, um, Zoom fatigue. You know, a three hour synchronous session, we felt just would not work, okay? Uh, we felt it would not work at all. The remotely participating students would just, uh, you know, switch off, especially for our 815 classes. So we wanted to do our best to tackle these three issues uh, head on. So if I go through those one by one before I summarize what our intervention was, uh, starting uh, with this first challenge here. Um, so as I say, we really felt that, you know, though it would be nice for us to be in the classroom, uh, presenting uh, physically with the, uh, you know, with some students in front of us and some students watching on a video, we were very worried um, that we might default to only teaching those students who are physically present. Okay, it's in our, you know, it's in our nature. You can see people in front of you, uh, you know, you end up focusing on them and forgetting about the folk at home, which is something that we wanted to uh, avoid. Um, so the way that we went about trying to resolve this was actually um, through the use of Slack, uh, through the use of a Slack workspace. And uh, what I want to emphasize here is that it, I don't mean we were just offering them support after class. Uh, we were really using it simultaneously during the class. Uh, to the point where I had one laptop doing my presentation and live stream, and then we had another laptop to the side uh, with a Slack channel uh, going at the same time. So the idea was that the physical and remote students uh, would both prioritize this as a way of asking questions. Um, the idea being that the, uh, you know, the physical remote students have sort of an equal way of, 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 of getting their questions some attention. And it has some nice, uh, you know, some, some, some nice features beyond, you know, your classical Zoom chat box. Uh, so first it could be monitored by the uh, co-instructor and the TA during synchronous lessons. So if I was busy doing a coding demo without time to look at uh, Slack, you know, my TA was often answering questions. Uh, it persists after lessons. And of course, uh, you have all of these threads to sort of facilitate asynchronous follow-ups. So you can see here, somebody's asking, answering a question that I asked uh, during the class. Um, and over here, uh, you can see that some students have dived off into a thread and they're helping each other. So there's actually uh, some peer learning going on uh, over here. Um, so Slack we relied on quite heavily. In terms of peer learning, um, as I mentioned, we wanted to make sure uh, that this was maintained as much as possible. So we looked at two solutions over here. The first of all, we used uh, the Piazza platform, uh, which is sort of a wiki forum hybrid where students can post anonymously, answer each other's questions, um, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, help each other out. So really, peer learning is at the heart of this. Um, we also, of course, relied on students um, answering each other's questions on Slack, you know, really helping each other out on this online platform while these interactive classes uh, were going on. Um, so of course, how did, we, uh, how did we encourage students to do this? And naturally, many of them like doing this sort of thing. We have lots of students who have experience in, in web programming and want to share it. Um, but we gave them a little incentive in the form of, of class participation points. You know, about 10% of the final grade uh, constituting um, how they 
performing class, in terms of asking questions, participating and helping each other out. So we try to sort of give them some holistic uh, encouragement uh, for this. Uh, in terms of Zoom fatigue, uh, we basically decided that we had to change the whole flow of the class. Three hours was simply too long for students to stay engaged. Um, so I, our idea here was essentially to have shorter synchronous lessons, which I'll say more on in a moment, and also do sort of a semi-flipped blended classroom setting. Um, so we put a lot of effort in, into sort of factoring out some of the uh, you know, introductory materials, so the basic technical concepts each week into pre-class videos, uh, basically four to six minute long videos that were bite-sized, digestible, and then accompanied by, by quizzes that were closely aligned to the kind of content that was uh, going on. Uh, so here, uh, this is my hand sort of introducing the box model in CSS. And then there was a question that they could do uh, afterwards that aligned with what we were trying to do in the, in the video. Um, so in terms of the length of the sessions, uh, we went from three hours uh, down to two one hour synchronous parts. In, on reflection, we would even break that down further still, um, but it mostly worked for us at, at the time. Um, and uh, with the remaining time, uh, we essentially did what we called working breaks. So we had exercises that students could work on. Uh, the three teaching staff would be available for consultations and we would split um, the job between physical and remote according to the demands uh, every week. Um, so summarizing our intervention there, basically, um, you know, we incorporated the use of a professional communication platform and uh, the emphasis on Slack was because this is something particularly useful for them to learn anyway, uh, once they go off into industry. Um, but we found it a very nice unifying platform where everyone was using it together, uh, whether they were at home or in the classroom, and uh, they could go off into side discussions why we were doing our live teaching uh, to help each other and do peer learning. Uh, we also incorporated Piazza, and of course we changed the flow. Um, so we went from our original, uh, you know, solid three hour classes uh, to something a little bit more bite-sized uh, with a working break in between for them to focus on, on support and exercises. Again, we would probably break this down further still if we had to do this again. Um, so in terms of did it work? Well, we asked the students uh, in a post-course survey and generally they were quite positive about the interventions. You know, blue here generally means, means good. And these rows at the bottom, the bars are a bit shorter uh, because this was concerning technology that was only trialed in a couple of the, of the sections. But in terms of the videos, uh, Slack during the class, uh, we found that students were quite happy uh, with how it allowed them to participate. Uh, we also asked them in, in another um, survey, which is detailed in the paper, we tried to assess whether the experience was emulated, uh, the experience of regular classes was emulated as much as possible. And we found uh, that generally they, they, they indicated it was. Um, aside from things like uh, peer learning, where the score did drop uh, a little bit. So there is more that we can do there. We, we talked about doing things like assigning peer buddies and really uh, uh, making our efforts there a bit more personal rather than using sort of anonymous forums like Piazza. Um, to quote a few things from the student reflections. Uh, so some students highlighted, and we were quite happy for them to say that they uh, found they had equal chances to engage each other uh, during class. They didn't feel disadvantaged by being at home. Um, they found these shorter segments making it easier to focus for the entire lesson. They like getting opinions from their classmates and uh, the pre-class materials help them prepare, focus on using the time in this difficult setting a little bit better. So uh, hopefully I'm still on time. Uh, just to conclude, um, we were faced with this challenge. We, were, uh, we had to do hybrid delivery. We wanted it to make it work while uh, making sure uh, they felt their participation opportunities were equal, they still had the chance to do peer learning and that uh, Zoom fatigue was mitigated as much as possible. Uh, we have a lot more reflections in the paper, especially from the side of the instructors. And what I would say is that, especially on the blended learning aspect, uh, that was a lot of work, but I think that's something that's quite well known outside of the setting of, of hybrid learning uh, anyway. We were, we were exhausted by Christmas, I can tell you that. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, Chris, for this interesting presentation. Um, I can only support all your findings. Um, we have similar things that we do in our classes, um, also for the ones um, that are on site, um, where we support uh, something like Slack. Um, we are already um, at the end of your slot, but I would say we still um, allow one question yeah, to get it also a little bit interactive in this format as well. 
And while we do that, I would already ask the second presenter to get prepared and to get started. So do we have any questions in the audience? I, I see one, one from Array. Would you like I, to ask yourself, Array, or should I read it? Uh, sure. Um, first of all, thanks for the nice presentation. Uh, what I want to know about is like I also use Slack in my class. Uh, I want to know like how do you incentivize uh, the Slack participation? Like you said, you're using some grades, but can you elaborate on it a bit? Thank you. So th this varies uh, from instructor to instructor at SMU, but quite a common way is, as you suggest, uh, to count the meaningful contributions over the term. This is something we typically did before Slack. If somebody you know, answered a question during class or made a, an insightful point, then we would sort of count a raw point. And then towards the end of the term, uh, look at those raw, raw points, uh, distribute uh, some grades, uh, you know, from B minus to A plus or something, according to how active they were over the term, and then make some holistic adjustments because, you know, just doing it based on points uh, doesn't always work out for some, some students. Uh, so we, we, we feed in and uh, uh, adjust according to a few different data points like that, try to make it as fair as we can. Of course, Piazza as well, that uh, one issue you have there is that it's quite difficult to uh, assign these, these fairly if the students are posting anonymously. So it does aggregate some stats, um, but there is, of course, the risk that they might try to gain it if they know you're doing, uh, you know, doing that. So this is something that we don't have an easy answer for. Thank you. Okay, thank you again for this nice presentation. Um, and now we are going immediately to the second presentation by um, El Goon about an interactive approach to teaching Git version control system. So El Goon, I hope I uh, spell your name correctly. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, hello, everyone. Your screen. And get uh, good evening from Turkey. Uh, I am El Goon Jabrazade. Uh, I'm a graduate student at Brigham University. And uh, our talk today will be about uh, our program uh, on interactive approach to teaching Git version control system. So let me start by uh, defining what the version control system is. So it basically is a tool that uh, track changes that have been made to a software or a source code, uh, and it makes uh, it easier for developers to uh, collaborate on a software project. And also developers are able to recall a specific version of a software uh, if needed later. Uh, but, uh, as we noticed, uh, and according to other uh, literature, uh, uh, there is a lack of proper academic curricula on version control systems, um, and uh, students uh, lack the necessary knowledge and practices to use version control system uh, after they graduate or uh, in their projects. Uh, so to address this issue, we decided to create a, a training program uh, as a part of uh, object-oriented uh, software engineering course at Wilkent University for uh, third-year uh, computer science students. The program was carried out uh, in four iterations with uh, various uh, number of students. And uh, the paper is, uh, the results and analysis uh, in this paper is actually based on the first three iterations, uh, as the fourth, uh, the, the last iteration was done uh, in this semester. Uh, so let me talk about the general uh, flow diagram of the program. Uh, so first, um, before the training session, we have a pre-training survey where, where we ask uh, questions uh, about their Git uh, and also GitHub knowledge uh, to, to the students. Uh, then we move to the training sessions. We have uh, four, that consists of four uh, sessions, uh, which are uh, a lecture, live coding, remote learning, uh, and the lab assignment. Uh, after we have uh, we are done with the sessions, uh, we uh, carried out another survey, uh, which we call post-training survey, where uh, we evaluate the efficacy of the program. And after that, uh, as well, uh, the students were able to ask uh, any questions uh, about Git and GitHub, uh, or ask any help uh, if they need needed in their project. Uh, so let me uh, move to the pre-training uh, survey questions. So uh, this, this is the first question that we ask to the students, which is, have you ever used Git? So the horizontal axis shows the iterations of the program. Um, the vertical axis shows the number of 
or the percentage of students that answered the question. And at the top, we see the number of students that responded to, to this question. Uh, so in iteration one, we, we can see that the uh, majority of uh, students uh, have actually not used it before, but in iteration two and three, they used it. Uh, I mean, there are a considerable amount of students that used it before. Uh, this follow-up question was, if you used Git, uh, have you used uh, graphical user interface applications for Git? Uh, and the answer is uh, similar to the uh, previous, uh, uh, previous diagram, uh, where uh, the students in iteration one uh, had not used it before, but in iteration two and three, uh, there are a, a number of students that used uh, the graphical user interface applications for Git. Uh, these include like Git Kraken, Source 3, etc. Uh, we also asked the uh, students in, in how many projects did, did they use GitHub? Uh, and they, uh, they, they responded that uh, they either uh, used it, uh, they either not used it or used it in very few projects in all three iterations. Uh, and we uh, lastly, we asked uh, if they see their skills sufficient enough to use Git and GitHub uh, in the, during their term project. Uh, and the majority of them answered no. Uh, so after the, uh, we, after we are done with the pre-training survey, we uh, move to the lectures or training sessions uh, that start with lectures on Git and GitHub. Uh, this image is from uh, our first iteration actually, which was on spring. 2020, uh, just before COVID begins, uh, the lectures uh, in iterations two and three were done online through Zoom. Uh, and during these lectures, we showed uh, students the concepts of Git and GitHub the operations. And also we had a live coding session where we uh, demonstrate Git and GitHub operations uh, using uh, command line interface uh, and IDEs. Uh, we, also in first two iterations, we used a uh, source tree, which is a graphical user interface application for Git. And then uh, after these uh, lectures, we have a remote learning period. Uh, this is a one week period where uh, we shared some uh, online materials with students so that they can uh, learn Git and GitHub uh, more in depth. Uh, these uh, learning materials include lecture slides, uh, our pre-recorded video tutorials, which also can be found on YouTube, and also some other video, YouTube videos that uh, we thought might be useful for them uh, to learn uh, Git and GitHub. Uh, and after these all uh, training sessions, uh, we, we had a uh, laboratory assignment uh, where we asked students to implement a mini project using Git and GitHub. Uh, this is a, a sample. Uh, Git graph that we extracted from uh, source three uh, that was done in uh, assignments from previous iterations. Uh, so we can see here, from here that uh, students had to do various kinds of Git operations such as uh, commit, merge, uh, fetch, uh, etc. And uh, the laboratory assignment was three hours uh, and also it was done uh, online uh, using Zoom. And after the laboratory assignment, we uh, asked, uh, we carried out another survey uh, asking the efficacy of the program to the students. Uh, the first question was, how were the Git and GitHub tutorials? Uh, the majority of them, uh, the students responded that uh, they were good or very good uh, in all three iterations. Uh, the follow-up question was uh, how beneficial was the laboratory assignment? Uh, by beneficial, we mean uh, uh, whether it was useful for them to learn Git and GitHub, uh, the concepts. And the uh, responses were similar in all three iterations where uh, they, they said that it was beneficial or very beneficial. Uh, we had uh, another question about uh, how realistic was the assignment scenario? Uh, we mean if it was close to a real world scenario or not. Uh, we ask this question only in iteration two and three. And uh, the majority of them said that uh, they were realistic. Uh, we asked 
also about the difficulty of the elaborator assignment. Uh, in iteration one, uh, they mostly responded it was average. In iteration two, uh, average and easy. And in iteration three, uh, they mostly responded it was uh, more difficult. Uh, and we also asked uh, after the tutorials how sufficient to, do they see themselves or their skills in using Git uh, during their term projects. And uh, we can see that they, the trend is similar also here. They said that they are uh, they, they see their skills sufficient or very sufficient. And I can also mention that the, in iteration three, we did not get any negative uh, responses from students um, as we try to adapt or change the program uh, according to the feedbacks we receive from the students. Also, we, we did, uh, we asked uh, which uh, operations have you performed in uh, Git and GitHub before the tutorials and after the tutorials uh, in uh, pre-training survey, also post-training survey. Blue lines show the pre-training survey results and red, red lines show the post-training survey results. Uh, the trend is similar in all three iterations. Uh, for some uh, operations such as checkout merge or branching, uh, the, there is a large gap as students learned these uh, operations uh, in the lab. Uh, and the assignment, uh, the laboratory assignment was actually created. It was, uh, it covered uh, five percent, five percent of their total course grade. Uh, and we graded their laboratory assignment and the, the majority of the students in all iterations got uh, grades uh, more than 75. Uh, yeah, during the post-training uh, survey, we also asked uh, students about their opinions on our program. Uh, there were also positive feedbacks and uh, some negative feedbacks. Uh, one of the positive feedbacks was that uh, one student said, I think the lab was perfect. I was starting to feel really bad about not knowing the intricacies of Git, but this helped me a lot. And there was a negative feedback about the time restriction of the lab. Uh, they said uh, the time shortage was not a meaningful scenario for Git and GitHub lab. And it made uh, the laboratory stressful for them. And we, we will try to address these issues in our future iterations. So in conclusion, uh, we have created a Git and GitHub training program for uh, third year computer science students at Wilkant University. Uh, we uh, designed and carried out two surveys to evaluate the efficacy of the program and uh, concluded that the majority of the students uh, learned Git and GitHub prominently. Uh, and also we shared uh, all the program materials publicly with the computer science education community uh, so that they can use it. Uh, these program materials include lecture slides, uh, pre-recorded videos, as well as uh, assignment, uh, laboratory assignments. And uh, in the next iterations, we also have some plans uh, to change it, uh, such as making the laboratory session a collaborative activity uh, so that it will be more realistic and also expand the scope of the laboratory assignment to include more uh, operations regarding uh, GitHub. Uh, and thank you for listening. Uh, if you want to access the paper or program materials, you can scan these QR codes. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you for the great presentation, Algun. And um, yeah, I'd like to ask the audience, are there any questions? I, I have one. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so I'm noticing um, you had different sample sizes in the different iterations. Uh, mm -hmm. And that makes me that makes me think that you have a, 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 a fall and a spring offering with with spring having fewer enrolled people because of the timing when this, this happens in your in your curriculum. Um, how many repeaters do you usually see like people who fail in the first offering and then repeat take it and did that have any in did, did your mode of instruction have any effect on them learning it better? Uh, I don't think that uh, we in, in like in this object-oriented software engineering course we have 
uh, too much repeatings. I think it should be lower than like five percent, five percent of the students. But the oh, the right. number of students uh, is different. Is because uh, is because uh, we have usually in fall sessions we have three sections where each section has fifty students, and in spring we have just a single session. Okay. okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, then thank you again, Elgood, for the presentation. And then I would like to hand over to the third thank presenter, Atta, who will tell us how to teach design patterns using interactive methods. Atta, please share your screen and start with your presentation. Yeah. Okay, can you change the screen right now? We can see your screen. So, hello everyone, my name is Atta Yurstamer. Uh, this is the presentation for our paper, Teaching Design Patterns Using Interactive Methods. Uh, we have conducted this. Uh, this is basically a teaching experience again in the same course that Alvin just mentioned. So, the overview of the presentation will be our motivation and background information. Then I will be mentioning our contribution methodology and finally I will be mentioning our results. So the course that uh, we did this for was called CS319. It is called the Object Oriented Software Engineering course. It's a third year course that we can you know, CS students take. And it includes topics such as modeling with UML requirements, station system design and design patterns. So it has very vast topics and it also has a final project which is a big chunk of final grade and for the design patterns it is as some of you might know one of the core components when doing software development but uh, when we request students to use these design patterns in the final project we thought that they weren't used in the correct context and they weren't very well used. So we saw there was a lack of applicable information. So that was our motivation behind this uh, teaching uh, study. And we wanted to give them this applicable information. So our contribution is we tried to implement these uh, educational methods that were previously researched a lot, like lab coding and peer reviews, but these are research for generally entry level courses. We tried to implement these into teaching more complex subjects such as design patterns. And we also proposed an easy to apply teaching methodology that you can just use it as directly or just uh, change it here and there and use it like that. So our methodology is actually a two part study map model. So in one part, we have the lecture that incorporates live coding. And on the other hand, we have an online lab assignment that incorporates peer review. So we use the live coding for more applicable information. Uh, we use the lab assignment for more hands-on experience. And uh, because this was done in the pandemic, all the lectures and labs were conducted online. Uh, as you can see on the graph below, we can see we did this in two different iterations, which was two different semesters. And between the semesters, we had a few very minor changes between in the site of study. And one change was in adding a mid-survey to the second iteration, which allowed us to look into more detail about how tutorial was effective. And in the second iteration, we also added another peer review part so that now we should have got two peer reviews instead of one. And we will see the effects of this in the future. So for the lecture, we started by pinpointing two design patterns that would be useful for the students that they can use them in their final projects a lot, which was the strategy and decorative design setting. So the final project, generally we require students to implement a game. So we chose strategy and decorative because they're especially useful for game development. And we had a short lecture inside this, uh, short presentation inside, inside the lecture for like 20 minutes. Uh, which was a very direct approach to a classic approach, uh, one that you would find in a book like Head First Design Patterns. And after that, I have created a scenario for a game developer. I acted as a game developer who got 
who got these feature requests constantly and had to implement them. And this way we try to pinpoint how to uh, choose these design patterns and how to be smarter when implementing something and think about the future. So the game was, uh, the, we implemented this game that you see on the right hand side, which is very basic. You play as a red square and try to not get hit by the blue squares. Uh, so we start with some initial code and we start getting these feature requests. And through these implementations, we saw that keeping the game as simple and as basic as possible is just the best approach, like not adding any score modifiers or anything if it is not required is a great approach for live coding. Also using a familiar language, which was Java in our case, because in the continuity that's what all do not know and achieving what you need with, with as little code as possible. So this meant having some initial code in our case uh, was important. So what we did was when we get the game, first feature request requires you to add these enemies that bounce off the sides. So we implemented that in a very direct approach. And after that, we got another feature request, which required us to create new type of enemy which again bounced from the side, but randomized its speed. So as you can see, there are many common things between these two types of enemies. And when implementing those, we showed that we, if we use strategy, we could do it much faster. And for the third feature request, it required us to create a new variation of these enemies, which is called heavy enemies. And they moved as if they were pulled downwards by gravity. And we implemented that using decorators, which actually made them make much more sense to the students. You can see all of this code in the uh, paper. We shared all of this. It also uses uh, property library. So for the lab assignment, we have used an online platform written by myself. It is very straightforward, very basic. So a general structure is you have some static information on the left-hand side, like the question or an answer or something like that, and you have a submission field on the right-hand side. Uh, so, and we split this lab assignment into three phases. So first phase was to the, the design phase, where students would see a question and had to come up with a solution that uses some design pattern or something uh, for that solution. So we require them to draw an UML, upload it, draw the UML using whatever they have on their PC, upload it, and uh, write down some simple explanation for that. So that design part takes about 40 minutes or so. And after that, we had peer reviews, as I mentioned, between different iterations, we had one or two. So in a peer review on the left-hand side, you see another student's pr problem. So you see another problem. This way students see more than one problem. And they don't solve that problem. They see another student's solution to that problem. So they have to, come up with what they did right or wrong and like I have to elaborate on that solution. So we require them to do that. So this was 25 minutes in iteration one, 10, 15 minutes in iteration two, well, because we did it two times. And in the last part, we have coding. In the left-hand side, you see your original problem, your original solution, your ML diagram to it and the reviews that you get. And on the right-hand side, we require you to write some simple Java program that would implement this uh, approach. So we created this whole structure. And when grading, we looked into if we could grade the students by coming up with the correct design pattern at the very end, at the coding part, so that some students can find the correct answer through peer, peer reviews, which also happened a lot. Some students can find the correct answer through peer reviews and uh, get a full point. Again. So for the results, I have several results in the paper, but I will be sharing the most important ones here. So for the helpfulness of live coding, uh, when we asked students in the post survey if they found the live coding helpful, uh, as you can see, most of them found it very helpful. And in iteration two, I know that the less students that answered the uh, survey, but still none of them found it helpful, not unhelpful. So uh, this was a great thing that showed us live coding really worked. 
especially for some students. Uh, on the contrary, for the reviews, we had very mixed results. So in iteration one, most of the students did not like the review, reviews that they got. And from the extra remarks, we see that this is because they did not trust the reviews. They believed getting reviewed by someone that is on the same level with them meant no sense, made, made no sense. But uh, in iteration two, something fully different happened and students started saying they liked their reviews. We had another question in iteration two, which uh, asked if they found an error through a review and more than 50% of the students found errors in their solutions through a review. So this meant that maybe because uh, getting through reviews uh, may make them gain trust in the reviews or something, but this showed a difference in those two iterations. So in conclusion, we find that live coding is especially useful for teaching these design patterns. But peer reviews might require some different solutions and tweaks to be extra useful. But overall structure is very well received by the students and can be replicated in other courses. So that's all on my side. Then I can take questions then. Thank you, Arta. Great presentation. I like the topic a lot. We also have a um, patterns course that we teach in a similar way, but without peer reviews. So my question would be, um, to you that what do you what do you think is the impact of the peer reviews how much of the greatness of the course is is done due to the peer reviews um so like our this this study only included two different design patterns so like only the strategy and the decorate so in our future work we will try to incorporate more but for those two uh, from the solutions because this was a great assignment we went through all of the solutions and we can see some students finding errors in their understanding of design patterns, like the, the strategy or decorator, and solving those through a review. So I think they learned it during this lab assignment through a review. Okay, thank you. There are a couple of questions, and I would say we do it on a first come, first serve base. Um, so the first one would be Surai. Would you like to ask your question yourself or should I do it? Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, um, I was just wondering um, because assessing peer review can be a big challenge, especially um, to quantify the grade and the marks. How did you do that? Uh, so for the peer review, like well, how, the, how did I grade the peer reviews of students? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so for that, we generally looked into some big errors in the original solution that the other student had, and if they could find those errors. So this generally meant a, a student that they appear got a good review had generally more points. So like I actually calculated it, it just meant like, and 15% correlation between the other students phase one grade and their review grade. But still our general thing, general thing that we looked into was if the student can pinpoint mistakes okay. in the other solution. Okay. Okay, nice. okay. then um, there is one question by Christopher. Hey, yeah, so um, as I was listening, I was wondering if some ideas from the teaching approach could be adapted to a different context, in particular anti-patterns. And uh, the reason I'm asking is that we were teaching students about identifying code smells to do refactoring last term and found that they really struggled with identifying these sometimes, uh, identifying the right ones and uh, uh, working out what to do. So the first approach that I had with this uh, teaching method was using code smell. I also implemented a small website where students would click, I smell something. And like when uh, doing this live coding, uh, if the smell count is really high, we would just stop and talk about where the smell is coming from. But in usage, that was not very helpful because not many of the students online just kept on clicking it. And just we continued it just by 
letting students just interrupt the stuff. So like they would just say, okay, but this doesn't make sense. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Why it doesn't make sense? And well, how can we fix it? So I especially did some stuff so they can find smells. So like copying and pasting a whole class, copying and pasting another part of the code and like uh, doing some sketchy things. The, those things generally make them smell stuff. So uh, when you do these things more on the nose, like they get it better. Thank you very much. Okay, um, if I see it correctly, um, Uso Ekina's um, question was already answered in the chat. So Bastian, you had another question. Right, thank you. Um, my question was also answered. That's a peer assessment thing. Okay, yeah, thank you. Are there any other questions or are all the questions answered already? Okay, then we will go over to the last presentation in this first session on the um, online um, training and e-learning um, session by Christoph Matthies. He will talk about the challenges and opportunities of a remote agile software engineering project course during COVID-19. So we can already see your screen. Christoph, Perfect. please go ahead. Hi, hi everyone. So my name is Christoph. Um, I'm talking to you uh, about a course um, and the things that we did um, with our emergency uh, transition to remote learning. Um, this is a course that's being taught at the Hasso Plattner Institute at the University of Potsdam in Germany. Just to give you a little bit of an um, overview of what we're trying to do in this uh, course, this is an undergraduate agile software engineering course at the very end of our bachelor's degree. And the idea is really that students learn how to build large software products um, when multiple teams are involved. So we basically take all the students that we have and we throw them into one single large software development project with all the problems that entail with that, right? Um, so there are multiple student teams, they have to collaborate and they wanna build a single common product. Um, we teach Scrum and Kanban and we expect students to use those processes in their teams. And we try to get as close to the real world as we can in university, right? So um, there's challenges concerning software architecture, how to organize your work, um, how to deal with the customer and manage the customer and the requirements, uh, and then generally um, collaborate with you know, different teams and the large amount of people that are involved. And so of course, um, this works really well um, or has worked really well for the last few years when um, there wasn't a global pandemic and we could um, do all of these things in person. Um, talk to each other and uh, sit in a room and work together. And clearly uh, with the COVID, COVID pandemic, we had to switch this in-person teamwork uh, to a completely virtual setup, um, basically overnight, right? Um, and this is not a course that's designed with uh, virtual content in mind, right? Um, so this, heavy, this course heavily relies on um, being in a room and working together. And so uh, our question that we wanted to explore in this paper was basically the, the challenges and opportunities um, that occurred in this uh, large-scale university project course um, when teaching this thing remotely uh, for the first time. Uh, and I, I added the word emergency here because really uh, the idea is that there are really a lot of courses that do really, really well um, when taught virtually, but that's because they've been designed with that idea in mind, right? And this course really hasn't. Um, so I wanted to see, um, uh, do a bit of an, an investigation into what went well and what didn't go well. And maybe hopefully you can take something with you uh, here. So what did we do in order to uh, take care of teams and take care of students? So first of all, uh, we have experienced student tutors that participate in all the uh, regular team meetings. So all the scrum meetings, all the um, synchronization meetings that teams have. Um, there's always this experienced student tutor um, with them that acts as a knowledgeable mentor and can answer questions. We are always available. Um, for questions and comments. So the teaching team is always available in the, um, in, in the communication platform. So we've used maybe anything from Microsoft Teams to Discord to Slack over the years. Um, so we're always available there. And um, one of our teaching team members takes on the role of the project customer and supplies requirements and feature wishes. So um, we do try to take good care of the students. Um, and so uh, uh, I'd like to talk to you about uh, how we got to some data. Um, so there's two types of data that we collected during uh, the course in 2020. 
the first thing that we did was we uh, collected uh, notes of the regular teaching team meetings. So whenever we met regularly as a teaching team, um, we took notes of what went well, what didn't go well in the teams, um, what was um, things that we should tackle uh, or maybe improve um, or um, talk to students about in the, in the next lecture. And of course, at the end of the term, we have anonymous uh, end of term course evaluations for students. And we also mined those uh, for aspects um, of the course um, that were that went well in, in the digital emergency transition and things that didn't go well. Um, and so every time we found uh, an item that received at least two separate mentions, um, either during two different meetings or uh, two different students agreeing on um, a certain aspect of the course, we included those in our um, data set. And we grouped the, the data set in topic clusters and then categorized those items as either challenges or opportunities, right? And so in particular, we're interested here um, in these in these uh, opportunities because clearly there's a lot of challenges i don't need to tell you about them uh, assumably you uh, you can imagine what they are there's also lots of literature on this um and our um, encounter challenges that we had um they mirror previous reports yeah so i'm not going to tell you about these challenges and um, if you're interested please read the paper or uh, read all of the other uh, um, fascinating research that there is on this, this kind of thing. Um, but especially regarding remote lectures, we had the same issues that everyone has, um, and we tried to combat them in the same ways. Um, so I'd like to uh, give a pointer to the related literature here um, and focus on what we would, I th thought was uh, way more interesting, which are the positives, right? So everyone um, clearly has the same issues, but what are also some of the positives of remote agile um, engineering education and teamwork that we ourselves uh, did not anticipate? So we, we didn't. Uh, we thought this would be much harder um, than it than it uh, than it was. Um, and reading the literature on this, uh, we are not alone. So others also thought that transforming to online teaching would be much harder than what they experienced. Um, so there were uh, some positives as well, right? And we'd like to um, talk to you about some of them today. Um, so we found in the paper uh, thirteen topic clusters of positives. Um, and we were also surprised to see that some aspects of the remote collaboration approach um, were actually deemed sort of explicitly beneficial. I, that means not only were they just about as good as in uh, a physical setting and an in-person setting, but uh, the students or the teaching team actually felt that this was uh, better than in an in-person setting, right? Um, and so um, the types of uh, aspects that we're talking about, um, I'd like to focus on those. Um, so I've, I've brought you some of them, I've presented, I've made some slides here, um, some of the main ones that I thought were most interesting. Um, so first of all, um, one of the positives of remote collaboration that we noticed in our course were that stable uh, communi as a, like, uh, communication structures remain stable. Um, so even though the setup was completely different, right, only Zoom screens and people working on their own home computers um, in their own uh, dormitories or or wherever they lived in their shared apartments, right? Um, the communication and organizational structures um, did not drastically change in uh, student teams. Um, and this is uh, possibly or probably um, due to the fact that inter-team communication, so communication between team members themselves was overwhelmingly digital in previous in-person projects as well, right? So um, even when there were people who uh, got to meet uh, once a week in physical, um, settings, and they also then, uh, because they are uh, accustomed to it, um, and it's faster, even then in in-person meetings, they would use digital um, technologies quite a lot. And um, instant messaging, right, is heavily present in modern life. Um, and sending a chat, chat message, even in co-located teams, um, is not unusual, right? Even if the person is in the other room over there, um, it's maybe faster to quickly type a chat message than it is to, to go over there. And so, um, because that's so ingrained in developers' culture already, um, this idea of using digital tools to communicate um, and collaborate, um, these communication and organizational structures did not significantly change in our um, online course, which we thought was great because um, that's a really important aspect. Um, and we expected this to go uh, much worse, to be honest with you. Another really interesting aspect that I really enjoyed was that our teaching team actually thought that there was a deeper connection with the students. Um, or they were able to have deeper connections to students. So um, in the remote course, tutors were spontaneously asked to join uh, team video calls uh, when there were questions or, or problems. And this is something that was not happening in previous in-person teams. Um, 
There, if you are having a, a meeting across campus and the student tutor is in a different building, um, you're unlikely to just call up the student tutor and ask them to join uh, and walk 30 minutes across campus. But this is obviously something that's totally possible in a digital space. And this is something that actually happened. So we thought that was really cool um, to have this like emergency button in your um, in your uh, video call that if you had a question that required a tutor, you could just write his chat message and have the tutor sort of join immediately um, if someone was available. So we thought that was that was really cool. Um, and due to the fact that really all communication was online in our um, online course and the virtual course, then of course that also means that all instant all, all communication was online, um, which means that also the tutors and the teaching team were able to read all of the communication that they were a part of in the groups chats, which also improved the connection to the team. So you weren't uh, left out of uh, conversations that happened offline because there were no offline conversations. Um, something that's really important, right, when you deal with teams is team building activities. Um, and we always encourage students to do these team building activities, right? Just like um, go out and uh, have a drink uh, after work if you want, um, or even use some time uh, during your meeting to get to know each other a little bit and build some, some levels of trust and some uh, a better understanding of each other. And oftentimes this is hard, right, in in-person in uh, teams. And this was something that actually was easier in um, online settings, we found. Um, so finding a common time and place um, is maybe easier in remote teams than it is for uh, physical teams, right? Um, if you actually want to meet somewhere physical with 12 people or whatever, how many people there are in your team, right? Anything from uh, six to eight usually, um, then it's maybe easier to, to find a common slot for a, uh, a Zoom meeting than it is for a, um, uh, a, a real meeting, right? Um, and uh, our students uh, told us that uh, um, team building activities such as playing Among Us or uh, virtual Settlers of Catan uh, work really, really well. And they were easy to set up um, because the uh, virtual communication setup was already present, right? So um, it's easy to just use your existing uh, Zoom room and uh, play around of Settlers of Catan um, instead of working, which is an easy way to quickly do some uh, team building activities. Important for our course is also that the digital format led to more documentation by default. Um, so that just means that if you use a digital collaboration tool, which you are sort of required when you're doing an online um, when you work together online and remotely, um, your interactions and team decisions are documented, right? Just because they are persisted on a digital whiteboard or, um, or in a Slack message or wherever. Um, and that also means for retrospective meetings, um, the things that you decided on last time to change, they are immediately um, available in the next meeting, which is really important for the Scrum process. Um, so if you want to improve, you need to know what you decided on last time in order to figure out have you actually managed to do this. Um, in in-person meetings, this was something that was often uh, forgotten because no one could remember what I was actually talked about last time. No one took any notes um, in a digital setting. Um, oftentimes, the notes were there by default. And maybe as a last point um, that I'd like to leave you with is we actually found more pair programming um, in a remote course. Um, so tools like LiveShare were used, Visual Studio LiveShare. Um, uh, and this is maybe because it's less awkward, right? So it's uh, maybe more awkward to sit with another person at a physical computer than it is to uh, sit in, on your own computer and uh, work uh, sh in, a, in a shared manner um, over the internet. Um, and so in, in the pair programming sense, both the driver and the navigator can use their own computing uh, setups, uh, which is more, more comfortable for students. So to conclude here, um, this was a study of student and educator perceptions of our emergency remote agile software project and that we did in university. Um, we present 10 challenges um, that were already uh, also known, yeah, and uh, we also found those, and we also identified uh, a bunch of positives um, of remote collaboration and uh, things that we can do, hopefully, um, maintain throughout the next courses. Um, and of course, this is an ongoing um, discussion on how to maintain these positives in future courses, either through uh, hybrid setups or um, maybe um, trying to uh, integrate these positives into um, future, hopefully, again, in present courses. So thank you very much, and I'd be very happy to take your questions. Thank you, Christoph. Very good presentation. I, I already have a first question. So our experience actually was we have a, also a course uh, with uh, a project course um, with real customers from industry. 
And our experience was that it actually went down during the pandemic. Um, the motivation of the students was uh, not that high anymore. And also mm -hmm. the, the end results were not that good. So did you also find any negatives of COVID-19 and of the pandemic uh, that affected your course? Yeah, for sure. So um, I, didn't, I didn't focus on these because there's lots and lots of uh, um, work on this already. But of course, um, I, I do find that um, there are many, many problems with um, uh, online education, right? Especially if this is not a course that was designed to be um, taught online, right? So I think if you have a course that's designed from the bottom up to be online, then you can take care of some of these issues like motivation, like people um, sort of dropping off to the side because, I don't know, they don't switch their cameras on, right? So all of these issues we did notice. Um, and we basically tried to combat them uh, by really reaching out to students proactively and having uh, um, student tutors really like aggressively, yeah, quote unquote, um, uh, go towards team members and engage them. Okay, and what would be your conclusion? Would you offer the course uh, again online if it's if both would be possible, yeah, in uh, on site and online? Which one would you choose, or would you do a hybrid format? I would actually like to do in the future have it be like eighty percent um, physical, and then um, ask students to sort of uh, graduate to to uh, remote. Uh, to a few remote sessions because it's important to understand the difference, right? That's the same idea mm -hmm. of why we do um, Scrum first and then we transition into Kanban, right? So you you you, you need to get an, an understanding of both worlds. I think getting started with Scrum, getting started with a new programming language, getting started with working in teams, plus doing it all remote is just a lot to do at the same time, right? So if we can maybe sort of get students to uh, work in teams together in person and then graduate towards um, Okay, now you know each other, right? Uh, you've seen all your faces. You, you trust each other because you've seen yourself. Uh, you've seen each other um, in, in physical spaces. Then maybe you can go and uh, try out the remote setting and then you have both experience. That's something that I would love to do. Okay, thank you. Patricia has a question about the team size, I guess. Yes, um, I wanted to ask, how many teams did you have and how big were each of the teams? Did the teams all work on the same project and compete against each other? Or were there teams that were subdivided to each work on a part of a larger project? So first of all, there is only one single project. Um, all the teams uh, work on a single project. Um, so this depends on how many students take the course. I think in uh, the iteration that we studied here, we had about 40, 40 students, something like that. Um, team size is usually between, we try to keep it between five and eight. Um, uh, something like that, uh, and all the students work together. So there is uh, not necessarily competition between teams um, in terms of uh, who sort of who builds the better feature. Um, but of course, um, you do get like, ah, we have done more than you, uh, get, get your act together, that kind of thing. Um, but all students work together so that it really is a, a huge collaboration, right? And then you get all these problems that you would expect uh, when it comes to com communication. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yes, one more question, and then um, I'm sorry, but we have to finish the session. Um, Radmila, you wanted to ask something. Are you still here? Maybe you are still muted, and I will um, ask you a question. Have your challenges affected I'm sorry, the assessment? Yeah. Ah, yeah, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I couldn't unmute myself. I, I was a little bit late, so I apologize if the question is not appropriate. But uh, I didn't hear anything about the assessment. And have these challenges affected the assessment or not? For sure. Um, we try to, uh, yeah, to um, take that into consideration as best as we can. Um, so. The way that assessment works in this course was with an oral exam where we do try to um, uh, yeah, talk to students and get sort of the most out of, uh, out of them uh, <laughs> and help them along the way. Um, and the other way that we assess is really by looking at the results um, and, the, and the way that um, students used the processes and implemented the processes. Um, uh, because everyone was online, everyone had the same struggles, right? So. Um, we sort of assumed that everyone uh, dealt and um, uh, figured it out the same. So in terms of assessment, this wasn't, we did not sp specifically um, change anything for the assessment for this remote course. We just did our um, oral exams online. Okay, then let's thank again the speaker. Thank you very much, Christoph.
And then um, I'd like to close this session. Thanks to all the speaker for the great presentations. I think this was a phenomenal start into the um, conference today. And I'd like to hand over to Bastian um, for the second session on global software, or no, uh, general software engineering, right? That's right. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, all the speakers. Very well done. I'm really pleased with, with um, the, the quality of work you're providing and the interaction so far. Um, very, I'm learning a lot of things. So very, very nicely done. My friends, uh, just as quickly as the former session closed, we're moving on with the general software engineering. The first uh, talk, welcome back our friends from Singapore. And I think this time it's going to be Oka who will be presenting uh, their steps before syntax, helping novice programmers solve problems using the PCDIT framework. Oka, take it away. Right, thank you. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to present here. I think my colleague Norman is also here and Chris, which is from uh, Singapore Management University, is uh, one of our collaborators we are working closely with. Uh, so, so the context is basically we are dealing more with teaching the first year programming. So in SUTD or Singapore University of Technology and Design, all the students in the first year, they have to learn programming. Some will go to computing and software engineering. And sometimes I encounter students like jokingly telling me that what the software engineers need to do is to copy paste from stack overflows. But I think we all know that's not true. So, so the context of uh, our work is actually to help students to have this pro programming and problem solving skills uh, as early as in the first year. And we recognize some of the challenges that we see when they see problem statement until they write a working code. Um, so let me go to the next one. So, so the, I think there's a lot of papers uh, discussing about novice programmers' cognitive load. And as a novice programmer, there's a lot of things that's going on in their mind. They have to learn the programming language syntax. They have to pick up some problem solving skills. They have to learn the IDE. They have to be able to debug analytical thinking and all this kind of thing. On top of that, they learn like computing concepts. So that is actually like a huge thing uh, to do. And so problem solving is, is one of the things that sometimes it's being implicitly taught in many of the computing courses and we seldom like teach it explicitly. Um, I mean, we did a literature review and it actually like begin like from math problems and many of the things that we have now with computing also start with POIA uh, work, uh, which have like four steps, like understanding the problem, devising a plan, carrying out the plan, and then doing some like looking back uh, on how's the plan. Uh, how did we solve it? So this is an example in like two textbook uh, in introductory programming, which really follows POIA four steps, like starting with the problem statement, the requirement analysis, doing the design, implementation, and testing. Um, so this is uh, another review actually uh, on how like uh, many of uh, students actually solve the problem. And many of this is actually top down. So we try to break down the problems uh, into like smaller problems until like the problem is like small enough where we can solve it. Um, and so, and then we iterate, we decompose the problems and so on and so on. So one of the nice framework is actually uh, proposed by Loxa. They, uh, they have like a six uh, steps in the problem solving. And one of the thing that they actually tell us is that uh, in solving problems, one of the thing that people tend to do is actually to search for analogous problems, right? So, so when, when you encounter a new problem, have you seen it before? And that's where like exposing students to different kind of problems and programming problems or projects and questions actually helps the students because they will see more. But we find it is a really uh, difficult when we teach the novice programmers because uh, for an expert programmers, they have all this uh, mental bank uh, where they have the schema so-called in their mind of the different problems, the different solutions of the algorithms. But for the novice programmers, they have to build their solution schemas in that sense. So, so, so some of the top-down approach may not work for the novice programmers. And that's where like uh, we try to to actually introduce the PCDIT framework, which is not really novel in that sense, but we find it's like really useful uh, for novice programmers. Um, so this is our PCDIT frameworks. We name it uh, as such. Uh, P is for problem definitions, where we formulate the problem, what is the input, what is the output, what's the process, and we ask the students to so-called formulate uh, in summary what is the problem that they are doing. 
and the C is for concrete cases. And this is sometimes that students tend to skip. So rather than like working on concrete cases, students tend to start writing the code immediately. And that's where like the title of our presentation is about steps before syntax. Because I think we want to encourage students to slow down a little bit because by slowing down, actually they actually speed up um, in terms of solving the problems. And uh, the concrete case actually helps the students to design their algorithm. So that's the D step uh, where they write their pseudocode or flowchart or whatever that is. And then they do the implementation and the testing. And in our uh, many instructor experience, we tend to do it iteratively between implementation and testing. So test in small steps and all these kind of things. Um, so this is an example of like problem statement or problem definition, the first steps in our PCDIT framework, uh, we ask uh, students to define what's the input, what's the output, um, and what, and to summarize it. So the example one is like a matrix multiplications. This is an actual worksheet that uh, one of our instructor actually did. Uh, the second one is actually like just given like a list of numbers. They need to write a function that return all the positive numbers. So simple things. But we realize that sometimes identifying input and output um, sometimes is being skipped by students and that make them like stuck in the later processes. And the next step, which we find it also very useful is actually to think through concrete cases because students tend to think in the programming languages immediately, they tend to think in the abstracts. So by thinking about like the concrete cases, looking into which number that is being placed at which positions, for example, like in this matrix multiplications, it's actually helped them to look through into the steps what they are going through. So the top right uh, picture is actually the continuation from the example where they have to find the positive uh, numbers. And by just looking into the, by just working into the concrete cases, actually it helps um, them to write down the algorithm later on. Now this is not something new because like uh, in like this uh, famous book, How to Design Programs, actually it has been proposed that uh, we should work on some functional examples, work through some examples that illustrate the purpose. So this book's working more on the functional programming. And in, in our cases, we actually adapt it into uh, Python procedural programming um, imperative uh, languages. So, uh, so this is an example of the finding the positive number. So we can see that by doing concrete cases and different cases, uh, student can work out a particular design of algorithm, can check, okay, well, if the list is empty, that is what I should do. If not, that is what I will do and all this kind of stuff. They, they, they can write the steps. They don't have to worry about the syntax. They don't have to worry about the Python uh, features or this kind of thing. They just need to, what did I do in the concrete cases? How did I solve it in the concrete cases? Uh, this is another example of like uh, working for the multiplications, uh, matrix multiplications whereby just writing down what they did in the concrete cases and finding some patterns they can they can revise and they can they can refine they can iterate such design of algorithm into they can identify the structures and they can use like certain keyword that is more similar later on to the python's uh, for, uh, syntax for example right so so by just like writing out okay what did i do in the concrete cases our students are able to to identify there is certain pattern, there is like certain iterations rather than thinking in immediately in terms of the loop. So this is more like a bottom-up approach um, towards the problem solving. And once like students identify those structures, it is more closer to what they will write in their Python codes, for example. So, so we teach Python in the first year uh, and Python is uh, pretty easy to, it more like English-like language. So, so the transitions will be easier as compared to if you remember the problem statement itself, like descriptions in words, and suddenly students have to write matrix multiplications code. So that is actually a huge jump for many of the novice programmers. Um, so, so this is uh, this is one of the paper that we found that actually is very useful also to see where uh, how the PCIT framework helps because like just by doing the design of algorithm writing as a command actually it become like a sub goal label. And by just knowing the sub goals label, what do I have to do next? It actually helped them uh, in creating a mental model on what they have to do in solving the problem. So they don't have, sometimes uh, they don't have to do it on the paper, but they can just like write comments. Okay, this is the sub goal. This is uh, the next step this is what I'm going to do next. Uh, and then after that, they, they fill in the codes uh, in between after that. Uh, this is another example, which is, um, I think this is a matrix uh, problem as well, where uh, 
when when we are doing the concrete cases starting from an empty list filling up adding the elements into the list and then putting the list into another list uh, by doing that concrete cases actually can be used later on the same concrete cases can be used for the testing part right so so the testing part and student can can check and align whether their working is on progress so knowing that they are doing on progress they see the same thing that they are doing in the concrete cases and when they are implementing and testing it actually help students to have like more confidence as they are like working out um, their implementations uh, slowly. Uh, so this is the workshop that we actually introduce to students. Uh, we start like with problem statement, we ask them to identify, we give them like some hints. Um, we ask them for some in concrete cases to look into different kind of cases, boundary cases, the design of algorithm. We tell them to use like certain keywords to revise it, find some patterns. Uh, and then the implementing and testing, usually we don't use the worksheet anymore, but we immediately go into the IDE and then iteratively uh, test it. Um, this is the survey results that, uh, that we find. So the picture on the top over here is for these questions where it helps them to solve programming problems. And um, so this out of five, so anything like above three basically is, is a positive response. And, and we plot it for different kind of programming background. So this is a survey that we ask them to do of how many lines of code that they have written. So surprisingly, it is useful not just for the beginners where they have like written only like a few lines, but even also for those who are not beginners. So they find it like really helpful for them to solve problems. And it also helps them to write the code uh, themselves. So, so to arrive at a working code, um, so they find it is a, is, a, is a positive experience that the framework actually helps them. And, and we ask them also to give them, uh, to give us like some comment and response. So these are some of the things that students tend to comment and mentions when they use the PCBIT framework. It helps to organize their thoughts. It makes the thinking process explicit. So I think this explicit thing is very important for students when they're solving problems. Um, and, and what we find interesting also is that some students actually use it in the groups. Uh, this is something that uh, we, we didn't expect it because we plan it it's like for individual students when they're working uh, for their problems. And, and what we found is that it actually agrees with another work uh, with a log sign operator uh, are, are working as well. And this is actually uh, by helping students to have this metacognitions when they are solving the problem actually helps them. So by just knowing where the students are in the problem solving steps, actually help the students in solving the problems. So by, by, by having this name PCDIT, by naming it explicitly, by saying that, okay, we are doing this particular step on this kind of stuff, uh, it, it actually helps students in solving problems because they know where they are, they know where they are stuck. They know, for example, if they're weaker in the syntax rather than in the problem solving and all this kind of stuff. Right. So, so this is an interest paper where they actually use like token to um, to use like LOXA problem solving framework, and they shows that by identifying where the students are, it's actually increase the problem solving uh, possible uh, the performance of the students. So this is uh, some reflection from the instructors. This will be the last slide, and basically many instructor actually find that uh, it is something that they have already done. Um, but most of the time it is implicit, right? So by making it explicit actually helps them and they realize that uh, it actually helps the students to understand it better and to be able to go through it better. Um, so one of the observation is that some students, what they do is that they try immediately write the code and then it didn't work, they modify it and all this kind of stuff. And sometimes what they have to do is to go back to slow it down, right? to go back on the paper, uh, slow it down, uh, work on the cases, think about this particular thing. So what's the, so the planning is actually important. And I think sometimes students tend to skip through, but, I, but it hinders them from actually finding the solutions. Um, so this is the same thing. Um, and, and this is also find that it's not just for the novice programmer, but uh, they found it also useful for some of the students who already have programming background, but when they encounter difficult problems, they tend to use this particular framework. Right, so um, that, that's mainly my presentations on the PCDIT framework. So I'll be happy to answer if you have any questions. Very nice, thank you very much, Oka. Um, I have a question right away, if you don't mind. Um, I'm wondering, um, you just mentioned that, that um, 
understanding is all, all often implicit. And I was wondering if you you guys did some um, systematic assessment of the retention of the, for the students. And if so, um, what were your findings, if you have any? Yeah, so when I mentioned about the implicit, um, I was referring more to sometimes we teach uh, programming, but we don't teach the problem solving technique uh, right. explicitly, right? So we tend to assume that as they go through this course, uh, they will pick up the problem solving uh, uh, technique. So, so this study, uh, what we do in one way to assess whether like by teaching it more explicitly uh, actually helps the students. And we understand that the limitation of the study is more like on self-perceptions because it's on, based on survey. Um, we have not like really analyzed it on the actual outcome student performance, like on the academic performance, like on exam, all these kind of things. Yeah, but I think that's something that we can look into the future. Very good, thank you. Uh, any other questions from the audience? See none in the chat. I see no hands up. Well then, thank you very much, Oka. Um, uh, thank you. Very well done and good night. <laughs> um, my friends, we're, we're moving right on to the next talk in this session. Um, the next talk is Learning by Teaching in CS Education, a Systematic Literature Review, which Joy Lee and her colleagues are meant to present. But I'm not seeing Joy here right now. Um, is anyone here who, who, who feels like they should spring into action right this minute? Um, Ji Gang isn't here either. Chi isn't here either. Okay. Maybe they will join us in a minute. Um, in the meantime, no worries. We have our friend Marcel Schmidtchen, who's already at the ready. And uh, Marcel will present on uh, his paper, which is called Supporting the Reflective Learning of Conceptual Modeling Using Interactive Timelines and Replace. I'm very excited about this. Marcel, it's all yours. Yeah, thank you. Just share my screen. Now, can you see it? Perfect. Um, so, yeah, um, thanks um, for the introduction. I'm Marcel Schmidtchen from University Bochum in Germany, and I'm here to present my paper supporting the reflective learning of conceptual modeling using interactive timelines and replace. Um, so let me give you a little overview of the presentation. I will start with the introduction and motivation. Afterwards, I will present the method we created and the prototype features we implemented. I will then present the two studies we conducted and their results, followed by the conclusion and outlook on our further work. So conceptual models are an integral part of the software engineering process. Without them, the communication of complex ideas and systems would be almost impossible. Thus, teaching and learning good modeling skills and practices are equally important. Benefits of supporting software tool and computer-supported collaborative learning uh, is already established, but much research is focused on the quality and complexity of the resulting models and less on the modeling process itself. Um, this includes things like participants' reasoning about their modeling decisions and the shared understanding of the resulting model. To further analyze and subsequently improve the modeling process, reflective methods can be used. We, um, to find uh, and design our method, we were inspired by sport cars, slow motion replays, and strategic analyst views. Um, similar to this use case, we wanted to give learners and modelers a chance to retrospectively identify and reflect on errors and decision in their modeling process. Building on our previous uh, explorative studies in our undergrad courses, we designed a tool-supported timeline method with the goal to encourage the modelers to reflect on choices they have made and the shared understanding of their models. The research questions we followed for this paper were how can a timeline-based method for encouraging reflection on collaborative modeling be implemented? And how well does it work in real educational settings and what are limitations and aspects for improvement? So I will now give you a quick overview of the designed uh, support tool and then present the tested methods. Um, to best support the reflective learning, we exploratively tested which features are best suited in our method key points. Um, is the titular timeline and the comparison views created by comparing different snapshots or markers on this timeline. Um, but let's start first, changes um, to the model are saved in snapshots and represented by markers on the timeline. These snapshots or states of the model's creation process can then later be viewed and compared with each other. 
The goal for this feature was um, the user should be able to spot changes in large and complex models easily and um, um, it should allow users to comprehend the modeling process um, after the model has been created. Uh, we pretested a balance of um, snapshot worthy actions uh, and clustering of changes because we wanted to avoid an overflowing and ultimately unusable timeline, but also not miss important changes made by the users. In the end, these changes were creating and deleting elements or relations and changing text values or labels. The clustering was still necessary because even with this limited set group or uh, set uh, group modeling process created far too many snapshots and markers to be manageable. We ended using five second intervals to collect all changes and create a shared snapshot of all changes within this time frame. The timeline gives two methods um, of browsing and selecting comparisons um, step by step, allowed to view the modeling process um, step by step in chronological order. It worked sort of like a rewind or fast forward button. A to B allowed the users to select any two snapshot markers. You can see this in the picture. There's an A and B marker uh, and compare these two selected model states. The timeline management features are designed for the use of the reflective methods um, and started um, with the ability for trainers or teachers to delete certain snapshots, allowing, for example, to keep only hand-selected significant snapshots and add descriptive comments to um, certain markers to find um, certain snapshots more easily um, afterwards. The comparison view itself is shown in the modeling canvas. We evaluated different styles of comparison notations in our pretest. The goal was to make the changes intuitively and easy comprehensible without compromising the schematics of the uh, model's original notation. Um, in the end, we focused on the mentioned important changes, new elements and relations are shown in green, deleted elements and relations are shown in red, and text changes to keep them readable. We did them not in red and green, but um, we used the style of having the new text displayed and followed by the old text in brackets. For the study, we didn't use UML diagram methods, but instead used the precedence diagram and critical path methods. We used these methods because they always have an unambiguous correct solution with a limited and clear set of rules and mathematical calculations. Thus, mistakes can easily be identified, uh, be identified and tracked, and while strateg and, uh, strategies to solve them are relatively easy to follow. The task given to the, to the participants uh, simulated three fictional departments and their individual work packages. In the first phase, the participants are divided into three subgroups, modeling the PDM diagram for their department, modeling dependencies, and calculating the critical path. In the second phase, the three subgroups come together, get new information about dependency in between each of their department models. To incorporate this, uh, their model from the first phase have to be merged and adjusted, adjusted, and also some values have to be recalculated. Participants are divided into learners and teachers. Learners were undergrad students from our current software engineering and software project management courses. They received a training video and interactive presentation slides about a week before the study to familiarize themselves with the notation and calculation rules of the PDM CPM models. The learners had not yet modeled precedence diagrams themselves. The teachers were research assistants from our department with at least two years of experience in teaching PDM and CPM modeling. Um, now to the first variant of our study, the synchronous group work variant was switched from its original co-located idea to the online conference tool due to pandemic constraints. Um, one round of this study consisted of three times three learners and two teachers. The teachers um, had two different roles. The group teacher's task was to give directions to the learners and answer questions, basically the standard task of a teacher in this lesson. The reflective teacher, uh, the reflection teacher was to observe the group's process during the working phases and note situations that might be important for subsequent discussion in the timeline tool. Also to manage and prepare um, um, certain um, situations. 
The learners worked in two task phases described before, first in small groups, then merging the subgroups models into the final solution. Afterwards, a 30-minute reflection phase was conducted in which the reflection teacher showed the identified situations to the learners and tries to prompt group discussion processes. To evaluate the study, we followed this by group interviews with the learners and the teachers. Um, the results of this study were mixed. On the plus side, coordination problems occurred during the merging phases regularly and were successfully discussed and reflected with the groups during the reflection phase as was intended. But the teachers had problems to find and present suitable situations and snapshots on the timeline for the addressed cases in time. Also, the workload for supervising the exercise and preparation of the reflection phase was underestimated. Far more practice and experience with the method and tool would have been needed. The more exploratory step-by-step -step view mode was preferred and deemed more intuitive. While some learners indicated that they had not paid attention to the comparison models during the reflection phase, all learners rated the reflection phase positively. It was often stated that satellite communication and coordination challenges are often ignored in regular exercises. The second variant we evaluated was focused on single learners and asynchronous homework style tasks and workflows. Um, in this variant, a single learner was given the complete task described before, starting with all information for all three departments and dependencies, and were given five days to model the PDM in our web-based tool. After these five days, the model and its creation timeline was reviewed by a group of two to, four, two to three teachers collaboratively. Um, first, they reviewed the model, the final model, and wrote a typical feedback like in a normal homework situation. Um, then they reviewed the model's creation process with a timeline and wrote a second feedback. This was generally extended feedback since the teachers had more insight into the creation process. Additionally, the teachers made notes during the second review on observations of general strategies used by the learner and origin of errors. To evaluate this study, the learners received both feedbacks and excerpts from the teacher's notes included in a questionnaire. They were asked, among other things, to describe mistakes and problems they noticed themselves during the task, then to read the feedbacks and rate them in terms of comprehensibility and usefulness. Finally, they were asked to read the teacher's notes and assumptions and comment on these. Also, the teachers were absorbed conducting the review and then interviewed afterwards. The results of um, this variant were surprisingly good. By um, searching for errors in the final model beforehand, the teacher's observations naturally focused on finding uh, the origin of these errors. The teachers found the possibilities for drafting their feedback to be more responsive and meaningful regarding finding incorrect procedures and suggesting better practices rather than being limited to simple right or wrong assessments. Similar to the group work variant, time was the biggest hurdle in implementation. The correction of this minimal modeling task were about 90 minutes per learner and homework, well above about the amount of time an application in a normal learning setting would allow. Teachers noted that it was fascinating how well individual strategies and mistakes can be seen. And learners gave uh, much feedback on the teacher's notes and assumptions with an average of uh, 4.5 comments per learner. Um, only 11% uh, were corrections or false assumptions, and even more surprisingly to us, without direct prompting, 56% even agreed the teacher's notes and um, added reflective comments explaining their strategy or thought process in detail. For example, there were instances of, yes, I know I made a mistake here, I really thought it would be easier to copy this element from the left side, I guess it was not a good idea after all. To the conclusion of our study, um, the success of supporting reflective learning depends on the socio-technical intervening of the timeline tool features and the method, meaning how our initiation and support of reflection as well as the interplay of the involved roles organized. We found that the experience required by the teachers to moderate the reflection process and to identify reflection-worthy moments properly in the group work is very high. The high quality of the assumptions made by the teachers about the learner's behavior in the asynchronous homework variant shows that proper analysis of the modeling process can be carried out if enough time is invested. And the detailed verbalization of thoughts on strategies, mistakes, and processes by the learners was better than expected. Thus, it has the potential that we can and should use it in uh, educational settings. 
With that in mind, we designed a new tool with focus on the written reflections of the homework variant. Uh, snapshots on the timeline can now be commented on by multiple users in a style of threads, allowing for more text-based reflections or peer feedback methods. Further research also is needed to identify which additional features um, could help to allow better reflection support during the synchronous task. Our evaluation included wishes for heat map modes or automated highlighting of potential more interesting moments in the modeling process. For this uh, to work, further research is um, needed into domain-specific reflection path of conceptual modeling um, to raise the efficiency of this method and maybe reduce the workload for teachers and learners. Generally, more insight into typical problematic situations and or strategies of the modeling process for different modeling notations as well as different model modeler types are needed. That was all. Thank you for your time. I will happily answer any questions. Feel free to write me or uh, ask right away. Thank you and take care. Excellently done, Marcel. Thank you very much. Um, very, very cool idea and very, very cool work. And we already have some questions here. First one by Rod Miller you would like to ask it yourself. Oh, I'm so sorry. I have a problem when I'm unmuting myself. Uh, I, I liked what I heard in this presentation very much. I'm uh, battling uh, conceptual modeling, modern software development for years. And uh, I just wanted to know why would you call any model incorrect? And what would be, what would you tell the students if a particular model is incorrect? What's your criteria to calling something incorrect? And would you allow a freedom of thinking and a human perception when modeling, which would automatically maybe affect your way of assessing whether something is correct or not? Is my question too long? I think it's okay. I think I, I know what you're getting at. Um, so basically, in 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 our normal um, um, teaching and education, I, I wouldn't uh, even go to saying a model is incorrect. Um, we we used this this um, modeling language in this example because we had um, the it made it easier to see there is a, is a clear wrong or right because there are things that had to be calculated and uh, we could this see this there. Um, um, and um, the, the main goal um, to support the reflective design is, is, is to, to not have the simple assessment of a right model or wrong model, but, but really to, to, to help, um, to help um, understand decisions and why decisions in the modeling process lead to different outcomes. There's basically not the, the main goal is, is it wrong or is it right? But, um, but, um, but, um, promote more um, what are best practices and what are practices that maybe um, should be worried about. Like um, um, a main part of, of, of my experience in, 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 in teaching this is like, there are certain, certain, um, certain mistakes and certain practices um, which should be taught to keep in mind that you, you don't uh, um, make your life harder than it has to be. Okay, thank you. Very nice. I think we have time for one more question. And what, what interests me is, um, is this. So, so um, I have a very similar um, problem, really, with, with people who I'm trying to teach how to learn um, conceptual modeling. And one thing that I'm noticing is that students fight almost more with the tool than with the idea. To what degree can you make a differentiation in what, what change was a cognitive process and what change was just ugliness of the tool? Yeah, that, that, that's that's a hard one. That was was basically something that that uh, happened in, in our studies over time. Um, um, basically, that that's the point because uh, why there are limits to 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 automate this uh, this reflection process. Like you you have to 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 have this second teacher. Um, getting a sense of okay, that's now a problem with the software. There's now a problem. I'm, there was, of course, the switch to online tools, which, which created always the same problems we talked yeah. about. And um, yeah, basically, that's that's the human factor. There, there needs to be an experienced teacher to 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 really find the moments and uh, 
they have to see the moments where where there's really a meaningful discussion about uh, modeling practices and where not and yeah yeah i i would agree with that so so one thing that i noticed we're using enterprise architect uh, in my courses and um it's it's the, the least crummy tool that I've used, and they're all crummy. You know, no matter which tool you use, they're all somehow somehow bad. Um, and and it's just I'm reckoning it's just noise at some point, right? It's just noise of editing that happens, it's just like writing a paper. Or so there's just a bunch of edits that happen, and and some of them are meaningful, and then you'll talk about those, and others not. Would be interesting to find a way to find them, like maybe something you know. If we have a big sample of, of edits happening for bunches of students in the same manner, we could probably filter that out. But anyways, that was just, just a thought. Does uh, anyone else have a question they'd like to ask our presenter today? Well, in that case, thank you very much, Marcel. Very nicely done. Um, we're, we're virtually staying in Germany with... Uh, um, Vincent Langenfeld, who will be presenting, oh, I forgot my cheat sheet here, uh, a software lab with on-demand support. Um, Vincent, take it away. Okay, now, now I found the button to unmute me. Okay, so uh, hello, my name is Vincent Langenfeld, and I will give you a short glimpse into our software lab design today. Okay, so um, to begin with, a uh, little bit of context. Our software lab is relatively uh, early in our bachelor's degree. It's in the uh, third term. So our students only had two previous programming courses. Um, we have 100 students per year. On average, the tendency goes up. And um, we try to assemble groups of at max uh, seven students per group. Additionally, our course is only worth six ECTS points, which is equal to 180 hours of work in, on average per student, which if you think about a, a fully fledged software lab is not that much time to do real lab work. So we had to think about what are the uh, learning goals we really want to get across to our students. And we arrived at those four points so um, it's, it's approaching, approaching the middle of, of the uh, bachelor's degree. So the students should start to learn to uh, familiarize themselves with the topics they are working on and uh, not only follow uh, uh, the things from the lectures. Um, they should start learning to work in a team and not in, in your casual uh, a bunch of friends working on, on worksheets, but in a team that is assembled from outside, like in your later work life. Also, you should learn to work with complexity in the, the sense of the complexity that a team of seven people can build in, in three to four months of coding and and. Um, uh, committing to a project. And to solve the later two, we want them to, uh, uh, to apply uh, software engineering principles. And for those learning go goals, um, the team part and the complexity part, this is something that is uniquely learnable within the software lab course at our bachelor's degree at, uh, degree at University of Freiburg and in nearly no other lecture within that setting. So when you take a look at these learning goals, you will see there will be lots of challenges with learning this in that time. So um, the first will be the complexity of the whole thing approaching the students. So in more detail, the students will be facing new, to new tools, new, new techniques in the course. They will use a new programming language as they approach a, a real problem, a real project. This time they will use a real IDE and not some text editor to make, make, to make, to make worksheets happen. Um, they will use cooperation tools probably the first time. So they will use an issue checker and a source code uh, management system on, and all those that stuff. We additionally want them to write nice to read code. So they will also have a static code analysis or something running on their project. Then they have the social complexities of having a team of new people 
that are their peers, they have to communicate with them, but also they have to communicate with our simulated customers. So we will take the role of customers in some situations and you will communicate differently with the customer. And of course, they have a large project they want to realize and there's this problem domain which they have to learn what, what um, the problem domain is all about. Now we have teams of seven students and there will be social problems, namely social loafing and free riding. Students will try to avoid working. That's that's just happening. And also it's a bachelor's degree. It's, 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 it's the uh, third term. So we have students that hardly are able to program in, in some language because they just managed those two programming courses. And we have students that just need the degree and did professional programming, so they know what they are doing, but they, uh, the project is for all of them. And a additional problem are not students not working, but students working too much who take the whole project into their own hand. And then um, later they say, oh, you did nothing or he took all the work. So um, that's a problem. And there's student motivation. Um, there are students that don't like the, the topic you will give them for the project and uh, even larger problems. Students will, in a co complex environment, approach roadblocks and then they might stop working because they, they uh, are exhausted from that roadblock and they will cease working. So now I selected just some of the treatments we use in our in our lab course. So there is a, a bunch of systems working together to, to counteract those challenges. And I selected a few for this talk to talk about. So the first regards complexity. So we don't want to get rid of the complexity, but we are of the opinion that this complexity is the thing that enables the students to learn things about complexity and social uh, social team uh, social things and teamwork so we don't want to get rid of this but we want to support the students as much as possible so before the covid uh, crisis we did sit one afternoon within the student pool as peers of the students engaging in conversation engaging in in problem solving with the students that were there and they could ask and they could just chat with us and also we have tutors that are um that did the course already and that can be asked for problem uh, if there are problems and all the lecturers and tutors are usually always available per chat or on the the comments of the issue tracker or like that so somebody is always there and can help with the problems you have a bigger problem are students that are not approaching us, but are working on, on their stuff and, and getting stuck and, and not uh, prompting to get uh, uh, help. So we have a bunch of feedback loops and metrics to, to recognize those students and to approach them ourselves or get tutors to approach them and to help them which is uh, not only that we have a weekly scrum, fa scrum phase where we can, can review all the data about the students, but also uh, metrics on the uh, code of the group and on the working time of the group where we can uh, select treatments. Now, on the problem of social loafing and free riding, here especially the varying skill levels in the beginning, we do not let students um, decide which groups they want to build and nor do we do we randomize the groups but there's a self-assessment in the beginning of the course and the self-assessment asks for for uh, a self-assessment and many topics like technical things like how good uh, they are in programming organization and so on so that we can assemble teams that are uh, potentially able in all the fields and all the subtopics you need to, to accomplish this uh, software lab. Also, there are questions that call for the motiva uh, how motivated students are or try to, to gauge how motivated the students are and about the, their uh, general background. 
And so we can assemble teams that are not only able, but diverse in motivation, because, for example, the two eager students are then moderated by the not so eager students, so they arrive at a, a doable project size over their discussion what they want to do within the project and are helping each other out in this sense. Also, we allow the students to uh, control some of the admission criteria during uh, in their group during the whole project. So students can penalize behavior of other students in the group that is detrimental to the, to the group success, like uh, always making broken check-ins. So they, can, they could add some part to the definition of done um, that uh, penalizes some of this behavior. And as an easy one for the student motivation, we selected the uh, topic of developing a game because we think games are rather interesting for most students, but also because games have some other nice properties. The first is we can we can formulate some technical, rather technical requirements that set a, a baseline um difficulty for the whole project but do not take away the the agency of the students so they can decide what is our game how does it work and we just set a, a base difficulty in some technical regards that have to be fulfilled also um ga game development uh, has many subtopics that are rather game unrelated that students that do not have any a love for games can can tackle like uh, uh, um, performant algorithms and, and networking and pathfinding and things like that. So does this course design as we do it work? In the end of our course, we make a voluntary feedback, uh, a voluntary feedback questionnaire with uh, it's it's relatively long, but there's one part where you can give your feedback on a Likert scale to a bunch of questions. So if we take a look at the uppermost graph, there is the question, my work on the project was very important to my group, which are the golden distributions that you can see. And as we can see, most students think that their work was important for the group, which is uh, nice for motivation when you think your work is important. And um, another question in the upper graph shows if enough help was available. This was uh, uh, deemed as uh, students agree to that, that enough help is available until the course of 1920 where we moved from the fourth to the third sim, uh, term and had lots more students and had you can see there's an upwards tendency so we are we're acclim acclimatized acclimatizing to that um uh setting now also you can see in the lower graph there are two questions about uh, how much the students learned the um, golden one is if they learned much in the software lab, which is uh, continuously answered as uh, students highly agree, or at least agree. And um, the second question, the blue one, is if they learned more than in any other course, which does have some uh, positive answers, which is nice. <laughs> so we also ask the students if they enjoyed the lab course. And this is usually answered very positively. The only thing riddling us uh, today is um, the question if they were um, uh, satisfied, uh, dissatisfied with the work of other group members, which you can see uh, develops to this hourglass shape where some groups say yeah no everything was fine and some groups say yeah in some groups there's the, the uh, answer that they were unsatisfied with the work of individual group members this leads us to the conclusion and future work so 
you see we are of the opinion that you should keep the whole project complexity and um, lessen the blow with providing enough support for the students and that in every stage of the project on and on many ways as possible and also assemble the groups that the students can pick their own pace and their own challenges within the lab course. In the future, we want to improve the group comp composition, especially the part of the group composition that is only task oriented at the moment or mostly task oriented because we want to incorporate some uh, uh, properties on how people like to work and how they like to teamwork and on their um, wishes on how good the product will be. So we want to come incorporate non-task oriented properties. Also, we want to make additional material to known problem topics like uh, object oriented programming and profiling and all the, the little parts of teamwork and um, working on a big project in some um, way students can uh, consume on their own uh, time. And that concludes my talk. Thank you for listening. Very nicely done, Vincent. Thank you much. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Oh, there's a first one from Suraj. Would you take it away, Suraj? Yeah, sorry. Um, I was just asking, um, wondering how you calculated the individual student uh, grade. Yeah, so um, that's 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 um, two part the grade. So we have some scheme on how we grade the games. There is this, um, the students have to a very short design phase in which they design their game and promise some features as part of a design document and they are graded on the on the designed uh, on the uh, um, um, things they committed to and we have a, a scheme on how to to grade the games but uh, you can read that within the paper um, that's the first part of the of the grade the second part is a kind of um, work metric. So we, we just assume that every student wants to work and every student gets some points per week. So we have weekly sprints in a scrum fashion and you just always get the full points. But um, if you do not do your work, the work you committed to or do work, um, bad work. So that's the part where other, other group members can penalize you for, for violating the definition of done. Then points are, the, the, um, points are subtracted. And if you lose points, your grade gets worse. But um, overall, the grade, the grade grading the project is not not really relevant i think we use it to tell the students what we want and as the the um, big hammer in the background but um we want all students to succeed if they reach the end of the lab because it's much work and so um, if they work they should get a rather good grade okay thank you yeah, I, I agree. And, and uh, um, when, when you say that, um, I am noticing, like, I'm teaching a very similar course, except not for, for the third semester. I think that's very courageous of you to do. And, and I think you're doing a very good job if this is so successful. Uh, in, in my case, it's um, fourth and fifth semester, I believe, students who, who usually do this. So they're a little bit more experienced, but you can definitely see the transition from, from student, what do you want me to do? to engineer uh, oh this is how how i did it because and this is what i encourage what i usually encourage and i'm seeing many of the same pitfalls with uh, you know loafing nice word by the way uh and with with the social loafing and such and what i found is um that peer assessment is an invaluable tool at two points of the semester i'm asking them to evaluate each other how they think they did and then i'm sharing those results with each other anonymized of course and um some people really wake up um, and some people just don't and they continue to be a potato for the rest of the semester. And if that's the case, then fine. You know, they get, they get their minimum passing grade or whatever. 
but I think it's an invaluable tool. Um, and it seems like you're doing something quite similar here, right? So you're, you're rewarding the, the engagement. You're not rewarding the outcome, the successful project. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. We, have, we, yep. we do even have this mechanic, which, which is really hard for students to understand. You, you commit in the big, we, we have a, 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 a low uh, a high pass filter in, in that sense, so that students under a certain commitment are uh, guaranteed to not be, uh, 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 to not uh, pass the course. So in the, in the scrum sense, you have to commit to seven hours of planned work. And students ha have a hard time understanding that it's planned work not real work so yeah. they they control everything they they control the the um, estimate for the work and they have to to bring a certain estimate yeah so they can at max control themselves indeed. within this settings indeed there's another question from elke the elke do you want to bring it forward Well, um, that was very interesting, but uh, I was wondering uh, uh, about the workload of uh, your tutors, because that uh, you mentioned their on-demand support, and uh, how was that perceived uh, by your instructors? So, so you think the, the tutors do, do really high, have a really high workload? I think so, maybe also uh, during off time and so. Yeah, yeah. Because so, they have to, um, to, to, to give uh, the support uh, uh, not three days uh, later, but uh, maybe on short notice. Yeah. So we, we always say it's voluntary. You can, you can only do the meetings and the, the necessary stuff, but you can do more. And usually our tutors are uh, highly engaged in the groups and to, to help the groups and like their job, I think. To have this this uh, mentor position. Uh, that, that's that. Well, you know, and one thing we can always count on is that some some engaged students are always willing to go the extra mile, right? So it's a uh, that's the way academia works in general. I would say. Anyways, thank you very much, Vincent. I think we'll um, we'll, we'll move towards the break here now. But before we do, uh, let me quickly give um, uh, Joy Lee the opportunity to self-identify if she or one of her um, substitutes perhaps joined the conference so far? That seems not to be the case. My friends, thank you very much. This much. This concludes our, um, our uh, um, hold on, let me share this here real quick. This concludes our morning session um, for, for this conference. We now have a 30 minute break and we will return here at noon, that is noon Eastern Standard Time, 6 p.m. European time, um, uh, uh, I believe, and you know, wherever it is. So go grab lunch, go grab breakfast, or go grab dinner. We'll see you in 30 minutes. In the meantime, uh, it also occurred to me that it might be useful for us to have some breakout rooms in case the presenters and some interested folks might want to continue the discussion. So um, while, while you eat, I'll make some breakout, breakout rooms for you to enjoy after the break. See you at noon. Can of course stay here. Um, this stream, this conference will not close. We'll just, I'll hang out. I'll get lunch at some point. But if you want to do something else, we have you have half an hour. Question. Yes. I got a quick question. Um, Nancy, hi. Hi. Are you loading the slides on behalf of the speakers or are they loading their own? Oh, shoot. Oh, oh no, fuck. <laughs> oh, my Zoom just died. You're, you're, Am I you're still in? Somewhere.
Am I still there? Okay. Oh no! Yeah. Now I used now I used a bad yeah. word on the live oh, stream. Please. Oh no! It's a uh, bad language. You're still there. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! My I got Windows gave me this thing said Zoom quit unexpectedly, and I'm like, oh no! Please don't do that. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, what can I do for you, Nancy? My question was: um, Are you loading the slides on behalf of the speakers, or are they doing screen share? They're doing screen share. They're doing it themselves. Okay. Great. Is. I have the power to um, to uh, uh, quit it for them. So if they don't don't forget right. to are unmute you, them or something. Like that. What's that? Are you going to be on all day or just part of the day? I'll 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 be here. All right. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. I'll I'll be there ninety percent of the time myself with other distractions, no doubt. Okay. However, since th this is our more or less our lunch break or dinner break or whatever, yeah, uh, I think I'll go do that. Yeah, actually, I might do the same thing. Um, so I'll, I'll be I'll be out for a little while, um, right. uh, and uh, then I'll be back before the session continues.
All right, we're getting ready to get started here again in about two minutes or so. Waiting for people to rejoin. All right. Well, we're just about back. Uh, some people are streaming back into the Zoom session, which is great. Um, also seeing that approximately eight people are watching us on YouTube. So hi to all of YouTube, YouTube watchers. Um, it's just eight of you, but on the other hand, it's also eight of you, which is great. Um, my friends, uh, the next session is upon, um, upon us and Stefan has the lead. Yeah, thank you, Bastian, and welcome back after this um, short break. We will now go into the session on assessment, evaluation, and measurements. And the first presentation will be given by Henrik Christensen from Denmark, who is telling us more about how to use student screencasts as an alternative to written submissions. Henrik, would you like to share your screen? Yes, yeah, you can I think see it, now. it should be there. Yes, we can see it. And now and the please audio go is ahead okay. with your presentation. Yes, it's okay. We can hear you. Fine. I think, first of all, I'd like to say thanks that uh, I can uh, save the cost of uh, going to Hawaii. Hawaii is a nice place, but already from the start, I was granted the permission to stay in Denmark and save the, the time and cost. Uh, so thank you for that. Well, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, screencast, and you all know what a screencast is. You know, it's a digital recording of the computer screen while uh, someone is talking uh, about what they are doing. And it, it's widely used in teaching. And if you go to YouTube, you can find an awful lot of uh, high quality screencasts about uh, how to do a lot of different stuff. Um, so for instance, here I have a, um, a screencast running where a student, well, it's me, uh, trying to display how to do a test room development. And you do that by actually doing the, the development uh, using the tests, running the tests, you execute them, and then you can flip over to, uh, to the theory sort of, you know, demonstrate. So sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Henrik, but we are seeing your Adobe Acrobat and part of your desktop. If you're show, showing anything else, we're not seeing that right now. Okay, so uh, I think I'll just uh, skip. So how do I do this? Um, stop sharing. If you have two screens, yeah, you have to stop yeah, sharing. I'm sharing, and the, then... I'm sharing the wrong screen. Yeah, then, then stop sharing and start it again and choose the right my, one. Do uh, you see my new screen now? Yes, we yes. are. Great. Thank Sorry you. for that. <laughs> no, no worries. <laughs> well, you know, I do a lot of teaching and do a lot of Zoom works, and then you can, uh, yeah, slip. Okay, so as I said, you know, I've already talked you through 
for screencast R, uh, and uh, this was the one I should have shown you, and I hopefully you see that it's live and, and working. And uh, what you can do is, of course, you can demonstrate uh, your process and, and uh, compare theory with the, the actual uh, work you do on the computer screen. So, as I said, this is uh, widely used in, uh, in, uh, in teaching to, to sort of communicate from the teacher towards the students. Uh, but what I've done and what I'm reporting in the paper is how to reverse this uh, interaction, actually. So, instead of the student doing some work, solving some uh, software architecture engineering task, and then write a report about what they've done. Uh, actually make them uh, do a screencast, uh, then they send instead of a written report, and then uh, we uh, evaluate and grade and assess uh, the screencast, and uh, of course provide comments uh, on, on what they are, are doing. So the first question is why, why use screencasts for the students? Uh, well. One thing that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a teacher and, and I think uh, myself as this constructivistic uh, idea is that uh, what I do is less important than what the students are doing. So I want them to, to do stuff and then reflect upon it. And of course, uh, the things they do must uh, closely align with the learning goals. And the context here is, as I said, a software engineering and architecture course. So what they are, I, I try to teach them is to use sister and development, design patterns, frameworks, modern tool chains uh, to do uh, good design and, and produce high quality code. And of course, in, in this endeavor, I want them to spend as much time on designing and coding as in, and little time on, on writing uh, reports. So it's not a goal to, to improve the academic writing. And I consider this screencast a way in order to reduce the amount of time they spend on writing reports and then to uh, enhance it, the time uh, they use on actually designing and the coding. So more aligning with the, with the learning goals. So this is actually something I've been done for yeah, six, seven uh, years. So actually it was, uh, I started doing this in, in 14. And uh, the initial hypothesis were these. First of all, are the screencasts better to convey the, the learning goals uh, compared to written reports? And the second one, as I said uh, before, uh, are they more efficient to produce for the students uh, than the written reports and thereby uh, leaving more time for, for the coding and, and designing experience? And the third thing was, of course, that now we as teachers and teaching assistants have to assess the screencast. And could we also have some benefits about it's being more efficient to, to grade and assess these screencasts compared to written reports? Now, as I said, I've been doing this for quite a lot of years and I'm continuing to do it. Uh, so there's also a broader perspective also reported in the paper, uh, because for what are the pitfalls in, in trying to do this? Uh, how do you more efficiently assess them? And, and uh, are there some types of exercises that are better suited for screencasting than uh, others? Um, so these were the initial uh, hypotheses, and then uh, in the paper, I present uh, the data for, for six years of uh, evaluations. Um, so what I've done is I asked the students uh, Likert scale questions and free text comments uh, throughout the years. Uh, I've assessed uh, what the impressions of the teaching assistants, uh, the tutors are uh, by two uh, open-ended interviews in 14 and 17. And actually, uh, besides this course, that's sort of the main uh, source of data. I also did a, two instances of a cloud computing course in 15 and 16, and I was a teaching assistant there. So I did all the assessments. So I, I was heavily involved in, in assessing the screencast and, and learned quite a lot uh, from that. Some of the reviewers argue that the data collection is a bit uneven, and I like to apologize for that. You'll find it in the paper. And that's, uh, to be frank, you know, uh, I, I'm primarily a, a teacher more than a researcher. So the data collection from my point of view was primarily in order to improve my teaching more than to, uh, to produce a scientific paper. But there's, uh, there's some uneven parts of the data collection. 
still, you know, one of the main conclusions, uh, well, I keep doing using screencasts uh, for these uh, kinds of assessments and, and that's because they work. <laughs> so they are viable and a relevant alternative to writing reports. But it, I must also say that uh, in the beginning, I use screencasts for all types of um, assessments or, or sort of exercises. But today I've, I focus on primarily on three types of exercises where I think they, they are really great. First of all, and this is probably quite obvious, you know, process oriented exercises, you know, test room development, that's a, a process. You, you do things uh, in, in time and you have to unfold the process in order to show that you understand it. And, and they, they are excellent for this. There was a paper written some time ago where they actually taught uh, test room development for students, but, but they found out later that they just faked it and then wrote something in the report. And, and you can't fake anything uh, when, you, when you do a screencast of your test room development uh, process. Execution oriented uh, exercises, uh, especially in my cloud computing courses, it was a very heavy setup. For instance, one of the exercises you had to have 20 servers running. And, 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 and the best way to document that you actually have 20 servers running that, that do replica sets and stuff is actually doing a screencast where you can see all the uh, things are, are running and the students talk you over where data is stored and how the, the stacks and the orchestration is working. So, so very nice for that. And finally, I also find that um, these, uh, this course is a, a course where there's a lot of uh, large code base and, and uh, using screencasts, the students can actually guide you around the, the code base in a nice way. For instance, you have to define uh, or, or develop an abstract factory design pattern, and then they have to show where the places where the factory is created, where the interface, where is it used. And then you get a quick overview of the code base of, of the students, and it provides a, a good overview. And often you don't have to dig into the code them yourself in order to understand uh, the context. Regarding the, the research questions, you know, uh, again, the summary here is um, that for these kinds of exercises, uh, the students, they tell me that it does demonstrate their work better than if they had to write a report. And that's of course nice because it aligns better with the learning goals. And uh, much to uh, also Im very important, it does reduce the effort of the students, but you have to, to, to guide them there, more, more will follow in. One thing uh, is that it, it does not seem to reduce the teaching assistance effort. It's about the same effort in order to assess screencasts compared to, to written reports um, and, and of course that's sad, but that's, uh, well, that's just how it is. You know, a screencast you have to watch. So there's a timeline there. You can't like a report, you skim and, and, and just browse the report in order to, to grade and assess it. I think some of the, the, the main points of this work is probably that there are some best practices in using this. So there's a lot of pitfalls actually. And one thing that I, I found myself in the first year was that, that you see a lot of very high quality screencasts produced by you know, the big institutions and on, on YouTube and stuff like that. And, and the students, they model their own screencasts after this and, and they want it to be picture perfect. And then it becomes extremely uh, time consuming to produce a high quality screencast. You know? Uh, one uh, group reported first we spent two hours making a, a storyboard, then we retook the screencast 20 times until it was perfect, you know. So you have to be very frank up front that this is not a Hollywood movie. Make a screencast and if it really is a bad screencast, then retake it, but, but don't make it three times or four times, you know. So, so bear with the, the unpolished uh, screencast. A report follows a, a template which is well known, but, but you actually have to, uh, in your exercise descriptions, provide a template for the screencast as well. You, know, you have to introduce yourself, what is the group number, what's the group name, state what you are going to do, do it, and, and then refer to the theory and then conclude and what you have done. So, so this structure of the screencast is uh, important. Regarding assessments of uh, the, um, the, the screencast, there's also some, uh, some uh, practices, and these are mostly from the teaching assistants who, who develop good ways of, of assessing them. 
for instance, uh, one thing is you know keep the the you <laughs> the video on one screen uh, and and uh, and an assessment template on the other, and then uh, simply stop the the, the screencast uh, when there's something to comment on, you know, and and note uh, the the point in time by minute second notation, you know, because if if you just watch the screencast and then you have to actually see it once again in order to provide the feedback, so so this uh, uh, saves some time in in assessment. Well, some instructors and TAs also say they can actually watch the screencast in double speed and then still hear the audio and, and do some assessment. Uh, I must admit, I, I tried that in my course and I can't do it, but, uh, but, but some sort of uh, appears to, to have an audio capacity that, uh, that matches uh, that. So I think that the main conclusion is this is actually a nice technique for, for specific uh, types of, um, of um, assessments and exercises uh, when i look at the related work it's very slim and it seems that, that very few uh, uses this technique and, and i think it's fun that when teachers use screencasting so much uh, towards the students that we don't uh, sort of try and get the idea to reverse uh, this uh, interaction so with that and i hope uh, you you got the most of uh, my slides uh, i say thank you for your attention Thanks a lot for the presentation. And we um, have two or three minutes for questions. So are there any questions from the audience? Yeah, uh, I have one perhaps. Um, yeah. Henrik, uh, this was really cool. I really enjoyed this one. Um, Thank you. I'm wondering uh, how much, pretty much the same question that I had earlier this morning when, when I was wondering how much did students struggle picking up the idea of a streamcast. You, know, you type a report, it comes natural to just hack it away. You know, you need notepad for, at, at most. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. But how much do they struggle with tools and things like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's, the question has two answers. And, and one is they struggled a lot in 2014 and today no problem at all <laughs> you know i think yeah. what, what the good thing about corona is that that uh, in the beginning you know they had too bad uh, video quality and they didn't have a webcam and stuff like that so that's sort of you know out of the question today and um, there were some who had this fear of you know talking to 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 a medium uh, in the early times but but it, it's gone you know people are used to have webcams and and they're used to it and they see so many screencasts so so it's much more integrated so i say if you if you start using it i don't think you'll have uh, the big obstacles that's that's interesting an observation that i've made last semester was that many students are like you know they're really into streaming and video game streaming on twitch and things yeah, right yeah, yeah, but yeah, as yeah. soon as you ask them to turn their camera on in zoom they're like oh they don't know how to do that it's yeah, yeah, really yeah. bizarre but 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 uh, again you know it's a question of you can either fail this course or do the thing i want you to and then uh, you know it's sort <laughs> of you know but but there, there, there is uh, some students have a, a a problem with it and and but it's it's much less than uh, years ago yeah. we have done something similar a year ago in a course and um, where the, um, that was on on design patterns and we basically mm -hmm. asked the students to present their solution and we even asked them to go um, like um, on the left side that should show the model on the right side they should show the code oh, and okay. in the uh, bottom corner they should still show their their video stream so that we can actually uh, know that it, it's actually from them and not uh, yeah, fake yeah, with, yeah. with someone else yeah and it also went pretty well i mean a couple of students they said uh, they have technical issues but then our tutors basically helped them and and yeah then they yeah. figured it out and i think it's a good learning experience as well i mean it also is a lot about soft skills right they have to present yeah. something yeah and this is what we actually want to teach them in the end right yeah yeah one question I actually posed in initial thing was, uh, but it's not in the paper, was, uh, do you think this trained you better for the oral exam? We have an oral exam. And there, there was also, you know, uh, data, you know, saying you, 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 you have done a lot of oral presentation using the screencast uh, during the course. So they were better suited for, for the oral exam. So, so I think there's a lot of benefits of uh, this kind of uh, way of doing it. Yeah, I mean, the only drawback instead of a real presentation is that you cannot ask questions in the end, right? If they send a screencast, but I, I think that's okay. Yeah, sure, but, but and, they're and, not uh, nervous of saying things. Yeah, so. 
and Becky is pointing out in the chat, if you don't mind me saying this out loud, Becky, is that uh, students whine that complain that they can't do it in the last minute. Uh, that's that's, that's <laughs> yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, but but that's that's the way it is, you know. <laughs> okay, thank you very much again for this interesting perspective um, and for um, yeah talking about this um, very innovative idea, in my opinion. Um, I'd like to hand over to the next presentation now. Um, Bastian will tell us more about calibrated peer reviews and requirements engineering. So Bastian, I'm already curious what you want to tell us here. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Um, you, ha you have to deal with me once again. And uh, boom. So it seems it, this did not work. Well, um, how about now? Am I still am I here again? Yeah, you are here again. Okay, but let me try. Let me try this one more time. Okay, how do you feel about this now? Yeah, looks great. All, all right. Uh, so, sorry about that. Thanks. Thanks for bearing with me and for dealing with me yet yet again. Um, right. I'm going to tell you why you should never teach requirements engineering without calibrated peer reviews ever again. And uh, let's let's get started. So. Um, and now my slides don't forward. That's just, just good. here we go. Okay, so as you know, requirements engineering is one of the most fundamental topics in software engineering at large. It's unfortunately also one of the most theoretical ones. Right? We have lots of different topics that we have to cram into the student's brain in just a couple of short weeks. And most of these um, topics are very theoretical and require examples. Right? They require uh, examples that unfortunately are either very academic in nature, if you know us instructors are making them up as we go, very few real life sample specifications are available and those that are available are usually huge, right? They're way too huge to, uh, to um, look at individual concepts um, for students to, to learn and get better at. And of course, requirements engineering is one of those things. You just don't learn the theory and become a great requirements engineer. You have to practice over and over and over again. And we had it pretty. We had it down pretty well. So after a little while, um, we had a pretty good mode of how to instruct this, and uh, people were learning collaboratively. Everything was excellent. And then the pandemic hit, and we were teaching things to to screens like this a lot. And uh, I, I'm I'm having a feeling if you're an instructor, you know exactly what I'm talking about. All cameras are off. All microphones are off. Students began to well lose their motivation and enthusiasm. They no longer were really engaged with the class material. And when back in the day, they maybe retained 20% of the things we told, told them. And now, you know, they, they retained even less. And, you know, someone earlier this morning spoke about Zoom fatigue, and that's something we all have. And one, one more thing that I want to tell, talk to you about is this. We noticed that students stopped reflecting on their work. They did the work, they did the assignment sheets, and then they were done. They didn't go back to the assignment sheets to see, well, is there, is there a way to do it better, perhaps, and refine? And we noticed that this happened because of the shift to remote instruction. For in the classroom, not really a problem. Over Zoom, big problem. And we were not sure how to combat this. And then we learned about calibrated peer reviews. So in case you don't know what calibrated peer reviews are, um, it's a formative a peer assessment technique where the, learn, uh, the learners are evaluating themselves and even giving in each other grades. And um, we didn't inv invent uh, CPR, some, some other people did, and it was initially designed as a tool to help creative writing instruction. So it's a web-based tool. But the principle underlying it can be applied anywhere, right? The idea is that after students made their assignments, they're, dis they're submitting them, and we're collecting them and redistributing them and giving them a peer evaluation package consisting of calibrated solutions that they can then use to assess each other. The specific benefit that I believe it has for things like requirements engineering, so theory heavy topics, is that really it reintroduces the idea of learning by multiple examples. There's not just one solution the students see, there is multiple examples over and over and over again. They see different kinds of alternatives, how to solve a certain modeling task, how to, you know, which other, what requirements other people extracted from the interview, things like that. And most importantly, 
they learn how to articulate modeling alternatives by providing each other with feedback. So, and I thought this was a great idea. Um, let's do this in our, in our undergraduate safety requirements engineering course. Now, I don't wanna to talk too much about the course. I've spoke, spoken about this course plenty of times at this very conference. So if you're interested in seeing the latest paper is down here um, or, or ignore it. Either way, uh, it's a 15 week course meets three times a week for 55 minutes has usually around between 16 and 30 students in it and has four major milestones. And the reason why I'm mentioning them is because what we tackled with this peer evaluation technique is the assignment sheets, which then the solutions from the assignment sheets students are supposed to apply in a semester long project. And then finally, there are two major ways of formative assessment in the course, uh, in midterm and a final exam. Last year, there were six assignment sheets we had all together, and um, they roughly accompany the different kinds of topics that we have in the course, um, like, for example, eliciting requirements from interviews or various modeling things. And as Rod Miller pointed out earlier today, you know, as modeling is a hard one, right? Because there's no perfect solution to any given modeling task. And that's, that's one of the things that we're going to talk about here. So the way we applied calibrated peer reviews was like this. Um, here are, here's this activity diagram up here shows the rough workflow. The gray parts are those things that are special for calibrated peer review. And as you can see, um, after assigning the assignment sheet, student had roughly 10 days or so to complete their solution. Mm -hmm. Then we asked them to submit them anonymously. So, I mean, we, the instructors knew who, who's who, but, um, we made sure that the solution themselves doesn't contain any, any names, for example. And we did that by having the teams pick these unique to them, unique enough identifiers like this. This is like, I think, birth year and your ma mother's maiden name or something like this. So this is what we picked and, and this worked pretty well. Then we assigned the teams and it, it assigned each individual team uh, up to three reviews. And each review, uh, each team then would be would receive a review package. And this review package consists of the following things. And this is what makes calibrated peer review calibrated. The solution, uh, the, the review package consists of three calibrated solutions, a low quality, a medium quality, and a high quality solution. And just because we are we, we also provided them with an instructor solution. So let's say this may be not necessarily the ideal copy or the ideal solution, but a good solution that they can achieve. We also gave them a common grading rubric as, as in what to deduct points for roughly and what to award points for roughly, although we allowed for a lot of leeway and we gave them a grading template. Well, then they had seven days to complete the reviews. We collected the non-anonymous feedback and then the most important thing, we decided to quality check every single review, meaning we read through it and make sure that there was no, let's say profanity in it or there was, uh, you know, people actually did the review and didn't just submit in blank, a blank template. So this is how we did it. Uh, we used, um, it's a manual process and we used the spreadsheet that looks almost like this to assign the reviews and then later to also collect the grades they give to each other and compute the grades that they would give and that they would, that each team would receive. So the question is, well, Bastian, that's all great, but you know, um, how, how well did the students do? And here, what I brought with me here is a line graph showing how the implementation of calibrated peer reviews in 2021 compared to both previous years, 2020 also during the pandemic and 2019. When we look at all the assignment sheets, especially here at the final median score here, we can see that in 2021, they did 9% points better, right, than 2020, and even 16% points better than in 2019. Now, when we computed a t-test, we found that these, in fact, results are, in fact, significantly higher than both previous years, while tw between 2019 and 2020, there was no significant difference. So now I know what you're saying. I know you're thinking, well, Bastian, that's great. So you're asking students to give each other grades. Of course, they're going to be higher. And did they learn though, more, though? And yes, we believe they did. Um, I should mention that the grading rubric here between all assignment sheets was the same across all three years. Uh, the difference is that in 2021, it was the instructor, uh, I'm sorry, in, in, 
in 2021, it was not the instructor who provided the grades, right? So in, in 2021, these grades here are calculated by, are awarded by students, whereas the other two grades were given by the instructor. <clears throat> so the question is, did they learn anything more? And the answer is, we believe they did. The midterm and the final exam was the same across all three years, and the grading rubric was the same in all three years, and it was the same instructor who graded the exams in all three years. When we measure um, the, re the, the retention as, as assessed by the exams, we can see that the average grade was again much higher than in previous years. Computing t-tests showed us that the result was significant between 2021 compared to 2019, not significant between 19 and 20, and not significant either between 2020 and 2021, but barely so, right? But let's not do, let's not hack the P. This was not significant nonetheless. So we can see that there's, there's, there's a certain effect happening here. And the only difference that we did in between those that we changed here was really the calibrated peer review during the assignment sheets, which is an immediate preparation for the final exam. That's pretty great. Um, and and one, one thing that I also enjoyed is that students went from, oh my God, this seems annoying. I hate to, I, I would hate to review other people. Uh, this seems like another thing to do. Um, they went from that attitude to, oh my God, what a useful tool. This gave me great confidence that I was on the right track. And it took them exactly one assignment sheet to realize that. So the students really seem to enjoy um, the calibrated peer review process. Also in part because they receive multiple, multiple, multiple examples, right? They get to see up to seven different examples for the same assignment sheet. Their own solution, three solutions they were reviewing, and then four calibrated copies, so a cal calibrated solutions. So they get to see a lot of different ways how to solve the assignment sheet, um, and that really instilled some confidence into them. One issue we, we had very infrequently was outlier grades. So like two examples are shown here where you know one assignment sheet was graded very highly, or this assignment sheet here was graded very poorly when all the other reviewing teams reviewed this assignment sheet pretty well. In, this happened exactly four times. In all four times, it was, a, it was obvious from the feedback, the written feedback they give to each other, why these grades were there, were, were as they are. In only one case did a team con, uh, complain about the poor result that they received. And I think it was actually this one here, PO94, CH97. And, and um, in that case, we were able to um, resolve this amicably. One thing you notice is that the uh, positively inflated grades when students evaluate each other uh, about were between 10 and 15 percent points higher. And that number is actually consistent with a very recent ICSI paper from last year where Anish et al. Um, graded 600 plus students and uh, in a peer assessment software engineering type uh, course, and they found the exact same degree of positive grade inflation. Um, but as we've shown, um, it doesn't matter, right? They retain more, so I like it. I was really worried about lack of effort and profanity in, in, um, in uh, evaluation results, but didn't really find man, any. The one thing that I however noticed was I was kind of also hoping that this was cut down on my grading time, on these assignment sheets, and it absolutely did not. It was so much more work to distribute these assignment sheets and to manually go through the process and especially the quality check to look for the profanity that was missing took so long, it's unbelievable, that um, next time I do it, we'll definitely have to have tool support for this. Uh, on the other hand though, I must say, um, the, the positive impact that calibrated peer reviews had on student confidence and students' ability to, to find their own solutions to, an, to a wicked problem was outstanding. In other words, I will never, ever, ever teach requirements engineering without calibrated peer reviews ever again. And frankly, neither should you. That's it from me. Thank you very much for today. And uh, I'm here to ask you, answer your questions. Thank you, Beth, and very nice presentation, very um, interesting findings. Um, I immediately have a question. So your effort was higher. Um, I guess the students' effort was also higher because they had to uh, solve the ass assignment and then they had to grade the other assignments as well. So did they complain about too much workload in the end? Um, right, so no. 
but um but yes so they they did have a lot a lot more work they had an, essentially an entire um an entire seven days more engagement with the same assignment sheet right um and uh they didn't complain about it. They said it was a lot of work, and uh, um, I apologized profusely to it. But I encourage I encouraged them to please bear with me because it was the first time of us trying it, and encouraged them to to voice their concerns. The complaints about this was too this was a lot of work were only apparent in the very end of the semester when they were overburdened with other other things in this that they needed to finish up. But I think they said that the overall um, the overall um, attitude was, yes, it's a lot of work, but the better I do this, the less I need to study for the exam. And I think, I think they appreciated that. Okay, awesome. Are there any other questions by the audience? Otherwise I would have one more. Ah, Patricia has a question, please go ahead. <clears throat> Hi, Bastian, I really liked your talk. Um, we tried something like this also for a modeling class I did, and we automated a Moodle plugin to do all of the tool side things. So that reduced some of the work on our side as far as administrative stuff goes, but we still had the huge amount of work you talked about with the quality control. And uh, the quality control was the biggest problem because there were some students who were way stricter than we were. Like they would even like give really bad points to the professor's um, solutions. <laughs> and they were holier than thou. And so we yeah. had to kind of, uh, get them a little bit farther down. They were too enthusiastic. I don't know, did you have any students like that who were a bit more <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And in fact, um, the example that I showed here um, with the with the two outlier grades that was actually the that was actually in such an instance. So this team um, was um, was uh, um, um, let's say what they did is they interpreted one of the guidelines in the grading rubric extremely strictly. And I think what I, I think what it was is. Um, never forget reading directions on class diagram associations because guess what students love to forget that's right reading directions mm -hmm. or they use these arrows right arrows at the end of the association instead of the triangle next to the label so and i i, I harp on that during the lecture i really harp on that and um, tell them don't, don't ever do this wrong if you do this wrong i can find you and take your degree away and um I, i'm joking and um and i think they took that Rating rubric assignment and then just deducted three points um, rather than when I would maybe deduct half a point for that out of 15. So mm -hmm. um, it was an issue occasionally, but we'll tell them once and then for the next assignment sheets, they're fine. So I guess um, the, the high workload was also because you did it the first time, right? And you probably had uh, a little bit of a fear that something went, goes wrong. So yeah. now that you have done it once, um, would you say the, the effort next time is a little bit lower for the quality control because you might have more clues um, when something is a good review or when something is a bad review? Um, um, uh, yes, yes, I would say that. Um, I noticed that the effort was, was stupid high, the first assignment sheet. For every other second, third, fourth, and fifth, it became faster and faster as I had like, as a began to have a routine how to do it um, so that that helped um, I think like I'm, this la last fall semester I had one of my agile student uh, 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 teams I had them write a um, write a calibrated peer review tool for me to help me with this process unfortunately they didn't finish so I guess I'll do it one more time manually <laughs> this semester Okay, there are two more questions. Um, please do it quickly because we have to continue with the next presentation. Suchita, you were first. Thank you, Stephen. Um, my name is Suchita and I'm a third year PhD student. So this sort of work is generally that we do as a part of our teaching practica, being PhD students. So I'm still a little, little skeptical about the motivation students would have when they would take up this work because there would be a lot of invisible labor for them. So I would like to know what sort of motivation they would have in the future to take this uh, task up if they have nothing. Well, <laughs> well, their motivation is I told them to do it and they better do it. 
<laughs> right? But um, the, the question is, why would they take this course, right? If this is the workload they're asked to do? And the answer is again, well, it's a core requirement for the software engineering curriculum, so they have no choice. <laughs> By the way, hi to Syracuse. Syracuse is 40 miles south of, 70 kilometers south of uh, Oswego for all of you who are not local. Okay, and then last but not least, LK, you also have a question. Just a moment, yes. Um, <clears throat> well, it seems that uh, it's uh, about the um, output re related grading but what about grading of tasks skills like uh, needed in the requirements at a station right um so this is the the th this was not focus of the assignment sheets right the assignment sheets is here's some theory now go apply it um the whole soft skill part is what we address during the semester long project and you know, i've talked about that plenty of times in this conference. So I, I didn't talk about it today. They get this too, and they have to, because they have to work in teams. And um, so there's some part aspect about that, but that we didn't, this, this is not something I think you can address in CPR. Okay, then let's thank uh, Bastian again. Great presentation, great answering of all the questions. And then let's continue to the next paper. Right. which would actually be you, Stefan. <laughs> so without further ado, I'll just let you talk. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. And um, I'd like to present my paper now. Um, it's called Semi-Automatic Assessment of Modeling Exercises Using Supervised Machine Learning. I hope you can all see my screen. Yeah, is it working? Hopefully also the right one. Yes, uh, with we can the, see. The presentation. Okay, great. It's always um, a little bit weird if you do a presentation in Zoom and then you cannot see what you present to the others. Anyway, um, let me start. So I'm also, um, I also want to talk a little bit about um, modeling um, and our problems when we teach modeling in software engineering. So first of all, um, a, a lot of students probably assume that modeling is something that is quite difficult in terms of, um, yeah, the, 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 the task that they are actually doing. Um, there's no compiler that gives them immediate feedback. Yeah, that's always nice in programming, but for modeling, this is not the case. And um, we found out already in a couple of studies that individual feedback is very important. Um, so students learn best if they get individual feedback to the models that they create, and then they can improve. But however, providing individual feedback is very, very time consuming, especially in large introductory courses. In our introductory course, we now have more than 2000 students. Um, and you can think about if we have a couple of modeling exercises, um, it gets into the 100,000s of assessments that we need, that we need to, to do here. Um, additionally, um, if you then try to get multiple reviewers. Uh, typically we have um, experienced students who took the course last year called tutors who help us in reviewing those models. This can lead to inconsistencies, not only because the students, the, the, the uh, tutors who are actually more experienced than the students who take the course, but, but they are still inexperienced modelers, right? They did not model for uh, quite a long time, but also because as we have seen in the previous presentation, some of them, review a little bit more strict and some of them review a little bit less strict. So multiple reviewers typically can lead to inconsistencies and to unfairness in the end, right? On the other hand, um, we already have heard that modeling is a creative task. So there is not only one perfect solution in the end. No, we typically have um, a couple of different correct solutions. Um, so showing just a sample solution as an instructor might even prevent them from being creative in the end because they might think their own solution to the task is wrong if it deviates from the instructor solution. And it is also quite difficult for them to identify whether the difference in the solution is actually still partly correct or not. So um, it's not a good idea in my opinion, um, as um, a couple of, of researchers um, suggest to just show them one solution in, in the lecture, for example. Yeah, this is not how you learn modeling. You have to apply it and then you have to get individual feedback. So um, it yeah, typically involves multiple, multiple correct solutions. And for beginners, it's very difficult to identify on their own if the solution is correct or not. 
So we are facing those issues for quite some time now. And um, what we have done is that we tried to digitalize the, the whole process of submitting models, creating models and reviewing and assessing models. And then also to apply machine learning, supervised machine learning in order to um, lower the effort for the correction. Because what we have identified is that the correction typically involves a couple of repeated processes, right? So um, if you have a lot of different submissions from many students, um, there are parts of the model that overlap. And um, the idea is now that we automate um, some of the process. So what we did first, um, we did we, we developed an online modeling editor called Apollo. It's open source and free to use. Um, you can um, navigate to this link here and um, try it out without account if you want to do it. And um, it's a very simple modeling editor. So the focus is not on very complex models. It's really on learning the basics in the beginning. Um, it has a couple of limitations. It does not fully support UML. Um, in all its um, edge cases, but it supports the most important aspects. And in addition to um, class diagrams that you have seen here, it supports seven um, other UML diagram types and even four additional notations, such as Petri nets, reachability graphs, and so on. And what we did then is we thought about, can we not only ask the students to create models online in such an um, editor with a nice usability, can we also grade the models directly within such an editor. And this is um, how we came up with a semi-automatic assessment idea. So um, if you now assume that we have three submissions to model um, houses and rooms and interiors, then um, we don't, we do, at the beginning, we do not have any knowledge which of those submissions is correct or not. So we basically start manually assessing the models. Yeah, And then we might say, okay, this is um, a correct class. Um, this is also a correct class. The um, attributes might be correct um, and um, the association is wrong. A room is not a house, so inheritance is wrong here. Um, the enter method might be okay and the lock method might not fit to the problem statement that we have given to the students for this particular task, right? And then you come up with um, um, a certain assessment, which um, additionally includes feedback why certain model elements are wrong or not. And then we can take the information, do a similarity analysis, and come up with an automatic assessment proposal, yeah? because room was already graded as a correct class within the um, solution space of this task. Square meter is also correct. So we propose, the system can propose to the reviewer that this is correct and the reviewer will hopefully save some time. However, there are a couple of other model elements that are not yet corrected. So the reviewer needs to correct those or to assess those, provide additional feedback and comes up with a semi-automatic assessment in the end. And then we learn more and more knowledge. And then the next proposal can be, include more elements. And hopefully in the end, we have enough knowledge to provide such a large assessment that um, most of the assessment can be um, automatically created or at least a proposal for it. And then a reviewer can look over it and do only a quick check if it's correct or wrong. If we think about this on a more um, uh, workflow idea, we have an activity diagram here, how this works. So the student submits a solution, the model um, submission is stored in the system, and the system tries to assess it automatically. In the beginning, the assessment proposal will be empty. So the reviewers, um, either instructors or tutors, say I have to review um, an empty assessment and then have to adjust the assessment or assess the parts that have not been available manually. And then they come up with the actual assessment in the end that includes the scores and the um, uh, feedback. And then the system can analyze the assessment and can create knowledge based on the similarity analysis. It can then be used for subsequent submissions to make those assessment proposals larger and larger after some time. And ideally, if we have done a similar exercise from the, in the previous years, um, we do not start with empty knowledge, but we start with already quite some knowledge so that even the first submissions can, be, uh, can have an automatic assessment proposal. Ideally, um, the student um, then can review the assessment and um, even refine the solution and submit it again. So um, in the end, when the whole process gets more and more automated, we can also allow the students to um, submit their models multiple times and check if they come up with, the, with a good solution after some iterations. The component in the middle that you see here, we have called it Compass. 
it's integrated into Artemis, an open source learning platform that we use at our university and that we um, is also used in um, 10 other universities. It's free and um, you can also set it up if you want to try it out on your own. Here's how the assessment um, basically works. When you, when you open the assessment, you already have the proposed assessment. It's highlighted in a specific color so that you immediately can see what's going on. You have one example solution. Notice the difference between example and sample solution. Yeah, so this is just one example given by the instructor where the reviewer can um, see what uh, would be a correct solution. And then we have grading criteria that define the feedback and the, the points for each correct and wrong model modeling element. We evaluated um, the approach um, in a qualitative and quantitative analysis. For the qualitative analysis, we sent a survey to the 45 tutors of our course um, and uh, roughly half of them answered the survey. They um, provided um, uh, a couple of positive aspects of the system, in particular that the suggestions are very helpful and that um, they um, often are correct and um, improve the way, the, the, improve the consistency. They help them to see how other um, graders or reviewers actually assess the models. Um, but in the end, not all of those feedback messages are accurate. While the points, the scores are typically accurate, sometimes the feedback messages do not fit because some tutors provide more detailed feedback. And if you take over this to another model, even if it's similar, it does not fit in the end. So this is something that we can improve in the future. We also did a quantitative analysis in the software engineering course with three um, exercises in which the semi-automatic assessment was activated. And um, it turned out that um, among all the submissions and assessment, 76% um, of the modeling exercises in the one exercise, 80% in the next exercise, and 65% in the third exercise could be um, graded automatically. Some of the... Um, Assessments were adjusted because they did not fully um, fit. Yeah, the feedback was maybe changed or um, there was an inconsistency in the score and it was changed. And a couple of aspects still had to be reviewed manually. You might ask yourself, why are those numbers a little bit different now? Um, even if the number of participants was roughly the same. Um, the main reason is that some of those um, tasks are, actually have um, a, a smaller solution space. So only a few um, possible correct solutions, and others have a larger solution space where really a lot of different variants are correct, and this heavily influences how many of the assessments can be proposed automatically. We all, um, to summarize our findings, um, the uh, grading effort was reduced. Um, we had fewer complaints in those exercises, and when we talked to a couple of students, um, they um, and, and looked into the ratings of the system so the students can rate um, whether the assessment is helpful or not. The perceived feedback quality was higher. However, I have to admit that this is not um, uh, fully evaluated yet and we need to do more evaluations here. Um, this is just um, anecdotal evidence. We also implemented a couple of additional improvements um, in order to improve the grading process. We have an integrated training process. So if before um, the reviewers can actually start uh, to grade student submissions, they have to grade example submissions that already have an assessment. And only if they match the assessment, then they can pursue. So we um, will make sure that they are actually starting on with a good knowledge at the beginning. We have a double blind grading process. So the student does not know the tutor and the tutor also does not know the student, how you know it from conferences. There are structured grading criteria that you can drag and drop into the um, submission and then it's automatically taken over. This also reduces a lot of effort and provides um, consistent feedback. And we have a grading leaderboard that motivates the reviewers to um, have um, high quality reviews in the end. That's it for my presentation. Um, I hope you can try out this approach with the open source um, tools that we have and um, I'm happy to answer some questions. Thank you for your attention. What an outstanding thing. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, we already have a question from Elke over here. Would you care to bring it up? Well, it's just about the synonyms and naming of classes, uh, methods, and attributes. Um, how do you handle these? We did not handle them yet. This is um, on our future work list that we need to um, integrate some natural language um, processing models and um, some, some additional yeah, knowledge sources about synonyms, about um, the particular um, aspects of an application domain, for example, in order to improve the model. Okay. 
Any other questions from the audience? Well, thank you again, Stefan. Very, very nicely done. Um, we are approaching the last talk of the session before we come to the main event, so to speak. And next up is our new good friend, Benjamin Clegg, with the talk on diagnosability, diagnosability, adequacy, and size, how test suite impact author grading. Um, ben? Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Um, okay, I'll stop my talk now. Hi, everyone. I'm Ben, and uh, this is my, uh, well, our paper on diagnosability, adequacy, and size, how test suites impact auto grading. So test-based automated assessment is pretty, pretty prevalent in programming courses, but the test suites we use in those might not be perfect. They might fail to detect some faults. They might detect some kinds of faults more, more often than others. Um, so this can affect students' grades and could therefore impact fairness. Um, so here's for an example to motivate the problem. Um, here's a simple function that returns the greatest of two integers. But here there's a fault that's been introduced, in which case it will always only um, return the first integer. So we've got a test here that basically fails to detect the fault. Um, so it's not necessarily a great test suite to use for grading. Admittedly, this is a bit of an extreme example, but uh, this uh, kind of reveals how this might occur. So perhaps if we improve coverage, uh, we can get a more fair test suite in this case um, by executing every line of the code, achieving maximum coverage. We uh, are able to detect the fault correctly and we get a reasonable grade of 50% here. But coverage isn't everything. So say in this test suite, you do achieve 100% coverage, but it's more the case for each of these ex each of these test cases exercise both possible branches of the method. Um, so the student would always, in this case, get a 0% grade. And whether or not you deem that to be fair is perhaps it's not, right? So for our paper, we, we investigate uh, how test suites impact generated grades. Uh, we perform an empirical study using real student solutions of free programming tasks. Uh, we sample five subject classes, uh, subject Java classes from these programming tasks. And we use a sampling approach um, to um, generate many uh, different kinds of test suites from the original test suite that we use. Uh, we aim to answer two research questions. First of all, um, to what extent do, uh, do different test suites generate different grades? And second of all, uh, how do different properties of test suites impact these grades? So for, for, for the first research question, we generate grades for each individual student solution with each um, subsample test suite. And we calculate the standard deviation for every test suite, for, well, across every test suite for one, each solution independently. So uh, this figure presents our results for different sizes of test suites and the standard deviations that they generate. Um, so we find that the mean standard deviation for each student solution across all the test suites is around 10%, which is quite significant. That's around a, perhaps an entire letter grade in some cases. And there's a range of standard deviations between the solutions. This is particularly prevalent for uh, the Sala subject class, where you can see that some student solutions have a standard deviation of 10%, while others have a standard deviation of around zero. So some student solutions are affected incredibly, um, like by an incredible amount, depending on what the test suite is, versus others which might not be affected as much, which could, that is potential unfairness in the automated grading process. And um, we do also find that there's a lower standard deviation for larger test suites, but this is more of a restriction of the sampling approach that we're using here. So a larger test suite will be closer to the set of all of the tests available for that subject class. Uh, in this case, yeah, um, although you do still see a standard deviation occur for individual solutions, there still is a range of, gen of grades generated in most of these cases. So for research question two, we can look more into how the property of test suites uh, impact the grades that the test suite generates. So we generate grades for each student, for each student solution with each sample test suite. And we calculate a grade delta, which is the distance of that individual grade to the median grade for that solution. And we determine several metrics um, measuring those using the test suite, and um, possibly using the reference solution, the, the correct tutor-made solution. 
and then we perform a relative importance analysis. Uh, we use this in favor of linear models, uh, well, just a strict uh, uh, observation of the coefficients of, any, of a linear model, because if uh, if some of the predictive variables are co-correlated, you essentially lose a lot of accuracy because if that variable is added to the model first, that'll have a greater impact than the one that it's correlated to in all cases. So by essentially you're taking an average in every single uh, order that you can add a variable to a linear model and you can therefore get a, a better estimate essentially. Uh, so we consider around five, you no, know, six test week properties. <laughs> um, so uh, the first is coverage, is simply how many lines has been executed on the reference solution, because otherwise um, there's, we, um, well, essentially we're trying to emulate a tutor uh, writing a test suite for their, um, for an upcoming assignment, essentially. Uh, mutation score, which is, involves you generate a, a set of, or you automatically generate a set of, uh, artificial uh, faulty variants from a re uh, from a reference solution, and then you see how many of those are detected by your test suite. And then you have a detection rate of other solutions, which are the same principle, but just using the other student solutions instead. And uh, we also consider the size, but we're using it more to control because the number of test suites, the number of tests within a suite. Uh, is correlated to its coverage and its mutation score. So we're including it here to more control for its effect. And then we also consider free diagnosability metrics. Now these metrics are used in the field of fault localization. Um, they essentially allow you to quickly evaluate how well a test suite can isolate individual faults. So in the field of fault localization, you use, you use the information of which tests fail to get an idea of where the fault might lie in a program. Um, the idea being that the better it is at doing this, the higher it will score in these diagnosability metrics. And we theorize that that means that by distinguishing between different faults, you can maybe get a fair estimate of grading. So the first uh, is density, which is essentially the average line coverage across the, uh, each test. Uh, diversity, which is the probability that two randomly selected tests have different coverage behavior and uniqueness, which is derived from how many lines are covered in the same way by every single test suite, and every single test in the test suite. Uh, the following figure shows our results. And uh, overall, we find that the detection of the solutions has the greatest impact. So naturally, a test suite which is able to detect students' faults will have a better chance, of a, better, uh, a bigger impact on its grades. Uh, size, it does have a significant impact here as well, but then we also find that uniqueness and mutation score, something that's relatively easy to measure, do also have a, uh, well, um, do also have a significant impact on grades, uh, while coverage, diversity, and density are lower. We do see uh, some differences between subject classes, so it might be a little small on the screen, but for, the, for one of our subject classes, we find that diversity itself, while it's low overall, does have a really big impact for this subject class. But that's because this subject class has very little diversity in how its tests can execute. Uh, well, honestly, diversity has the wrong term to use. There are only two real branches that can be taken through that program, essentially. So there's going to be a diversity will have quite a big impact on grades in that case. So we use our observations to provide some recommendations for choosers who are using test-based test automated grading. Uh, so the first is to try and achieve 100% coverage. Even though it's not the greatest impact, it does it is somewhat correlated with that with some of the others. And it is the easiest to perhaps evaluate. It's very easy to see if uh, the coverage of a test suite. Most modern IDEs tell you what the coverage is. Um, so and unexecuted code shows that the test suite hasn't covered the entire specification of the program. Uh, mutation score, if you can use it, it's uh, it's great. There are multiple off the shelf tools that you can use to to uh, evaluate the mutation score of a program. Um, for example, in Java, there's one called PIT. Um, there, there's usually one for every single programming language you might want to use though. And if you can use, the, use other student solutions to evaluate your training and test suite, that's great. But first of all, this assumes that you already have some from uh, running the same assignment previously, or that you are, and that you also know where all the students' faults are. 
So say, for example, if you've only used test-based automated grading, you might have uh, missed faults in a previous uh, examination of a assignment. And finally, uh, the diagnosability metrics. Ideally, you want to avoid writing tests for uh, more tests for some parts of a program than for, than for others, because that means that you might be over-exercising one part of the uh, specification than others. Um, and you should also avoid covering the same parts of the task with every single test. So say having a, a common entry point for every test, if you can avoid it, that's preferable because if a student makes a mistake there, it could propagate throughout the entire program and give you a bit of a skewed idea of what that grade should be. Um, but this itself might require some modification to the specification and it might not necessarily be what you desire entirely. Uh, I believe that's it for my presentation. So. If you have any questions, I yeah, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you very much for this nice presentation and this um, very interesting topic. Are there any questions from the audience? Well, maybe maybe one if you if you permit. Um, uh, sure. So maybe you said it and I missed it. Um, but um, when when you're testing the student submissions, right? Um, this would presuppose that the the test cases would need to be specific to the assignment, of course. So the yeah. question is, I suppose what I'm wondering is uh, because we just talked about this quite a bit is, what's the effort involved for the instructor to adopt this this approach? Like how, how much time do you spend making the test cases as opposed to looking at the students' solutions directly? Um, I, think, I think that you can save a lot of time when you're talking about courses that say, if you have a, you know, several hundred students or something like this, you, kind of, you will need to automate this. Um, I mean, ideally you want to give them manual feedback as well, but anything that you can automate is good. Um, I think that using say some of these test um, testing approaches or more test quality approaches it, it has some cost but it's not um it's not too bad like um so achieving full coverage is is quite straightforward for example it's it's a case of making sure that your test week covers every single part of your the the correct solution the reference solution that you're using to kind of show as a proof of concept for your assignment or whatever um, the other approaches do start to get more complicated from there on out. So say mutation analysis does have a time cost in generating them and executing them. But um, again, it's I believe it's worth it for the, for the advantage it can provide because essentially a, a false, just because you're executing a line of code doesn't necessarily mean that you're detecting every fault that could occur in it. Um, yeah, right. So it's it's it, eventually it does become a point of maybe perhaps diminishing returns in terms of the time cost. Yeah, but if it does result in higher fairness in that sense, yeah, uh, we've I've, the, the the diminishing um, returns is something we experienced this too, and that's actually why we abandoned automatic testing um, mm -hmm. of, in our CS one course because we just spent so much time doing working on the test cases that it might as well mm -hmm. be easier for the students to demo it directly. Then again, we only have like at most 150 or so in our CS one, so I understand. Some universities have more. Anyways, thank you very much. Yeah. It was great. Cheers. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. So if there's no other question, I would have also one. Um, I really like your suggestions in your paper. Um, however, if I give them to my tutors, um, they probably will have a hard time to follow them. Mm. So um, what do you think? Can you develop tool support um, that actually mm. makes sure those uh, suggestions are fulfilled and do you have a couple of good and bad examples of such test cases that we could give to our tutors uh, who write the tests mm. i think i think as far as tools go i, I think certainly for a uh, coverage and mutation testing you could you probably could make some form of a uh, tool to kind of like as a as a front end almost for uh, for tutors to use um, in the case of the others it does get a bit more complicated because those like say diagnosability metrics are very dependent on the other tests in the suite as well. So it's kind of, it's hard to almost visual, it might be harder to visualize where um, more tests are needed, where fewer tests are needed, et cetera. Um, but I think it's a challenge that can be addressed. And I think that maybe saying like, oh, maybe write some more tests for like around here, that could be useful. 
Um, another second part of your question, um, you might have to remind me of because it's, it's slipped my mind, admittedly. <laughs> um, so uh, examples, examples, right? Um, yes, good and bad examples of tests for certain programming tasks. Yeah, I think you could. I, um, I think that, say, you could even demonstrate like a, with a simple example, say, yeah, coverage doesn't detect this fault that can be generated or the student, this particular fault the student makes. So say something that's more subtle, something that is like a requires a specific condition to, to occur, um, like a, some form of data flow based fault. You could say something that's very clear. You'd have to have something quite clear. But yeah, I, I don't see any reason why you couldn't do that. Okay, would be great. Uh, I'll probably drop you a mail and get in touch with you because mm, I think yeah, it's, sure. it's really interesting and we would also like to apply those guidelines at, at our university. Sure, yeah, feel free okay. to reach out. Great, thank I don't you very see much, any guys. any other questions. Um, so um, I'll close um, the session now and hand over to Bastian to introduce our keynote speaker. Yes, thank you much, Stefan. Very nicely done. Ben, um, my friends, uh, it's my absolute pleasure and almost the most the thing that I've been looking forward to the most for half a year now. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to uh, substitute for for Dan Port uh, uh, and introduce the Nancy Mead Award winner for 2022. The Nancy Mead Award is an award that this, this conference gives out uh, every year, almost every year, to deserving individuals for outstanding contributions in the field of software engineering education and software engineering at large. And um, this year, Ian Somerville is our winner. He's here to hold a keynote uh, on the topic, Inspiring Tomorrow Software Engineers, Teaching Modern Software Engineering, where he will talk about how to appropriately inspire uh, the next generation of software engineers. And um, I think without further ado, let's hear it from Ian. You're still muted. Hi, sorry about that. <laughs> I, I usually give talks by walking around and waving my arms. And I haven't <laughs> used Zoom, in all honesty. Um, I'm very honoured indeed by, to receive this award. And I, I'm delighted to, to have an opportunity to, to present my views on, on teaching software engineering, which have, have evolved over the years. So I think without really any further ado, I'll really just get going on this. I'll share my screen. Uh, and... you should be seeing my screen is is that okay yes yes okay. we can see your screen the presentation okay uh, let me just get back to zoom so i can see where i am yeah okay right um, i <clears throat> what i'm going to talk about today is the need to make our courses inspiring over and above everything else uh, and i'm going to talk about ways in which i think we can do better than we're doing at the minute this is a problem with too many software engineering courses. Um, I've come across it in my teaching. I'm sure everybody has. Actually, quite a lot of students are bored by these courses. They go to sleep. They drag themselves along. They're sometimes compulsory. They, they don't want to be there. Okay. It puts them off. The nature of the courses put them off. And when I, when the, when I, when I first came across this, I thought, hey, what am I doing wrong? And I tried to do different things. It didn't make any difference. It didn't make any difference at all because basically the course was boring. There, there's no getting around that. It was just boring. So I started to think about it. But I thought more broadly about challenges we've got in software engineering education. Uh, and I think we've got to address these challenges if we want to actually convince students or that's those challenges we can, some are not within our remit, and those challenges we can, if we want to continue students to carry on with their education in this area. I think there's a summarized four challenges. Coding and software engineering are equated in the media. So the media talk about coders and coding and people say, I'm a coder, I'm a software engineer, and they use these and they use these trans and equivalently. Uh, now, <clears throat> I've always thought of software engineering, the bits of software development that aren't coding. Uh, so there's no notion in the student body that there's, that there's more to it than just programming. Um, a 
challenge we've got is that students are moving away from software engineering courses. This is my perception. I know this may not be universal uh, because they find the courses boring, as I've said. Uh, but also, the, the hype that we've got at the minute about AI is, is a real issue. Sorry, I just... It, it is a real issue because everybody thinks it's all about AI. Uh, and the interesting thing, if you follow Grady Butch on, on Twitter, is that what he's saying is that AI are finally discovering you need to do software engineering. Uh, so we've got this pressure from externally saying we want to do more. And we have the internal problem that it's hard to get people to talk, teach software engineering courses. I'll come back to that later. Uh, there are different reasons for that. But a consequence is you often have people like graduate students teaching these courses who are not really that interested in the topic, who don't have any experience. And that makes them even more boring. So my starting point is that if we don't make our introductory courses more interesting, then students are actually going to give up on software engineering. We have to do something about it. And I think what we need to do is throw away some notion about what we have to have in a course. We should think about designing an interesting course rather than one that follows some externally imposed curriculum or a body of knowledge, a term I hate, uh, or one which you don't talk about your favorite research topic. You know, you're really into formal specifications. So let's put that in my undergraduate course. And the students will say, what is the point? Uh, a lot of other people will also say, what is the point? But uh, the students particularly will just simply turn off. So the key thing is make your course interesting. Don't make it about yourself. And The question is, what makes a course interesting? Well, obviously, the teacher of the course is pretty important. And we've all been to classes, we've all been to lectures by people who are really good. And by nature of their presentations, they can make things interesting. We've also all been to classes by people who are really bad. And it doesn't matter what kind of material, William, they will make it dull and boring. Okay, that's out of our control. But it's also definitely the case that people who are good are also sometimes boring because what they're doing is just boring stuff. So I, I, I think we need to look at courses and the courses need to be inspiring. They need to be applicable and they need to be current. And what I mean by that, is that to inspire students, they need to relate to the type of software that's being discussed. They need, to, they need to see how it applies to them, not some abstract system somewhere else, but something they can say, yes, yes, I understand that. It needs to be applicable. When you cover things in your course, students should be able to use it in their projects because that way they will find the value and the issues and the problems indeed about what's been covered. And you need to make it current. The reality is lots of our students know about things that we don't know about. They do stuff that we don't do. I mean, there's such a diverse range of technologies now. Uh, nobody can keep up with anything. So if you actually start talking about stuff that isn't current, then you will find that students will lose respect. Why are you talking about this? We can do it differently now. So we need to think about all of these things in our course design. Now, everybody's seen this diagram, the waterfall model. And this model 
in the view of lots of computing academics and more people in industry than really ought to be the case think this is software engineering. This is what software engineering is about. Now, as a consequence, that's what's become expected to be included in courses. Now, software engineering is about this, and it's about many, many other things. And the, the, the difference between when this diagram was first created and now is that we have many, many more types of software engineering. And choosing this type, which is essentially project-oriented software engineering, is one of the worst choices you can make for a software engineering course. If we look what we mean by project software engineering, um, this is a bit of a simplification of it. But essentially, you have a client creating requirements. A company takes these requirements and creates a system. <clears throat> and then you have another company, and sometimes the same company, but often the different company, actually maintains that software system. Now, what this diagram doesn't include, <coughs> there are lots of the links between these parts. And what these links generate, what these links mean, are, is that there has to be lots of communication between the different bodies or actors involved in this process. And that communication leads to things like this process, the breakdown of this process. Okay. It also leads to bureaucracy and admin, which I'll come to in a minute. So project-oriented software engineering, which is still a really economically, a really large part of software engineering, uh, has problems when it comes to teaching the subject. Yet, in spite of these problems, lots of courses are primarily focused on software project engineering. Why is that the case? Well, one reason is it's the area in which faculty have expertise. If you go back some years, 20 years, say, that was the principal type of software engineering. Lots of faculty learned if they worked in industry, that's what they learned about. That's what they know about. That's what they bring into the software engineering course. And bringing your own knowledge into a course is really good. It also means that <clears throat> if people are doing research in software engineering, most of that research is actually focused towards software project engineering. It's not generally applicable are used in other types of engineering, and, and there's lots of reasons for that. One reason being, of course, is that funders of the research, people like NASA, do big projects, and they want to have research that's relevant to what they do. <coughs> so there's links to research, and then people are excited by the research. They want to put it into their course. So they, they, they focus on this type of engineering. I don't know how widespread accreditation is in the UK. There are various accrediting bodies. So if you want a, a formal certification as an engineer, uh, it is easier if you've attended a course that's accredited by these bodies. Now, <clears throat> much as these bodies do good work, they are not particularly well known for being <clears throat> up to the minute in their knowledge and thinking about technology. And the, the model of software engineering that comes out from the accrediting bodies is typically a project-oriented model. And finally, of course, we have the availability of textbooks. Textbook, <coughs> excuse me. Textbooks, and I have to take some responsibility for this, work around this model, because I kind of fit that profile. If we go back here, I fit that profile. That's my expertise. I learned about projects back in the 1900s. My research was all about project. Uh, so that's why my textbook 
came out like that. It, it's, it's natural. You also get curricula. So if people decide to follow curriculum guidelines or, God help us, bodies of knowledge, I don't know if anyone else here, it, it, this is a, a kind of rhetorical question, but has anyone ever read the software engineering body of knowledge? It's 300 pages. I can't believe anyone has ever read it. Um, but it takes this view and says, the ACM curriculum says, this is what software engineering is. And institutions that choose to follow that, they are naturally driven down that line. So what we have is a lot of courses that are project oriented. So let's look at these courses under these headings of applicability, <coughs> relevant or application and uh, currency. Now you would think, and I kind of thought, there's really exciting systems developing projects, systems that go into space, air traffic control systems. I was particularly interested in air traffic control systems. Um, <clears throat> telecom systems, systems that run our national networks, uh, medical systems, these are all developed as projects. You think this is really exciting. We can do stuff. We can inspire people. But really, you know, the truth is we can't. They're really hard to use these as examples in introductory courses. There's a range of reasons for that. Often instructors don't have industry experience of these types of system. I used to talk about air traffic systems because I knew a bit about them. I couldn't possibly talk about telecom systems. I knew nothing about them. Students and instructors, in fact, have no understanding what these systems do. What we have is a huge, invisible societal software infrastructure where there are hundreds of thousands of systems doing stuff that make our society work, but we have no idea what they do. So if you talk to a student about air traffic control, basically, yeah, it's about organizing planes in the sky. And that's about all they can say. They don't understand any of the complexities of, of this activity. However, forgetting about all of these, even if you get around all of these problems, the complexity of these large soul systems is so overwhelming. They're so big and complex that you cannot communicate this in a short course. So you can't use what strikes me as quite inspiring examples, and believe me, I've tried, um, to actually inspire the students because it just goes over their heads. So what happens? This is a diagram I took from a software engineering textbook. It is not mine. I can assure you, never would I use a course registration system as an example in my lectures. Can you imagine any student who comes into a class thinking, today I really want to know about course registration systems? These, I can't imagine anything, very few things worse than doing something like this. This is lazy teaching. This is, I'll pick a system that I think I can understand. And, do, and I'll tell students about it and they'll all want to know. This is awful stuff. This is the most uninspiring thing I can think of. Almost the most uninspiring thing I can think of. Now let's look at applicability. Um, one of the things that, <clears throat> we have in the UK is, is a, a quality management system where professors from one institution go to other institutions and comment on their examinations and assessment processes. And the thing that really, really aggravated me was people gave their students projects and then said, well, basically you have to write a, a requirement specification, a test specification, blah, 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 all the kind of documents 
you get for multi-year, multi-company projects for a one-person student project that has barely been tested. I think I thought, this is ridiculous. Trying to impose the project-based model on, one, on, on simple student projects is utterly ludicrous. It makes no sense. These projects are short term, maybe lasting a few months. They focus on functionality, not quality. We want to see what the students do with them. They haven't got any requirements. The students make up their own requirements. So let's write a requirement specification for, for your own system. And there's no evolution. It's completely artificial to try and use the approaches that you might discuss in a project-oriented course for their own projects. So they go away and do something completely different. And they think, well, what's the point of software engineering? The reality is some aspects of software engineering, and it doesn't really matter how you do it, but it varies in different ways. And this is true in every job. Some aspects are just dull and boring. They really are. There's nothing you can do about that. Now, what you don't have to do is put them into your textbooks. This is a software engineering textbook whose contents I've found. I, I, I must admit, I have not read this book because I've, I've read the contents and that completely put, it, completely put me off it. I hope the author's not here. <laughs> but can you imagine, again, the student, Yesterday's lecture was about a course registration system. So today, okay, guys, let's go and see what we're doing. Wow, we are doing document management. Fantastic. How can you inspire students by talking about things like that? You don't have to teach the boring stuff. There is very little point in teaching the boring stuff. They'll learn about it soon enough once they get a job. Yes, it's there. It's a part of all large projects. But the only stuff you need to teach on management is code management. How to use Git. You don't have to teach anything else about management. Because management, in my experience, and I've never had this contradicted in any project I've worked on, is totally fake. People make things up. It doesn't really matter what they do. They make it up and they fit things to their whatever they made up at the end of the day. And we've all seen that. These, these ridiculous charts that show all these things that are going to happen in dependencies. None, none of them ever actually happen the way they, they plan. So don't bother teaching and pretending that you can do accurate estimation. Just don't teach the boring stuff. And then currency. Well, <coughs> I wrote the first edition of my book way, way back in the 1980s. And at that time, the techniques I talked about in my book were relevant to a very high proportion of constructed systems. Mostly everything was built using a waterfall type model. The latest edition of my book, which came out about five years ago, um, <clears throat> I don't know what proportion of constructed systems it applied to, but it wasn't very many in terms of numbers of systems being built. It, economically, it would be a Dutch why would it have different shape? In terms of money spent, it would be different. But the number of systems that are constructed according to a project-based kind of waterfall model is really quite small. And lots of the methods and techniques and technology that have been developed have been developed to allow a different approach to software development. So the stuff we have in the books here is just not that current. People say, well, why? What's the point of this? So I think it's time for a change. And, or I thought, 
some time ago. It was time for a change. And that we need to try and take a different approach to introducing students to software engineering. And I believe that one approach which is, has more potential to be inspiring is to base our teaching around software products rather than software projects. Now, software products are things we all use every day. They're the apps on our phones. There's the whole bunch of, there, there's an app like Zoom. There's Salesforce. There's, there's all sorts of things. We, we have direct experience of interacting with software products. Students all have direct experience of interacting with software products. They know sometimes what's good, what's bad about them. They have no experience of interacting with air traffic control systems, or even, God help us, with course registration systems. And the challenge, if you're building a software product, <coughs> I think of, as you design, you're designing software for a million users who don't know that they want or need the software. So it's kind of different from this notion of a problem generating a system. The people building up the products don't, the people who will buy the products often don't know they want them. And maybe the, the market is being created. And this is quite a different development model from a project-based approach. So uh, this, is, this is a summary of the development model. A, a software company will create a product vision. What, what, what can we do? What can we, how, what can we do that's exciting that we can create and build and sell? And it's that product vision that inspires the software product. The product vision, is, it's not, there's no requirements. You don't write requirements from the product vision or very rarely would you write requirements from product vision. You build a product, you build a prototype. You just build it uh, and you take it from there. Uh, so we have a quite different model, which means that we need to talk about kind of different things in our courses. Let me just remind you, what we're thinking about is what makes the course interesting? <clears throat> Inspiration, applicability, and currency. If we look at software products, why I would choose software products as the basis, everybody uses software products and can relate to them. So that contributes to the notion of inspiration. But just as important, I think, is that lots of students have the notion that they would like to be a startup founder. They wanted to start up a, a, a product development company. And that's something which I think has been the case in the US for quite a long time. In the UK, it, in the university I worked in, the we had a, a very long standing track record of, of students going to blue chip companies like IBM or major banks and things like that. And around about 2011, 2012, there was a switch. I used to ask the students, where do you want to go? And they, they, would, they would come out with these blue chips saying, I want to go to JP Morgan or whoever. And then yeah, let's say maybe 10 years ago, maybe a little less, they said, I want to start a company. So students are inspired by the notion that they can start a company, that they can build their own product. So you're immediately starting off with a benefit here. Some people think, I'd like to do this. Well, maybe I'll learn something about it. Another good thing about product, taking a product-based approach is that the product-based approach is pretty similar to student research projects. And in fact, quite a lot of students 
and research projects are kind of like building products. So the techniques which you can learn in a product-based course are directly applicable to the projects that students will be doing. You have to use current technologies because the key thing in product development is time to market. You've got to get there fast. So therefore, you need to adopt technology to get a competitive edge. So you're forced into making things current. So with this, this is the kind of background to the whole thing. And I thought about designing a new curriculum around product-based software engineering with four goals in mind. Relevance, as I've discussed, students be able to use the coursework in their projects. Practicality, the focus should be in techniques that work, not abstract principles or research, but things that actually are used and which, are, which definitely work. Because the trouble with theory and abstract principles, it's never very clear what they're about. Students can't map these onto, they don't have the maturity to map these onto what they're actually doing. And research stuff, again, is always very dubious. Most people who do research are pretty bad at identifying what use that is and, and where it can be applied. I <clears throat> think it's important to have clarity and my <clears throat> driver for this is I will never use the words methodology, method or process when I'm teaching this course. So these, these are alien, they're alien to, they're, you can, I've said here they're alien to many students, they're actually alien to most humans. So <clears throat> we get rid of all this stuff back that, that you get in software engineering books. And I want them to be inclusive. Um, we all know that there is a, a gender imbalance in software engineering courses or in, in the majority of countries. Uh, and I, I want to, I think it's important that we do, when we have a design a curriculum that we make that inclusive. We try and avoid the gender imbalance. Now, I'll give you a, a, an example of, of another slightly artificial example that gets used, which is cruise control systems. Cruise control systems are used in lots of books for examples of software. Now, <clears throat> I have two daughters, one of whom is a, a senior web manager. So she's, she's quite techy. And I can think of no circumstances whatsoever where they would be interested in cruise control systems. So I think by picking cruise control systems, you're actually excluding quite a large percentage of the population. They're certainly not going to be inspired by them. So I wanted to get away from this where we, we have projects and practical work to do that is focused on basically guys. The course topics are all related to project product engineering. No attempt whatsoever at completeness of coverage. The, the, <clears throat> the project oriented software engineering is mentioned in the first part of the course for five minutes saying, this is one way of doing it. It's not the way we're doing it here. Minimal coverage of management and admin, a wee bit on scrum for management <clears throat> and certainly code management, nothing on admin. Student driven project selection, get students to invent their own projects, they'll own their projects and much more likely to be committed to them and only have group projects, no individual projects whatsoever. Okay. The student teams choose projects themselves to reflect their interests with a product vision, a prototype as the principal deliverables, but also an architecture proposal. If we're going to, when we're going to build this again, how are we going to organize it? 
other topics. <coughs> I think it's important in a course to, to start by talking about the diversity of software engineering to explain that there isn't one type of software engineering. There are many, many types of software engineering. The techniques you use for game development are totally different from the te techniques you use for a railway signaling system. <clears throat> and that this course is about one kind of software engineering. And we talk about what software products would be like. Agile, it's important to talk about Agile, not because Agile is particularly focused on software products. Uh, Agile is, is one of these things that, that can be built and, and <clears throat> can overlay all sorts of development models. But because its focus is on rapid delivery, and rapid delivery is what's important in software products. So we need to be taking an Agile approach. So we need to be looking at the sort of scrummy type things of, of using uh, <coughs> project backlogs and, and daily meetings, et cetera, et cetera, to actually do that. What I think we don't need to do is to have any kind of a cult. And, uh, lots, of, lots of people in, in Scrum are all about the, the Scrum cult. There is only one way to do Scrum, and if you do anything else, it's not Scrum. But this is nonsense. You pick and choose what's useful, uh, and you talk about that. So some things in Agile you'll use, some things you won't. Then a key difference is that there's no requirements. We talk about the feature, what you're building is software features. So you're talking about the features, we talk about scenarios, and we talk about user stories. Scenarios or user stories are kind of meld into each other, uh, are particularly useful. I, I, I was very flattered. I have very little uh, <coughs> communication with senior politicians. Uh, but I was very flattered by talking to a, a, a minister for education in Scotland, who, because I was doing some consulting work on a, a new system for schools. And I used scenarios to describe what I thought the system should do. And he said, this is the first time I've ever, ever talked to a technical person and understood what they were saying. So really, scenarios are really good. I really advise them, you use them. Even if you ignore everything else I say, use scenarios, they really work. <coughs> so we talk about scenarios, I talk about architecture, because architecture is really important as one of the things that distinguishes software engineering from just coding. But it's also the case that implying this model where architecture comes after the features and talking about the, the scenarios, it's not really how it works in reality. The architecture is something that emerges for version two of your product. Version one, you don't worry about architecture. I talk about cloud. This is a, a quite remarkable thing if you look at most software engineering texts, and no, nobody, no, the cloud is simply not mentioned. But there are, I would say, a vanishingly small proportion of startups who don't use the cloud when they start because it doesn't make sense to do anything else. Students want to know about it. So you have to include something like that. In reality, it's the easiest way to do a delivery platform for web-based products. And I dive a wee bit into specifics and, and in terms of the course, this is something that I, I would say you can sometimes leave out, talking about specific architectures, uh, a microservice architecture, <coughs> because I think that kind of works for cloud-based products. It kind of doesn't work, it doesn't work always. And I, I, I've, since I thought about this and first thought about it, I've become slightly less convinced, but uh, I think in general, it's an important architectural model. Uh, I think the architecture, which is, you know, the, the pipe and filter and all this kind of stuff is, is kind of meaningless because you never have one of these in a single system. 
And they talk about practical aspects of security and privacy because you need to do that. They're not an add-on. And again, one of the, I think, problems we've had in our software engineering courses is they sit alongside a course on security, but nobody actually talks about how you should put them together. So I think we, we need to maintain this uh, <coughs> security, integrate security and privacy into our courses. We need to talk about reliable programming. Now, I don't mean the, the kind of stuff you use in, in space and spacecraft. I mean, just basically, how do you write, what, what, what do you do to write a reliable program? Most introductory programming courses and I, I assume anyone taking this course will have done such a course, don't talk about these things. They focus on teaching the programming language, but not how to write a reliable program. So a very simple example of reliable programming is input checks. If you're going to write a robust program, you should always check every input as far as you can. So that's the kind of thing I mean by reliable programming. And Testing, I think, is important because that's what's used in practice for product quality assurance. People have to learn a bit about testing. I'm not a great advocate for test first development. Um, <clears throat> I think it has its places, it has its place. I've never found it particularly productive, probably because the things I wrote, the things I've been writing are in kind of user interfacey and it doesn't really work for that. And we need to talk about DevOps and especially code management. Uh, I presented this linearly, but when you're talking and teaching a course, you wouldn't necessarily do it in this order because code management is something you want to introduce at the beginning and get the group using it immediately. And that's a real advantage of saying we only work in groups because students immediately see the benefits of code management. So these are the kind of key topics I see in a course on a, a product oriented course. Okay. So you may or may not agree with me, but say you do. And here's the question you ask. This isn't a balanced view of software engineering. There's lots of things apart from this. There's things missing. And there's a very simple answer to that. Yes, you're right. It isn't a balanced view of software engineering. I see this. That doesn't mean I don't think a balanced view of software engineering is important. I just think it's, don't, it's not important in an introductory course. I would hope that this would be part of a continuum of courses on software engineering with project-oriented software engineering coming later down the line. Once you've got people convinced there's value of this, it's, it's a wee bit easier to, uh, to get them to tolerate some of the things that we teach in our project-oriented courses. So it's not balanced. And if, all, if you've only got one course to teach, if you don't have anything except an introductory course, it doesn't matter that it's not balanced because it may be useful. <clears throat> and if you've got more than one course, you put your balance across everything. How do you assess students when they only work in groups? That's the, always the question people ask. And I have always answered with, What's important, assessment or education? There is no such thing as a totally objective and flawless group assessment approach. There's absolutely no way you can do it. You will always have students who work harder than others, who perform better than others. And it, my approach when doing that, and I've, I've used group projects and only group projects for many, many years, has been, <clears throat> I don't care if a student who hasn't done that well gets a higher mark than they should. I do care if a student who does well gets a lower mark. 
but it's I've never I think once actually in in all the years the, the way I always do it is I just give a group a, a mark and say to the group if you don't like your mark come and talk to me about it and I think in all the years there's been one or two groups who've come and said or individual members of a group have come to say I think I should have got more and I take the group in and discuss it and I think I changed it once. And I'm pretty sure that there were some people who didn't do the work, who didn't really deserve the mark they got. But so what? It doesn't matter. And then there's this accreditation stuff. Well, I have very little time for accreditation. Um, these bo accrediting bodies who are run by dinosaurs. Um, I'm fortunate to be involved with an institution in Scotland which decided some years ago to ditch accreditation and just tell the accrediting bodies, we don't want to be accredited, we don't care. I think we were one of the, I think we, at that time, we were the only university in, in the UK who, who did this. And I think there may be one or two more now, I don't know. Uh, not once has a student complained about the course not being accredited. Not once has an employer ever asked, why isn't your course accredited? And I'm very pleased to say that in a UK-wide student satisfaction rating, computer science at St Andrews came out first and every year they're in the top three. So the students' accreditation and quality have no relationship whatsoever. So just forget about it. doesn't matter. So how do we change? Well, yeah, there are barriers to change. There's a lack of faculty experience in product engineering, and that's not going to get better. The salaries you get paid in industry to do product development are maybe three times what you'd earn. You know, I, I as a senior professor, earned what I thought was a pretty good salary. <coughs> My PhD student, PhD student, after working in Google for a year, was earning more than I was. You know, the, the, the numbers are crazy. Why, if you're a product developer, would you come back into universities? It's a real problem we have. I have no answer to that problem. We also have our really damaging publisher perish culture. This has evolved over the years. It wasn't so bad when I started, thankfully. Um, <clears throat> that we have a situation where people are measured by their research quality. They're not measured by their teaching quality. They're not measured by their contribution. They're not measured by the, their commitment to long-term things like software development. So in order to proceed, young faculty have to just work on their research, work on publication. And that makes it very hard to change a course, to take on a new approach. And again, I don't have any answers to this because it's, it's endemic, this culture. It's, it's, the universities claim to be trying to take teaching into account, but then the reality is they don't really. And finally, there's a lack of supporting material. It's actually career damaging for young software engineering faculty to write textbooks because of the publishing terrorist culture. Now the right people to write textbook about software product engineering are young guys, not dinosaurs like me, but they can't do it. So I did it. That's my <clears throat> approach to Introducing software engineering, where I've covered the topics on this course. Um, it's run into all sorts of problems with publishing, but uh, it, it's there. If anybody wants to take it up, borrow from it, lots of material on my website. I'd be very delighted for you to use it. Any questions? Thank you very much, Ian. Um, yes, any questions at all? Yes, thank you. Uh, can we have the link to your website? Uh, yes, I'll, I'll do that. Yeah, thanks a lot.
Okay, I'll do that. I'll also, uh, I'll send a link to my slides. I'll put that on the chat when we're finished. That would be great. Thanks a lot. So, so Ian, Ian, I always enjoy a talk that's thought provoking and it certainly is. Uh, however, it seems to me that 20 or 25 years ago, we could have heard talks that made some of the same points about students going into industry and getting more money, publish or perish, and so on. Um, why do you think we have any better chance now than we did then? Um, or do you? I, I'm not convinced we do have a better chance now. <laughs> I, I think then, I think it, things are worse now than they were then because the, the salary discrepancies are much more than they were then. Uh, I, 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 I don't know. I don't. I have no answer to these fundamental problems. Uh, uh, I think that there are things that can be done, but the people who have got the resources to do them, people like IBM, Google, and so on, are not really the right people to be doing them. What you want is startups, people who are really, really <clears throat> enthusiastic about what they're doing, but they don't have time to come in and help. Uh, it is the, the big companies who have got the time and who understand the value of helping. So I, I, to some of these problems, I see no answer to. I, I don't know what we can do. Uh, I, 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 identifying the problem, identifying what I think we can do about bits of that problem. But in general, it's, it's, it's not easy. I'm also curious about... Um maybe opening this up a little more, what some of the, our younger faculty members who are uh, on the Zoom session might have to say about this. Why, why, are you, why are they sticking it out as faculty rather than going into industry? Yeah, I, good point. I would be- I'm afraid good. my employer is listening, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, if, if I may say so, um, uh, I, I'm noticing many of the same things, and and um, the part part of what keeps me in in academia is um, I can work with the kinds of people that I want, namely and anyone and everyone who's in this very Zoom session right now, along with all the students, and um, this is just very inspiring to me. But I, I agree, there's. Um, Especially, and we've recently wor went through this, um, especially this accreditation pressure um, makes it really hard to change an introduction to software engineering course into something more product oriented. And what you, what you said, Ian, very much resonated with me, very, very inspiring. There are some, some questions. Um, Brent, I think, was first. Brent? Yes. Thanks for the talk. I, I, I want to quibble a little bit with, uh, with what you said about admin and, and things like that, only in the sense that I bookend my classes, my software engineering classes, with maybe a half hour at the beginning saying how some of the stuff that you're going to hear in this class doesn't apply because the projects we're working on are too small, or the products or projects. And then at the other end of the class, the last day of the class, I say, okay, you know what? A lot of that stuff about admin and things like that, um, it's all made up. <laughs> I totally, I totally uh, agree with you there. And I think it's important for, for them to hear that from a professor saying a lot of that stuff is made up. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> that's certainly good to say that, yeah. And another comment by Devin, Devin Wright. Hi, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so just to answer, I guess, um, the question raised earlier of why um, younger faculty stay. Um, so I, I guess I would be um, probably the youngest faculty you could have. <laughs> so uh, I just earned my uh, bachelor's in December um, and I'm teaching as an adjunct now. Um, and there are other offers that offer way, way more pay um, at um, just, 
I've been I've been lucky enough to have some really nice internships at bigger companies, and um, I think one thing that you can do to inspire students to either enter academia or become teachers. Um, I was hired really early on as a teaching assistant um, as an undergrad, um, and and just inspiring, just giving me the experience to interact with, I mean, really my peers, but students and to help students learn and to, um, to tutor and, and give feedback. Um, I, I think just exposing students early on to um, the love of teaching and, and research and you have to inspire them before somebody else does, <laughs> basically. Um, because as soon, oh, and, and obviously encouragement from valuable mentors is, super, super important. But yeah, I, I, I completely changed course just because of professors who allowed me the opportunity to, to do what I did. And yeah, it's, that, that's, I think, how you can get the good ones, hopefully, <laughs> and keep, keep them here. Also, I do actually have a question. Um, since I am, I guess, rather new to all of, uh, all of this. So with ABET accreditation, um, when you sacrifice that, do you see any consequences when it comes to uh, those students who want to go to graduate school? Are there schools who kind of throw a fit at all at that, or is it, has there been basically no consequence for that at all? Well, it, in, in the UK, it, it, it certainly doesn't, it, it, the accreditation is really an industry thing. Um, ah, okay. It's not, a, it's not a, they don't have the notion of accreditation of a course as a suitable for graduate school or not. So, so there's not an issue. But the whole, the whole point is that we have had zero consequences by dis ditching accreditation. Uh, nobody cares, basically. I mean, employers awesome. want people who can do the job. They don't care whether they've got accredited. And the reality is that you don't need to have gone to an accredited institution to become a professional engineer. I, I didn't do a degree in software engineering and I got to be a professional engineer. So it, it, it's, it's, a, it's helpful, but not necessary. Thank you. And, and I, I agree. I just know some places might have a, an issue with that. That's why I asked. <laughs> I should I should mention that um, um, it, I, I would agree. First of all, no one cares whether or not the software engineering program is accredited. Uh, at least, ever since we got accredited at our university, um, it's been the same before and after. So um, it's just a lot of work for you know the faculty to get through it. However, that's not necessarily the case in all jurisdictions. I know that, for example, in Canada. Um, you're required to be an um, uh, accredited if you call you want to call yourself engineer at all. Um, but then again, my knowledge is imperfect here. There's yeah, one question that reached me um, that reached me uh, from elsewhere and uh, allow me to read it uh, from 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 um, Slack. As a matter of fact, the person is asking: Industry complains that our graduates are not good at dealing with large code bases that already exists because we let students develop projects from scratch. Ian, do you have? or anyone for that matter, have any insights on how to integrate that, how to address that? Yeah, industry is being really lazy. It's not our job to teach students about large code bases. I, I, I really no time for this kind, of this kind of comment, none whatsoever. You know, it's your job to turn out people who can go and work for me from day one, and we don't have to spend any money on training. Uh, no, that's not the university's job at all. Our job is to actually take a longer perspective to equip people with the skills to learn about how to deal with large code bases, not to deal, not to be able to actually do with it. So I have no time whatsoever for this kind of comment. Thank you from the bottom of my heart on behalf of everyone. There are some more questions here. I believe Radmila had one that is on the chat. Radmila? Um, I have to make it very quick. I find that uh, the United Kingdom perfect quality assurance and regulations of our higher education by specifying always indicative syllabus, knowing learning outcomes, attaching them to the assessment criteria and so on. This is the biggest obst obstacle for me to be free in the classroom. Absolutely. Am I the only one who thinks this way? No, it's all complete nonsense. This is, this is, 
university bureaucracy gone mad. Um, <clears throat> the way in which we dealt with it is we just produced this stuff and then paid no attention to it. And told what we, you, you, you tell people you're teaching what you've said on the list and they have no idea. So you just do what you like. You just fit it to, to you know, there's nobody able to check. So the, I, the whole bureaucracy in my lifetime in the university has gone as 10 times what it was when I started. And, uh, and it's just rubbish, yeah, but it, it's, you don't have to. What's your, what's your learning outcome? Well, you know, frankly, my learning outcome is to have happy students who know about what they're doing. But how do you measure students being happy? I have no idea. So I, I completely agree with you. It's, it's, a, it, it's, it's bureaucracy that stops you doing your job. Thank it's you. so liberating to listen to. I love it. There's another question from John Barry in the chat. Um, John, would you like to ask it? I see it on the chat. No, no worries. I'll, I'll repeat it for everyone. How do you inspire 16 or 17 year olds to opt for a software engineering university course? So I, I, I don't really have an answer to that. Um, I mean, I think to some extent the market has done that in the sense that uh, students, uh, kids before they go to university, they see people earning large sums of money, developing software. They see the opportunities. They see that there's, there's jobs there. So I think the market is, has, has to some extent, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I think the situation in the UK is pretty similar to elsewhere and that there's been a, a huge increase in demand for computer science courses. I, I don't think students should be asked to opt for software engineering rather than computer science. Uh, they don't understand the difference. A lot of faculty don't understand the difference either, come to that. But, uh, so, but, but in, in general, the problem, the bigger problem is how do you get girls to opt for it? Yes, yes. And I think that's, I have my, again, interestingly, having two daughters, both of whom, neither of whom were particularly interested in technology when they were younger. And as I say, one of whom is a senior web developer. Uh, what she always complained to me about when she was making a transition from her degree, which was in philosophy, to a more techie work, was that there are no easy continuing education courses. Hmm. I think but, people are not given the opportunity or there, there are fewer opportunities for cheap courses for people who come along later to say, I want to change. And I think that's really important, especially for women, because I think there's a lot of peer pressure on women to avoid things like technology. And that, is, that, is, that is correct. Having at one time run conversion course, one of those MSc courses with 70 plus percent women on, yeah. I can say the benefits of those. Wow. But on the other hand, what I would say is, how do you actually encourage people to see that engineering is actually a suitable way to go forward? How can you inspire people? I don't think it's inspiring people at university. You actually need to inspire people before they get to university. Yeah, I, I, I don't. That's, that's, I don't really have any easy answer to that. A lot of people are trying to, to do these kind of things, but uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a very hard cultural problem because there are perceptions of engineering that are created by the media, and uh, these perceptions, especially for young adults, it's not cool. The reality is, it's not cool. So you know, breaking down. I'm also wondering if we're the right people to, to do this. And one thing that I've recently complained about quite a bit is that I'm here in the United States and coming from Europe, um, I've been recently submitting a lot of NSF grants. And one of the things you do for an NSF grant, for those of you who don't know, you write a broadening participation in computing or better yet, a broadening participation in engineering plan. It's a seven page, I think, document that outlines how exactly are you going to reach out to K through 12 type schools and get minorities and women interested in engineering and involved with your research. And as a German, I'm thinking, 
how is this my problem? How is this my problem to fix a systemic issue of racism and systemic issue of genderism when all I want to do is safety critical systems requirements engineering? Has nothing to, but then again, I understand that there's, you know, if it doesn't start with people like me, then whom should it start with? Yeah. But it's, it, it's, it's a problem. It's a social problem, a societal problem, rather. There's another comment from Becky. Um, at the community college level, I train a lot more senior students, but the problem is that the industry doesn't recognize community college courses because of weird and mostly incorrect perceptions. Um, For those of you who don't know, community colleges in the United States are two-year degrees, uh, two-year institutions where you uh, obtain associate's degrees, which is um, a precursor to the common bachelor's degree. Um, it's not quite the same as a Fachhochschule in Germany, University of Applied Sciences, but there is a certain applied aspect to community college education. Um, And that is true. There's, um, it seems to me, I, 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 feel, I feel what Becky says. Um, there's lots of community colleges around us and the industry that exists here um, says, oh no, we're not even going to consider hiring you if you only have an associate's degree or only have some college. I, I think that's probably the case in the UK as well. We have a comparable qualification called the Higher National Certificate. Uh, And I, I suspect, I don't really know, but I suspect ex exactly the same situation applies. Um, and <clears throat> I mean, my, I, I have, I have to say, I'm trouble. guys in the community college do software product engineering, because if you can demonstrate that your students can do this sort of stuff, they will do it better than a lot of university students. And then industry will take heat. Just don't stick to the old models. Break out and do it your own way. Yeah, I agreed. Community college students who transfer to my institution usually by far outpace those that have started at my institution. Yeah. Suraj raised his hand for the last comment in this session. Suraj? I, um, yeah, uh, first of all, I want to say it was a really uh, inspiring and brilliant talk. So thank you very much for that. Um, I just wanted some clarity on the, on the comment you made about the assessment versus education. Um, um, that which, 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 I just really wanted to know what you actually meant. Whether it's, it's, it's just okay to disregard the grades, uh, the assessment for just the software engineering module, or did you mean education in general for the courses? Uh, the assessment shouldn't really be the criteria for in general for the overall degree uh, awarding thing. It's just a. It, it, I just wanted to know whether it's more of a micro level or a macro level you meant. Well, <clears throat> it, it, I wouldn't describe it as either macro or micro level. We need to not, not let the assessment drive our education. So we shouldn't design it so that it's designed to be assessed. Uh, the reality is we need to have assessment, partly because of the pressure from uh, <clears throat> from society uh, who are spending money on university and part of it goes the pressure for students. Students want assessment. Uh, we all know about the <coughs> errors in assessment and that two years after graduating, it doesn't really matter how much what the student mm -hmm. assessment at university was. It's what they've done since then that matters. Um, so, which is why I say, If you give students a higher mark than they really deserve, it doesn't matter. As long as you don't give them a lower mark. Yeah. And okay. so you design a, a, an optimistic assessment system, if you like. So, so that, that, that and, and these people will go out and maybe they will live up to their mark and maybe they won't. But uh, I've certainly known a lot of students who in, in UK terms did not do really well, who happen to be excellent programmers but they weren't good at all the theory stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. And they went on and did much better working in industry than some of their peers who did a great deal better in the assessment. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if I can just add a quick one, I think it's just a sec group of people who, who really say about, as generally you have a sec some students where the 
assessment is what drives the motivation to do well in the module and study. So if, if, you, if you are giving grades liberally, then that can demotivate some students from actually uh, studying the subject. That, that can be one argument some people can put. put. I never came across that. In all, in all. As I say, I've been using an approach to group project assessment for a long time. Never found it demotivating because people still had to do good work. You know, they didn't get an A for doing a rubbish project that wasn't very good. They all got a C. Uh, so it, it, there's, there's still a gradation there. Uh, it's not that you're giving everybody an A. It's just that in a project group where everybody got an A, maybe somebody should have had a B. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. This the discussion is very fruitful. Thank you for, every, for, for Ian uh, for this wonderful, inspiring talk. Thank you, everyone who contributed to the discussion. And Ian, once again, congratulations on behalf of, the, of everyone here on your award. Um, we can feel free to continue the discussion, but I'd like to point out that the uh, best paper ceremony for Hicks is already in progress. You may join it using the link here in the, in the chat. Um, we are now looking at a small break. Uh, actually a long break, until 3.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, um, 21.15 Central European Time, and then we'll see each other again. Those of you interested in continuing the discussion, might as well stay here. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ian. See everyone else. Bye or keep going. Okay, I'm happy to take questions, but if we're sure. finished... Fine, yeah, you promised to uh, send, your, send us your I'll, 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 and the link I'll, to your I'll, website. I'll, 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 I think I think Ian Ian was busy answering questions and engaging with the audience. <laughs> we'll I, I, we'll we'll post the we'll post the link in a minute here for you. Yeah, I'll I'll, okay. I'll do that in a, in a few minutes. If uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll just do that right once we finished. I'll do that. I'll do that immediately before I forget. Yeah. Here, here's the link to the book because I was following along and looking at. <laughs> right. One further question. Mm -hmm. Please. Yeah. If you're going to believe that someone is a real engineer, and I mean engineering in the widest sense, Surely you've got to have some confidence that they are professionally qualified. And what I would say is I'm a retired academic. No, I'm a trustee of a local swimming pool. And twice the staff have been misled to buy software systems, which have actually not performed as was promised. And the one question I would have asked is, in that company that is providing your system, how many professionally qualified engineers are? Because if we were looking at having a new roof put, in, put on the swimming pool, we would actually check about the engineering qualifications of the firm that were, was going to do that. But it seems in the area of software, it doesn't matter at all. Um, that's, that's, that's actually a different issue from what we do in universities. Um, the issue of whether we should have professionally qualified engineers. The students who come out of universities with a particular qualification are not professionally qualified. Well, they are kind of professionally qualified, but they're not qualified to make decisions on critical issues. Um, I think that if you're going to look at this notion of having a, accreditation or qualified, qualified, professional qualified engineer, and actually you, you make the point about a roof, there's not actually many engineering disciplines that require this professional qualification. It's much less common than you would think. People who are concerned with building are about the only ones but you can be an electrical engineer without a professional qualification, be a mechanical engineer without being professional. Ooh, well, can you? Can you? I can. Yeah, I know them. Um, <clears throat> so 
it depends on, it often depends on an attitude of an employer. The whole notion of a professional qualification is more embedded in, in the traditional engineering disciplines. So uh, <clears throat> that's, that's, it's, it's less common, but uh, if we want to have professional qualification of software engineers, that is a different issue from what you have in your course. But surely the course should lead to that. Or should lead to a, a desire to be a professional. Surely one of the words, what, what I would say is the word about engineering that does imply a profession, a history that goes back, not just software, but a history that goes back to the pyramids, to all the developments. It, it, who are the people that you could really, you know, name a, a, an engineer you could look up to? Brunel, Stevenson, Maybe we should start from that point of view of giving people an idea of the history of engineering. Well, well the co counterpoint to that, I'm sorry, is also that, um, you know, especially here in the United States, when you look at job descriptions that, that um, of course, all the soon to be or recent graduates are looking at, um, sometimes job descriptions use the word software engineer or they use the word engineer. And in reality, what they mean is, I don't know, someone who can code service side JavaScript. Right. Yeah, that, well, that is that does not an engineer make. <laughs> yeah, but that's but that's a misuse of the term, isn't it? <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, does it matter? Oh, I think it does. Well, I think it does, but that's only. I, I think if if you're developing critical systems, I think there's an argument for professional certification. Um, if you're developing games i'm really not convinced uh, i i think that well but wait a minute if you if you're developing games it's a very broad you, is there not a whole other level of professionalism or ethics or that sort of area that's coming into the sort of games that you are developing I don't, I, don't, I don't know much about it. Yeah, I can't comment. But, uh, but I, I, I think we may, some people <laughs> a great deal of this whole notion of certification and things like that. And then, as somebody said in Canada, you can't call yourself an engineer without having been professionally qualified, professionally certified. Mm -hmm. And being professionally certified means doing a course that is certified, which, which is one of the silliest things I've ever heard because <clears throat> there are lots of great engineers that I've come across who started off doing physics and who, who, who didn't do engineer qualified courses, but they're much better engineers than lots of people who did engineering courses. So I... Uh, I don't know. Um, my greatest respect, regret is actually I read physics rather than engineering, but that's only me. <laughs> Absolutely, but uh, I think we, we learn different things. But the, the whole notion of a degree and like sort of classifying you for life is, is, is to my mind, irrelevant. I mean, it doesn't happen. We reinvent ourselves. I mean, software, when I was a student, there was no such thing as software engineering. Actually, that's a lie because software engineering, I believe, was the term came about in 1966 from Margaret Hamilton at NASA. Uh, and I started as a student in 1968. So, but the reality is nobody had heard of software engineering except folks in that. Uh, so, you know, I don't know how many times, well, everybody in university has changed what they do over the past uh, and always continually changes. And I've certainly changed from working at a very low level in microservices, right? microcomputing initially, right through to basically social issues, which is uh, mm. where my research finally ended up. So we all change. And I, I don't think it's very, I don't think what you study at a university and whether it's accredited or not is very important. It's what you do. 
not not what you've studied. If I may interrupt you and your impressive train of thoughts um, for something quite different. Um, thanks very much for the inspiring talk. Um, you mentioned that your list of course topics was, of course, not uh, the end of it. Um, what I was missing, um, because that's one of my specialties, uh, special fields, uh, is um, usability. How do Absolutely. you feel this about this as a part of software engineering? I feel it's, it's very important. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I completely agree with you that that is a key topic. Uh, if you're doing product development, it's, it's the whole issue of user experience. Uh, I, that's, it's quite hard to cover that in a short, like one semester at software engineering course. Of course. I, I think it's, 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 it, it deserves a course on its own. Yeah, of course, certainly it does deserve one or more courses of its own. Um, one of the, the, the reasons why I ask this, this question is that um, it seems to me that uh, this part, uh, namely designing user interface and programming the user interface, is often mixed. Um, and if, if people think, especially students think, or even professionals think, they can code server-side or, or, or client-side JavaScript, they can design a user interface, which Absolutely. is the reason why there are so many bad user interfaces. And, we... and alone, one last sentence, um, mentioning this topic by you um, would make a difference to many people. Uh, well, I'm not <laughs> sure I have that much influence, really. No, I, I completely agree with you. And, and I did think about doing that in the book. Um, the, 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 uh, I didn't do it because I felt I could only be very superficial. I, I, I'm not an expert in this area. I'm not an expert in security, but you can say a bit about security and you can achieve quite a lot by doing not very much. Mm -hmm. uh, with usability, there's a lot more to it. Uh, you can be, by being superficial about it, I don't actually feel, you know, follow user interface guidelines and things like that. I, I don't really think you achieve very much. I think it needs... Again, that's, I, I, we need to be thinking about our courses in, as a whole, not just as single courses. And we're very bad, or in my experience, the universities I've worked have been very bad at actually integrating the courses. There, there, there's a lack of a kind of grand vision about what we're trying to do. It's, you, you can do a course here in graphics, or you do a course in usability here, and they're not linked. Or you do a course in engineering, uh, software engineering, and here's another course on theory, but what theory, there's no linkages, we're very bad at it. And that's partly to do with the nature of universities, where you say that, well, professors have a degree of autonomy to do what they like, and that's a really good thing. And that's why I, one reason why I started, carried on working in university rather than going to work in industry, because I liked the freedom to do what I wanted. Uh, but that freedom does come at a cost because it's very hard to do that integration. Yeah, at our faculty, I, I'm working at a University <laughs> of Applied Sciences um, where we also have, of course, um, the, the, the freedom to teach what we think is, is useful, um, but it's probably much, um, much, much better communication between the colleagues. Yeah. So the, the integration is not in the curriculum, but the integration is mainly when I mention the work of my colleague uh, who's, who's teaching computer science or my colleague who's teaching software engineering when I'm doing my, my course on human-computer interaction. Yeah, yeah, well, that's good. I think that the more integration we do, the better. Right, thank you. Well, in case you want to work for us, Sonia Oswego is looking for a professor in human-computer interaction. We have a master's program in that here, so uh, 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 come and boss me around if you want. Well, everyone, thanks again. Um, I think I'll uh, just put on the, uh, the, the break slide now. Um, feel free to continue talking amongst yourselves. We'll be back at 3.15. Okay, well, thank you again for the award. And Ian, this was great. Thank you so much. This was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Congratulations.
All right, we're gonna get going here in a little while. Still got some time waiting for people to join the session again. Welcome back, everyone. Um, the uh, next session is about to commence. Very glad that um, some important people joined in the last minute, so to speak. I suppose we might as well get going. Um, friends, welcome back um, to the second session of online learning E-learning, online training, and education is the name of the session. Um, we've got three more papers um, for the session lined up, and then we have uh, an, another two sessions right afterwards. Um, the first one up, uh, I believe, will be Eva Ritz. Um, Eva is here. Are you ready to get going? Well, Eva is going to present on Learn Smarter, Not Harder, exploring the development of learning analytics use cases to create tailor-made, well, you know, my cheat sheet's cutting off there. It's a long title, but why don't you take it away for us? Um, I will. Uh, I'm going to do the presentation instead of Eva because Eva actually has got kind of a, thought, a sore throat at the moment. So if I could share my screen, that would be awesome. Yeah, abs absolutely. Well, welcome, Timo. Sorry to hear about your okay. sore throat, Eva. I hope you get well soon. Okay, Anyways, thanks. Timo, take it away. Thank you very much. Then I'm going to share my uh, screen really quick. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, why to learn smarter, not harder, and uh, going to uh, guide you through um, how we explore the development of learning analytics use cases to create tailor-made online learning experiences. Um, like already said, it's um, Eva and me. Uh, Eva is a research associate and PhD candidate at the University um, of St. Gallen in Switzerland. And I am a research assistant at the project group of business and information systems engineering for the Fraunhofer FIT and also for the research center finance and information management. And um, it comes down to the question why we did our research and so why do we learn to uh, need to learn smarter and not harder? So we actually have uh, three basic concepts or three points. Um, one is really obvious, we have digitization. And also in the last two years, we saw that um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we have to, or we have a shift from the classic traditional um, uh, house uh, course learning to the uh, face to, uh, to the online uh, centric learning forms and also new platforms like Udemy, Coursera, et cetera, um, rose um, with, different educational information. And ultimately, uh, we have the problem that we have a lot of information that individuals and organizations need to process in order to learn. And a lot of knowledge they already have and they actually do not need uh, for special tasks. And the basic question here is, how can learning analytics uh, in its field facilitate individualized learning experiences on digital education platforms? 
So we had a look into that and how did we do that? Um, that is going to be the next, uh, the next step. So first shot about what is learning analytics. So learning analytics is basically the measurement, the collection and the analysis and reporting of data about the learners um, and uh, about the learning in different contexts. And we do this um, in order to understand what the learner does in that environment and how we can optimize the learning experience for our learners. And in our case, um, we used the uh, learning analytics framework in order to cluster different use cases um, that we identified in the literature. And what does the framework uh, point to? It has it's essentially four um, uh, step stones. It's the objectives, the data sources, the interventions, and the application. So we need, um, we need to bear in mind these four uh, special ingredients, kind of, um, these dimensions in order to offer learning analytics services. And without these uh, yeah, ingredients, we can't uh, offer, we cannot offer good learning analytics services. And that is kind of the blueprint we use to analyze uh, the use cases we identified in our literature. So how it, did we identify the literature? It was a structured uh, literature review. And first we defined our search strings. Um, we had a, a total of four search strings. Then we applied these uh, search strings to journal articles and conferences. And um, in the selection phase, we narrowed down our 400, 402, um, yeah, uh, 402 articles uh, down to 47, which we deemed uh, necessary um, to analyze uh, further. Um, then in the first step, we did the selective coding. Um, we only used selective coding because we based this coding on the framework of Cypher et al which I showed you beforehand, which are the four, um, yeah, the four um, steps we wanted to include as the blueprint. And the fifth step is the presentation. So um, this is what we're doing now um, at the moment. So uh, we're going to jump uh, right into our, uh, in our use cases we identified from the literature. So we were able to cluster um, all of the use cases into four uh, main use cases. And the first use case um, is the individual learning dashboard. So what is the individual learning dashboard? It's the visualization of the data that we have of the learner. And we do so in order to uh, show to the learner uh, the learning progress and the um, historical key performance indicators um, of the learner. Um, this allows the learner to self-monitor him and to evaluate um, his learning behavior. And we also can manipulate and influence the learning behavior of the individual. And the objective hereby is to change uh, the learning behavior through the visualization and to represent the learning data in order to provide feedback. And the intervention, which is um, the most important part uh, during the learning process, um, as we want to yeah, further the learning and want uh, to direct the learning to the right direction is that we want to adapt the learning strategies of the learner, that we're going to update his current learning goals and that he can see his progress and performance interventions. Then the second use case is the, our individual learning contents. Um, so what does that mean? Um, we all know that uh, you can recommend videos to everyone, but we need to have the right knowledge or the right content that we want to, yeah, that we want to give to our learners. So we try to customize um, the new knowledge and what we want to um, tell him based on the learning data we have conveyed through the learning system. So uh, and through the uh, knowledge of the learner that, that he. Um, or the knowledge that he has already gained. So the main objective in this regard is to individualize the knowledge um, to the user preferences and the domain knowledge he already has. And the intervention um, is that we want to uh, suggest individualized learning paths um, to the learner so that not everyone has the same learning path. Um, how we can, can we do that? It's um, through different format of content through the order um, of the content itself, and also through the navigation flow through a course, for example. And also to uh, hints to further content to deepen the knowledge of the learner. 
The third UK use case we, uh, we identified is individualized tutoring. Um, this allows uh, to engage the learner with the digital learning environment so that the learning uh, environment provides uh, hints and stimulates um, the high attention of the learner so that he doesn't get bored. And this is also based on the data traces we have in the learning management systems um, where we uh, yeah, get our data from. So the main objective is to motivate the learner to improve his experience. And this is done through direct feedback to the learner. And one uh, thing we can also do is to include the emotion, um, uh, emotions through uh, appropriate channels in order to, yeah, uh, to hinder um, or not to bore uh, the learner through his, uh, yeah, while he's learning. Then the intervention behind it is that we want to visualize the, visualize the mistakes and also give strategies so that he can avoid his uh, mistakes in the future. And this is also done by step-by-step uh, -step explanations and by complementary content that he can consume. And also um, individualized hints and nudges are used um, in different papers and research projects in order to yeah, guide the learner in his, uh, in, in his path. And, um, it's also possible to not only do it in the digital world, but to offer in-person tutoring. And uh, yes, then the fourth use case is adapted learning in accordance to the personality. And this is um, really interesting because the main objective here is to adapt the learner's um, experience to his thinking and his learning style. So we can also predict at-risk learners of failing uh, because maybe some learners are going to learn better with different contents and um, through a different pace uh, during his learning uh, progress. Um, so we also want to understand the relationship between the time that the learner does spend on the platform um, and what it maybe has to do with his personality in order to maximize the learning time we have. And the intervention behind it is that we also adapt the content and also the sequence which is um, again uh, in regard or is connected to the second use case. And one intervention we also found is that we can recommend social activities with other peers in order to learn better. Then uh, what did we take away from it? What is our discussion and conclusion? Um, one interesting thing is when we look into the learning analytic cycle that the interve intervention is actually most important but um, most papers fail to address the intervention. So a lot of uh, papers or uh, research projects um, looked into the, uh, into the data analytics part, but forgot the intervention. So what does it actually mean for the learner and how does it help the learner? And another thing is that we should look into the learning analytics uh, part itself and also into the platforms because most platforms still fail to integrate um, APIs to enable the inclusion of a, a variety of data in order to get a holistic view of the learner and in order to combine the different use cases. And um, that's why we actually want to shift from the learning management system um, yeah, term in, to the learning experience platform, um, as we see that the experience is the main thing we have to think about and focus on in order to provide um, a holistic view or give a holistic learning experience. And um, that's it from me. And I'm uh, happy to discuss uh, anything further. Very nicely done. Um, very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, for, forgive me if I'm already asking the first question and forgive me even more if this is a silly one, but um, uh, I, I appreciate what you say about learning management as opposed to and, and learning analytics. And, you know, um, I appreciate that. Um, but somehow I feel, maybe you said it, but but learn what exactly? Doesn't Isn't that an integral part of how to instruct is what is being instructed? Um, maybe I can answer. Um, yes, I think it's like also a really important question. But I think like what we wanted to focus on, like the technology learning analytics, what it can actually do, because I think the, the hard part actually is that when you're or in the information systems field, you always have like both kind of 
perspectives like the technical and also the social so um i think it's it's much more like psychology actually how learning is conducted the best way and which contents are provided um and i think that's like a whole kind of different field um than what we are engaging um right now um which is like the the technological possibilities opportunities to individualize learning experiences but of course that's like um i think that's like a whole new issue for further research also maybe right um <clears throat> forgive me if i'm saying this I'm, i'm having a slight disconnect here um so okay so first i, I understand now that this is really um learning information systems and information systems okay so that, this helps What I'm wondering is, um, well, even in information systems, there there is an experiential aspect to instruction, and there is a theoretical aspect to instruction. So, are we are we talking about analytics for experiential or analytics for, let's say, um, form formative learning alone? Like, learn this now, regurgitate, as opposed to learn this now, apply it. So, which of the two? are being discussed here. I think for me, uh, it would be like the first one or it's more like the experimental one. Um, oh, because, okay. yeah. Okay. So, so, so summative, uh, so for, formative learning in the sense that, um, okay, we, 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 we present the learner with some content and then we are observing how they how they um, interact with the material and how they pro produce solutions. Yes, so I think what's really important also, um, what we mean with the learning experience platform, for instance, <coughs> um, is that, um, that you can actually store all the data which is needed and observe the, the different um, the the real time behavior of the of the students for instance which gives you like really um like new opportunities to actually um analyze the behavior because what we have right now i mean the these learning management systems um like moodle canvas whatever and they only like you can't really analyze the data properly um and also you can also only include like maybe one or two data sources. But um, what was Timo saying before is like the, the RPs or something they are missing. So you can't really include or analyze data from different sources on this. And I think that's what's making the, or what's actually the challenge at the moment also um, with all the learning analytics. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, this is, uh, this is really, you're making a strong, very, very strong uh, argument for, some of the talks we've heard earlier this morning, right? For example, Marcel was um, talking about um, uh, using live replays to investigate the modeling process and, and Stefan was presenting on semi-automatic semi um, semi way to investigate students' progress in, in documenting models too. And, and Ben was talking about um, something quite similar with test cases as well. So really what you're making is the, the strong argument here that um, this, Live investigation of the learning process should not just be an individual tool. It should be a central aspect of the learning management platform, the Moodles and the Blackboards and the Canvases of the world. And I think that's an important take home message here. As my institution is going to change, they're going to switch from Blackboard to, Jesus, I think they call it Brightspace and, you know, replace crap with different crap right they're all terrible anyways are there any other questions from the audience well if that's not the case then thank you very much this was very interesting and i very much agree with your assessment that you know learning analytics should be part should be part of the learning platform definitively thank you very much thank you very much for having us Thanks. Moving right along, we, we next up have uh, Devin Wright. Um, we heard from him earlier, and now he's he, he's on all uh, with with his own talk. 
on autonomous Discord, an autonomous Discord bot to improve online course experiences and engagement. He's going to turn, talk to us about lessons learned amid the pandemic. Devin? We can't hear you right now. If you said something, we didn't hear it. Can you hear me now? Sorry. And now we can. Nicely done. Awesome. Okay. Um, so, uh, and just making sure you can see the presentation too. Awesome. Cool. So uh, today I'm going to obviously talk about uh, Discord bots and the use of Discord in online classrooms. And uh, this is some research and somewhat of a report of things we've learned uh, doing this. Um, obviously, 2020, COVID happened and uprooted face-to-face -face classes. March 6th in Utah, uh, the government actually declared a state of emergency. And by March 23rd, we had completely transitioned to an 100% uh, remote learning model. Um, and after our assessment of many other platforms, we ultimately decided on using Discord as the platform to deliver our instruction. And part of that motivation came from the fact that Discord is consisted of communities or guilds and users generally refer to them as servers. Um, they work similarly, similarly to like Slack, you can uh, share screen your screen and files and uh, have text, voice and video chat. Um, but there's a high degree of flexibility in these servers and you can customize them a lot, uh, which was really useful for us for creating a really good learning environment. And in our case, the majority of CS students at UVU were actually already familiar with Discord and used it a lot, um, primarily for socializing, likely because many of them are gamers. Um, so we recognized a need for automated attendance tracking. Uh, obviously, manual methods are tedious and time consuming. And these um, problems, these challenges gave us uh, the idea to create an autonomous system that would be completely passive and run in the background on Discord so that students would not need to interact with it at all specifically. Um, and it would also provide and does provide a means for gathering data um, for wit with which we can um, analyze select student behaviors in the future. So our motivation was also brought on by um, the facts that well um, prepared students actually perform similarly both online and in person, but while they perform the same, average students don't. They tend to perform more poorly in online classes and students who are more underprepared for college actually perform even worse. The gap between their in-person and online performance is greater. Um, UVU is a large institution uh, with over 41,000 students and a large percentage of them are actually non-traditional or first-generation students. This is important because non-traditional students perform more poorly than average students in both online and face-to-face -face classes. And first-generation students are more likely to be underprepared for a university education, which is important because as I pointed out, um, the more underprepared you are, the more poorly you will perform in online classes, um, or it's, it's more likely, it's not guaranteed. Um, and so we were motivated to more find a way to more closely mirror the in-person experience while having to deliver everything online to hopefully narrow this uh, gap. So, oh, and also there was a steep decline in uh, attendance when we transitioned. So it was an obvious place where we needed improvement anyway. And our current working hypothesis is that the known use of an automated attendance tracking system improves remote learning outcomes. Um, it's also important to note that while there are other forms of engagement, behavioral engagement is the one you can view from the outside. Um, and so it, that makes it crucial to observe. Uh, and the, we also know that the accuracy of assessing student involvement impacts student learning outcomes, which inspired us to um, create in this, this new method for attendance tracking, uh, instead of having a binary, here, not here method of tracking. We actually created uh, discrete steps basically. And um, we grade by your actual attendance and uh, your presence within the course. 
It's also um, ab absenteeism increases as uh, access to online materials increases. This is important to keep in mind because obviously everything is online. Um, so we needed to find a way to combat absenteeism um, while having everything online. Some related work, other methods people have used to track attendance. There's obviously the manual methods, but keep in mind that up to eight hours of class time per semester can be taken up in roll call, um, which is 17 to 20% of a typical three credit course. Um, there's some validation and digital tracking issues with manual, um, when you do everything manually. And there's also some ethical issues introduced to specifically students if you pass around a roll call. For example, they can mark their friends present when they're not here. And we just didn't want that to be an issue. Others have come up with um, really uh, interesting ways to track attendance themselves, such as uh, using technologies as QR codes, fingerprinting, RFID, facial recognition, and NFC technology. But all of these require adoption of specific technologies by the institutions and the students. Uh, they all have limitations as well, such as NFC, for example, when that was used, a student could still uh, it forget to mark themselves present, and then they wouldn't be counted uh, or receive credit for that. And that doesn't uh, solve the problems that are some of the problems that are present when you just pass around a roll call. Um, Discord, there are other Discord based methods as well that have been implemented using bots to track attendance. Um, however, they all have deficiencies, um, at, meaning they didn't have some functionality we wanted, such as granular tracking of arrivals and departures and flexible calculation of attendance grades. Um, they also, some of them only work with specific. Um, applications and some are also um, paid. And so we in the end decided to design our own. And this is great because as an added benefit, we have full control and we could add more functionality later on. The general application of a Discord bot to an online classroom is rather simple as well. So the, the use case at least, a stu your students would basically log into Discord, click on the server, and then click on the voice channel, which is the classroom. Um, and that's all they would need to do. If they're present, they would be counted present. The professor or instructor will do the same. Um, and then they would need to start the attendance tracking by just sending a command. And the attendance bot will take care of everything else. Um, when you design it, if you wanted to design and implement your own attendance bot, uh, Discord makes this rather simple as it provides its own uh, API um, Python library, which you can use to, um, the library takes care of all of the networking and all you really need to focus on is the functionality of your bot. Um, the Discord portal online for um, developers is easy to use. There's, if you want to create an application and a bot, that's really simple. There's two buttons, a create application button, and then converting it to a bot. Um, and when you do that, the main difference is a bot is an application that uh, has an entity it can act as that sits on a server just like, and interacts with a server just like a human would. So you can send and receive messages just like a human and you can perform administrative capabilities like a human. But what's important in this uh, UI is this right here. You would need to grab this token um, and this is how you interact. You tell Discord specifically what bot you want to control and command. Our bot consists of two basic scripts. We have assistantbot.py and admin functionality.py. AssistantBot.py basically launches the bot and launches the, the functional component of the bot. Um, admin functionality implements all the functional components such as tracking attendance. It's also important to note that um, we had to manually create a student map between student names and their persistent Discord identifiers. And this is because Discord IDs so, or usernames and their nicknames can be on a server can be changed at will by any user. And so the only thing that's persistent is this integer ID. Um, it's not a big deal and the ID is easy to access, but you do, it is a manual process. Uh, and COG is just Discord jargon for a class that is provided by um, the API and you need to inherit from it when creating new functionality. Assistantbot.py also this is a basic start. If you wanted to create your own, um, this is all you would need to launch a bot. Um, 
navigating the documentation is difficult, but actually using the API is not. <laughs> um, so um, this would basically launch a bot and then uh, send a message inside the console wherever you're running uh, the code for your bot. This is where you would insert the token you grab from the developer interface as well. Um, Assistant bot also defines three administrative com commands, load, unload, and reload. And this just uh, allowed us an extensible design because um, we can load, unload, and reload cogs that we create in the future. Or if we add, uh, say, more functionality to the cog we already have, you can leave the bot up and remain functioning and not have to um, restart it, but you can just reload the, basically add functionality while it's running. Um, admin functionality.py um, has some important functions. We have clear, which just deletes um, messages within a text channel, change prefix, changes the command prefix for the bot, um, which I'll get to in a second, change channel and uh, changes the voice channel for which you want to attract attendance on, uh, attendance start and stop, just start and stop tracking attendance. This is an example of all the code you would need to pull a voice channel. Um, if you wanted to do it on a time interval and do it maybe every 10 minutes or something like that, you would just need to modify this slightly. And it, 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 it is rather simple to get up and running. Um, controlling the bot. So if you want to command a bot, uh, it's the same as if you were talking to a human on Discord. Um, if you're in a text channel and you're talking to one of your students, it's the exact same uh, text channel. The way a bot knows you're talking, you're commanding it and not talking to a person is, are these things uh, called prefix command, uh, prefix strings. And every bot on every server has one associated with it. And you can set, this is custom. Um, so it can be hey bot, it can be any character you want. We settled on the right parenthesis. It was just, uh, it was simple. And basically every time the bot sees a uh, text that starts with its prefix string, it will uh, look for a function that matches what you've said. This is the basic structure of Discord and all you would really need to focus on implementing this for your own classes is the functional code of your bot and you also need a server um, basically, you just need somewhere to run your code that has access to the internet. Everything else is provided by Discord. The API you download and handles all the networking, like I mentioned earlier. Your bot resides on a server with the users, and uh, it, it's, uh, it's a really nice uh, intuitive process. When we would run our bot, this is just what it looks like on server side. On our Raspberry Pi, we track every minute. Um, see who's there. And we also track arrivals and departures. If students leave and come back, uh, we also track that. And uh, we store all of that data on our Raspberry Pi. Um, and uh, it works really well. There are some limitations. Obviously, uh, students can be counted present and not attend by turning off their speakers, just like Zoom. <laughs> students with multiple accounts can um, cause issues. Uh, because if you don't have them registered in the map you create between their names and their identifiers, that other identifier likely isn't in the map unless they provided both. Um, you also have to manually create that mapping, which is the most tedious part of the process. Uh, we don't have an automatic method for transferring the grading to the official grades, so we had to do that manually as well. And you have to manually start and stop the bots tracking, which isn't a big deal, but um, it does require diligence. There's a lot of things we can do to improve the bot in the future, but what I'm most interested in personally is actually, uh, I want to have more opportunities in online classes to collect this systematic data and, and uh, teach on Discord and see if I can answer the question if the bot actually does narrow this gap between remote and in-person learning. Um, and also, in conclusion, um, we did uh, explore new solutions, Discord. Uh, we used it as, a, as an online platform, and uh, we sought to bridge this gap. And while we haven't answered that question yet, we did develop an autonomous bot that does track attendance successfully and accurately. Um, and we used it ourselves 
in multiple classes, and we can also it also mitigates some of the common pitfalls with traditional attendance tracking. Um, that's all I have for now. Um, I'd love to take any questions if you have any or or uh, input or suggestions. Thank you, Devin. <laughs> any no questions? Um, allow me to start. Um, uh, so attendance tracking, yeah. why exactly? Okay, so basically, and I'll, as I mentioned in the, the motivation, um, attendance, here, I'll, I'll go back here just because it makes it a little, little easier. Um, attendance was dropping, um, and we know that as attendance drops, um, well, obviously people receive less instruction, but right. um, so we notice a, a steep decline. And we, it's also important that the accuracy, we, we found through our research that the accuracy of assessing student involvement um, impacts their learning. So we wanted to find right. a way to uh, have a more accurate attendance uh, tracking system. So not right. only- is But being there doesn't necessarily make them learn more or learn better. Right. So oh, if people are not I coming think. to my class, then honestly, I couldn't care less if they're not in my class. I, I don't should, care. I should but if they don't do the assignments, then they won't learn. Right. Yes. Um, and, and I should also mention this can be a class by class basis because there's obviously classes where attendance isn't that big a deal. Um, specifically, the class we were teaching is uh, I, I botched the name, but it's moral and ethical issues in computing. Okay. So there's a lot of class involvement um, required in the class. Um, okay. So this is important specifically for classes where attendance is an important component. Oh, um, so the, the specific benefit, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm getting at here is this, um, you know, this is, now we all know how to make a Discord bot, right? But yeah. I think what many of us were hoping to learn is um, how, how did it specifically help the course? And I think the strength here is, is this, you made a Discord bot for an online class that is, that is heavily discussion-based, right? Like moral yes. and ethical. We have a course like this too. In fact, um, as of uh, cur Computing Curricula 2022, uh, ACM will require any CS the program to have such a course. So it's mm -hmm. good that you have one. You're one step closer to being accredited. So the, uh, the point is, if you have a course like this, it is very much discussion-based and attendance is a prerequisite to being able to participate in discussion and through discussions learn a lot. Aha. So now that's where a, a, the bot becomes an interesting solution, right? Yeah. Now the question is how much, like did you assess the impact of observing attendance had on the quality of discussion? Um, only anecdotally. So only by uh, not like a, it, it's something I mentioned, especially in the paper uh, that we, we want to continue doing this and um, collect the data so we can actually make a solid conclusion on whether it did. Um, our, our main point in this paper, it, it's basically out of the scope of, of the research we've done so far, um, okay. but we do plan well, I would very strongly encourage you to to look at that. Um, yes. You know, yeah. Especially, especially, you know, I think there's an opportunity here, and uh, don't miss out on that. Yeah, absolutely. That and that is the plan. Um, um, are there any questions? Any other questions from the audience? Well, if there are no any questions, then uh, let's move to our next talk by, I'm hoping I don't butcher your name, Manav, Manasvi Kumar is going to speak to us uh, on when is enough enough, an examination of student engagement when watching online group project presentations. Manasvi, yes. whenever yes. you're ready, however you want to be ready, let's go. Yes, uh, you got the name correct, so that's great. Uh, for this talk, uh, unfortunately, I do not have a live presentation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, share the video which I had provided and uh, feel free to uh, stop me anytime and uh, I can answer any questions. So other than the fact that it's a recording, everything else is basically the same. So 
let me see if I can do this correctly. Uh, so do, do you see the screen with the video? Yes, we are. Yes, all right. So I'll just play this right now. Hello, everyone. I'm Manishvi Kumar, a PhD student studying at the University of Arizona. I'm excited to present the paper titled, When is Enough Enough? An Examination of Student Engagement When Watching Online Group Project Presentations. Before I begin, I would like to thank all the co-authors of this paper for giving me an opportunity to share our findings with you all. In this presentation, I begin by briefly going over the difficulties associated in engaging students' engagement in an online context and how relationships between student perceptions, behavior, and performance may be studied. I then describe the methodology used in this study. Later, I summarize our analysis and go over the key results obtained. I then leverage our findings to formulate suggestions for improving the design of online group presentation and peer review assignments. Finally, I will leave you with some key takeaways from the study. Let us begin by examining student engagement in an online context. The volume of online classes grew rapidly in 2020 as various lockdown measures were imposed. This shift was not entirely smooth as replicating specific class activities remains challenging. One such commonly included part of many course design recommendations is group presentation. These are difficult to include in an online setting but are considered to be critical learning experiences. The key challenge associated with including group presentations in these settings include difficulty in gauging student participation and engagement. Assessing student engagement in an online setting is different and difficult compared to an in-person one where student behaviors are much more easily observed. In this paper, we explore the relationships between student perceptions on online presentations, their engagement behavior while completing the task, along with overall class performance. We will now go over the methodology used in the study, mainly focusing on the nature of the engagement task and various data sources used during the study. Students enrolled in an undergraduate operations management class at a public university were considered for the study. As a course requirement, all students were part of a five-member project team which submitted a 10-minute online recorded presentation. Later, they were also required to individually evaluate five randomly assigned presentations. These students were later recruited to complete a survey in order to receive extra credit. In the survey, they answer demographic questions and questions which capture student attitudes towards different facets of evaluating videos. As only students enrolled in a specific class were recruited for the study, this provides us with access to their letter grades on the course, subject to student consent. Furthermore, as all videos evaluated were hosted on an online learning platform, this provides us with access to view times on all videos, again subject to student consent. Finally, the survey responses provide us self-reported student attitudes towards various facets of the evaluation assignment, such as learning, value of time, and importance of the task. We now focus on the data used in the study, specifically how we aim to combine different diverse data sources to improve understanding of how students perceive and go about completing the task of online presentation evaluations. As mentioned earlier, we ask students to complete an online survey where they answer questions capturing their attitude towards the evaluation assignment. All responses are calibrated on a five-point Likert scale with higher values indicating a positive sentiment. We then collect view times from the online learning platform which serve as a proxy for student engagement. The platform provides data on time spent on the page, but not the exact time of viewing. This makes it difficult to predict the order in which the five videos were viewed. We negate this issue by sorting videos based on view times on the assumption that viewing time declines as a student watches subsequent videos. Finally, we use letter grades on the course as opposed to grades on the presentation project as the former is a better representation of the student's individual understanding. While pre-processing this data, we observed that 289 of 365 students who completed the survey agreed to allow use of their educational record data. We then performed outlier analysis on view times and eventually utilized records from 249 students for further analysis. We'll now summarize the results of our study and describe the types of analyses performed based on the data at hand. For example, we can analyze video view time data from two perspectives, aggregate and individual. From an aggregate perspective, we can answer several questions regarding average view times on the assignment, 
average view times on every video and so on. From an individual level, we can analyze view times for each individual for five videos and detect different viewing behaviors which could be rationalized into various personas. Data obtained from the survey can be used to determine students' self-reported attitude towards various facets of the evaluation assignment. Utilizing class performance data alone helps determine the baseline for obtaining an A grade in the course. While these analyses could lead to interesting observations, we can also combine these resources to answer questions which are otherwise difficult to do so. For example, we can analyze how various aggregate behaviors and individual personas influence survey responses and performance in the class. Answering these questions helps us test conventional wisdom that students who spend adequate time to complete their assignments receive high grades. We begin by summarizing results from the survey and analyzing aggregate view times. Before I share the survey results, note that student attitudes towards various facets of the evaluation assignment are obtained by averaging scores on relevant questions. We first ask students whether the evaluation assignment was a valuable use of their time. The average score is around 3 which indicates fairly neutral sentiment. When asked if students found the evaluation assignment as a valuable learning experience, the average score rises to 3.22 indicating a slightly positive sentiment. Finally, when asked if the students value providing feedback to their peers, the average score is 3.46, indicating the most positive sentiment among the questions asked. We now focus our attention on aggregate view time analysis, which can be done at an assignment level and video level. When analyzing view times at an assignment level, we found that the average time taken by a student to complete the assignment was 25 minutes, with the median time being closer to 21.5 minutes. When analyzing view time at a video level, we found that the average view time for an, for an individual video is 5 minutes, with more than half the responses generated requiring less than 4 minutes of view time. We now look at view times at a video level to understand individual viewing behavior. We observe that the viewing behavior changes as a student evaluates five videos, notably exhibiting the experiential effect observed in such tasks. This observation enables us to classify students based on their viewing characteristics. One such characteristic is the average view time of all videos which was around five minutes or half the duration. A student who viewed all his or her videos for greater than average time completed the assignment diligently. We thus classify those students who viewed all their videos for greater than five minutes as conscientious. On the other hand, we posit that a student who viewed any video for less than a minute didn't complete the assignment diligently. We therefore classify these students as cheaters. Not all students lie in these extreme ends, and it is entirely possible that students exist who put in minimal but adequate effort in viewing the videos and provide strictly satisfactory feedback. These students are classified as satisficers. Another key observation obtained from analyzing the data is that the average view time of the longest watched video is roughly 2.8 times that of the shortest watched video. This indicates the existence of students who initially view videos diligently but end up satisficing towards the end. Such students are said to be experiencing drop-off. Finally, students who did not exhibit any of these viewing behaviors are classified as conventional students. We now look at the viewing characteristics of these personas which were calculated using the view times of individual videos. To begin, we classify a student as a cheater if his or her shortest watched video, which is video 5, is viewed for less than a minute. On the other hand, a student with video 5 viewed for more than 5 minutes is classified as conscientious. A student whose longest watched video, which is video 1, is viewed for less than 5 minutes and video 5 is viewed for more than a minute is classified as satisficer. Similarly, a student with video 1 viewed for more than 5 minutes and video 5 viewed for between 1 and 5 minutes and the ratio of view times of videos 1 and 5 is found to be greater than 3 is classified as drop-off, while if the ratio is less than 3, the student is classified as conventional. We will now look at the effect of view times on survey responses, specifically focusing on how students' viewing behavior personas affect survey responses. We observed that conscientious students found the assignment to be a valuable use of their time and also found it to be a valuable learning experience. We also observed relatively high average scores on the importance of feedback from all groups of students. In addition, we observe that students who spend less than 25 minutes on the assignment 
neither found it to be a valuable use of their time, nor found it to be a good learning experience. We will now look at the effect of view times on class performance, specifically focusing on how students viewing behavior personas affect letter grade on the course. Before discussing the results, it is worth noting that roughly 56% of the class receive an A grade on the course. We observe that roughly 48 to 49% of the students classified as drop-off, satisficers or cheaters received an A grade, which is less than the baseline. In contrast, 66% of the students classified as conscientious received an A grade and 74% of students classified as conventional received an A grade. These results are consistent with those of aggregate view times, where 75% of the students who spent more than 50 minutes on the oral assignment received an A grade compared to 50% for those who spent less than 25 minutes. We will now look at the effect of class performance on survey responses, specifically focusing on how letter grade on the course affects survey responses. We do so by contrasting the average scores of the self-reported measures based on the binary allocation of A grade and not A grade. We observe that students who received an A grade found the assignment to be a valuable use of their time and also viewed it to be a valuable learning experience compared to those who didn't. Finally, those who received an A grade also found the task of providing feedback to be more important than those who didn't, with the average scores on these questions being greater than the other two. This indicates that the overall class agrees that providing feedback is an important task. Let us now discuss the key findings and implications of this research. We found that while students agree that providing feedback is important, they do not see the task as a valuable use of their time. We also found that students view most videos for roughly half their duration and possibly skim through them or skip sections. We observed that students viewing behaviors change over the course of five videos and it is possible to realize personas which summarize their behaviors. We also found that students who engage more are likely to receive a better final course grade than those who don't. We will now demonstrate how utilizing these results could be used to improve the design of online group presentation assignments. Let us briefly discuss one approach to improve student engagement. Note that the initial design of the evaluation assignment involves the student providing feedback to five different 10-minute presentation videos. Let us now utilize the results obtained from the current study. Analyzing survey data indicated that while students agree that providing feedback is important, they do not view it as a valuable use of their time. Analyzing individual and aggregate view times revealed that students do not watch all five videos entirely prior to providing feedback. Thus, a logical suggestion to improve engagement could be to reduce the overall ideal time requirement to complete the task. This can be achieved by reducing the number of evaluations per student or reducing the overall length of each video or a combination of the two. Our data reveals that almost half the class viewed at least three videos for at least four minutes. A good starting point could therefore be to redesign the assignment such that each student evaluates three presentations with each presentation being no longer than five minutes each. This process may be iterated until satisfactory scores of student attitudes are achieved. In conclusion, I would like to leave you with a few key takeaways. In this paper, we designed a study to understand the limits of student engagement while evaluating online presentations. We utilized self-reported measures as well as actual engagement while completing the evaluations to perform analysis. Our results indicate that student behavioral data when evaluating online presentations indicates students' engagement with the course material. We also found that students engage in different types of viewing behaviors as they complete multiple evaluations. We recommend that instructors perform similar analysis to better gauge current student engagement levels and make appropriate changes to their course design in order to ensure acceptable levels of student engagement while performing evaluations. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you very much. By the way, I'd like to remind everyone that some of you um, uh, received, some of you did, some of you did not receive instructions from Hicks to please pre prepare a video. Um, we did not, not all of us know about that, but if you happen to make a video and if you'd like for your video to be more prominently featured, 
we are happy to put it on the CC'd uh, YouTube channel. So um, you can get a little bit more exposure for your work and link to it directly if you so desire. Um, it's an offer. If you want to do that, uh, feel free to email me afterwards. Um, anyways, in the meantime, are there any questions for Manasvi? <clears throat> well, I have one, if you don't mind. Um, I'm wondering, Manasvi, um, those, those videos, and I really like the approach, and I'm, I'm really confident that, that you know, sh shorter, bite-sized videos are, mm -hmm. are helping as opposed to long, monolithic, lecture-style things. And I yes. made that experience the hard way by, you know, no one watching my lecture videos, <laughs> unless yeah. I made them short. What, do you, what would you say is the ideal length? For a lecture video like that, so uh, we haven't uh, looked at lecture videos per se. We have looked at, uh, for example, in this assignment, they were uh, asked to uh, perform a case study and report yeah. their findings. So this is relatively shorter. So it's like a typical Harvard uh, Business School case study. So the du the duration allotted was ten minutes, but what we found was that more than half of the videos were viewed for less than five minutes. So it's clearly if 10 minutes is way too long for as an attend, for the current attention span of the students. So this is kind of what we, uh, the, the, your question, the answer to your question is what we were looking for in the sense that we wanted to know at, to what duration, what duration would be ideal. So for example, we found towards the very end that more than half students at least viewed three videos for four minutes. So at least for three separate videos, they have viewed it for four minutes each, which is pretty cool. So now we have a ballpark that, okay, if we, instead of asking them to view five videos for 10 minutes, if we ask them to view three videos and each video is five minutes long, we may have more engagement. And uh, that's the, that, to arrive at that number is what this entire analysis was for. Yeah. Very interesting. So it almost sounds to me that, you know, lecture, lectures should be mimicking TikToks rather than movies, right? That's not... Yes. <laughs> Anyways, thank you very much. I think we have to, oh, Stefan has, an, has is raising his arm. Yes. Yeah, I, I find it quite interesting what you um, just said with this five minutes, but um, I mean, I wonder how should we explain them complex topics in five minutes? Um, I don't think that you can explain all the topics in university in such a short amount of time, right? So what would be your approach then? Should we split those complex topics even into smaller ones or... Um, is it also somehow possible to motivate them to show a 15 minute video at least I would say so yeah again the, this is the number I have arrived at which is 5 minutes is based off of the fact that the original video was of 10 minutes uh, I'm pretty sure that during COVID we may have had some videos lectures uploaded online which is probably more than a few hours maybe one and a half hour lecture and if you look at the view times I'll be surprised if any of those videos have more than 15 minutes watch time. So students have a tendency to skip and they go to the most important slides. So I do not have exactly have an answer. It's going to be very inductive in the sense that you've got to perform similar analysis on your uh, view times and you've got to see how they look like and possibly then you can arrive at some number. So there are obviously some limitations as you just mentioned because the more complicated a few topics are, it's very unlikely that you're going to summarize that in a minute or so, right? So there are some hard bounds which you will have to put. For example, you cannot say that the video can be less than 15 seconds or so. That's just some logical hard bound which you must put. But other than that, the data is going to indicate what uh, time is optimal and what length is optimal. So that's something which your data is going to indicate. That's, yeah. Very okay, cool. thank you. Thank you very much. Um, time is running out, so we have to move on to the next session. Thank you very mon much, everyone, for this session, for their wonderful contributions. And without further ado, I I'll give the torch to Nancy. Thank you. And uh, everybody who's here, please don't leave. We have lots of exciting stuff coming up. Uh, we have um, two sessions, one of four papers and one with uh, three papers on industry quality and social issues, that's IQSI. I'll be chairing the first session and my co-chair, Elke Hochmuller, will be chairing the second session. 
And Bastian will be with us throughout. In fact, right now I'm going to pass the baton to him to present his second paper of the day. Bastian's an associate professor at State University of New York at Oswego. His interests, as you know from seeing his earlier presentation, include both requirements engineering and uh, safety critical systems, as well as software engineering education. The paper that he'll be presenting right now is using the cybersecurity body of knowledge case studies to enhance student learning. So Bastian, it's all yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Nancy. And th sorry, everyone, I promise it's um, uh, the, what, what's, I'm really only here to, um, to, Well, that happened. Okay, I'm back now. For some reason, my um, my my Zoom really doesn't enjoy that I'm presenting my screen these days. Okay, here we go. Um, I was saying that I'm I'm substituting for Annie who has fallen ill, and please join me in wishing her a speedy recovery. Anyways, I'm talking about a, case, a library of case studies. Uh, yes, for the cybersecurity body of knowledge, and despite what Ian said. Um, he doesn't like bodies of knowledge. Um, the Cybox uh, body of knowledge is actually really useful and really good, in my opinion. Um, now, I'm not no Ian Somerville, but <clears throat> nonetheless, I really fall taken a keen liking to it because, as we all know, um, security is becoming a more and more important topic in software engineering. And there's no day that passes these days anymore where we don't hear about a leak or some um, some major hack or some kind of digital fraud that is happening that is uh, impacting almost every aspect of our modern life. So needless to say, it is important that future generations of software engineers, like Nance, uh, Ian also said, um, know about cybersecurity. So the beautiful folks at the University of Bristol in the UK came up with the cybersecurity body of knowledge um, and, uh, and, and have called to uh, some people to make projects to help them um, to help them uh, promote and instruct the cybersecurity body of knowledge. So Cyborg is actually a free accessible, uh, freely accessible community resource that you can find on cyborg, uh, cyborg.org. Um, it's, it's very, very vast. It's, it's very much like uh, Microsoft's um, uh, security certification or CompTIA, but it's less, uh, less focused on application. It's more focused on, I guess it's fair to say, more focused on um, the theory and the, and the fundamentals on, about it. It can be subdivided into five rough categories shown here, as well as uh, 19 different knowledge areas, which roughly correspond to the chapters in the 600 or so page textbook that they give you for free. <clears throat> and here they are. And in these projects that they have um, uh, called for and that we have answered and were selected for, they ask us to make freely accessible educational resources to help us and help you um, to teach the content of cybersecurity to new generations of software engineers. So we gladly did so. And um, one of the things that we were felt really strongly about is to use what we call educational case studies. Now, um, educational, don't confuse those with uh, case studies as a research, as an empirical tool, where you know you understand you ascertain the, the precondition, apply an intervention, and then see what the outcome was. It's, it's similar though, but not quite the same. Case studies in our case means any kind of freely and self-contained um, um, uh, assignment almost. It could be as vast as a semester long project that students are asked to complete or as simple as a small task to be featured on an exam or an assignment sheet. Um, what's important about what differentiates most case studies from most non-case studies is that they are formative in nature. And you heard me talk earlier, I'm very proponent of formative instruction in the sense that rather than asking students to regurgitate stuff, we want them to apply things. We want them to apply techniques that they learned about in the theory. And in order to facilitate that, we came up with a common structure for all of the case studies that we, we developed. Um, the structure is here. Um, it, it, 
the, the point here is that it contains an overview that explains to the learner which outcomes we are actually interested in. And it, it contains student instruction and most importantly, that's what you should give, pay attention to, instructor notes. These instructor notes contain caveats, pitfalls, and strategies of how to successfully apply any of these case studies to use. And if available, there's a sample solution also. Now, the outcome of our project was a library consisting of 18 case studies. And I'd like to mention right away, these, uh, uh, Annie, Nancy, and I are not the, not the uh, sole authors of all the case studies. We, in fact, had many, many other people help us, I believe, Nancy, you will be able to correct me here, but I think we had like 12 or 13 different authors who contributed their case studies to, um, to this body of knowledge. And in total, we came up with 18 case studies that cover all but three knowledge areas. So we have about 84% uh, coverage here. Most of those knowledge areas were even covered by more than one case study so that you as the instructor, you have a choice which ones to use. And these, these case studies here roughly map to the knowledge areas as so. So as you can see here, we have several cases. Let me give you an example. This one here, the Mount Gox theft case studies, if you remember 2011 or so, um, some hackers stole like almost a billion dollars in cryptocurrency from the Mount Gox trading system. And this is a case study that asks the learner to forensically analyze what happened here and touches upon several different knowledge areas. A different case study is the drive assistance system case study, which we, which existed and we improved with cybersecurity knowledge and then later applied. And the question of course is, well, how do we know that these case studies work to, to instruct cybersecurity knowledge? And the reason why, why we know is because, well, we collected data about it. For example, we applied the, cyber, the drive assistance system case study in those of you who were here earlier in the aforementioned safety requirements engineering course that I already spoke about. So um, we, we used the same case study there. We infused it, however, with cybersecurity knowledge. And what we learned is that compared to the previous years where we used the same case study, but without cybersecurity knowledge, students did vastly, vastly better. I mean, check out the median score here. Um, in 2021, it was 91.88% as opposed to 74 and 42 percent in the previous two years. Significant results across the board. Um, that is that's that's amazing. And we were wondering, well, why did this really happen? And one of the items that I noticed that when when I instructed this, what I noticed is this: the course is a safety requirements engineering course. It was all about hazards and what could happen to what could happen to hurt people. And in, in contrast to that, cybersecurity is about what vectors exist, how, uh, how, how could, what, what threats exist to, um, um, to, to the system and, uh, and, and, so, and so on. And in contrast, but I noticed that in contrast to safety hazards, the idea of a cybersecurity threat become, became much more intuitively to students. They almost intuitively were able to understand, oh, this is, if, if a hacker did this to our system, this is what could happen. And they were able to, from that thought, derive safety hazards for cars in this particular case study much, much more quickly. So um, this was, an, an, this was an, a very remarkable finding in my opinion. In other respects, it mimicked our previously positive experiences with the use of case studies to begin with, but this particular case was a very neat way to almost seamlessly infuse cybersecurity knowledge in a course that wasn't even about cybersecurity, strictly speaking. So that was very, very successful in my opinion. Um, so long story short, we created this library of case studies and was by far one of the most engaging and enthusiastic projects that I have been a part of in the last couple of years. And I. Um, was, was really happy to, to, be, um, to be helping with this. Um, we came up with 18 case studies that cover almost all of the cyborg knowledge areas with the exception of three. And these are network security, physical layer, and telecommunications. Except not really, because what happened is that in, we completed the project sometime in May, 2021. And in June, or was it July in 2021, the University of Bristol um, released Cyborg version 1.1. And just like that, 
our um, our work was partly outdated, except not really. What they have done is uh, they added some more material and we did a follow-up project that we actually finished two days ago um, and were able to come up with seven additional case studies to cover the missing knowledge areas here as well as the additional case, uh, the additional knowledge areas that Cyborg has now on applied cryptography and uh, such things. Altogether, these are free resources that you are free and welcome to use. Tell us how it works for you. In fact, better yet, write what worked and write about what didn't work. Help us improve this, this uh, resource um, free of charge. Or if you have a contribution yourself, get in touch with us. We'll be happy to include it in the next round. The links down here show the overview document of over all the case studies that exist, as well as, well, the library itself, which you can download right now. Without further ado, that was, that was me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions? I, I saw one question wanting to know if it was free. Yes, indeed. And um, the additional case studies are not out there yet, but hopefully they will be in the next month or so. Yes. Uh, other questions? Everybody's being very quiet. Hi. I have a question. Um, how, how many of the 18 uh, case studies have a real life background such that the students can learn from real failures that happen? It's an excellent question. Um, if I'm not mistaken, um, almost all, uh, with the exception of one or two, uh, which are entirely fictional, um, almost all of them are related to real life failures um, for example, the National Grid SAP introduction was a, was a real life failure and the Mount Gox was a real life failure. And even the driver assistance system is technically a real life thing because um, it uses um, the owner's manual of a popular SUV model that you can actually purchase and you can get the, download the user manual for free. And the case study asks students to work with real life car documents really. So um, I would argue, um, Almost all, maybe one or two don't. Uh, 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 Elka, a lot of them, if I can jump in here for a second and change roles, a lot of them um, are sanitized if they actually, you know, if there was an actual hack. But in, in some cases, in the early phases of the life cycle, we might have been looking at, at real systems, but a, a hack hadn't occurred and, and we successfully anticipated the hack and foreclosed that, that possibility. So to some extent, it varied depending on what part of the life cycle the case studies were aimed at. I better stop answering questions. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I was asking because um, uh, I'm using case studies in requirements engineering and so my case study I'm still using is 30 years old, which is the inquiry in the LAAC, the uh, a failure. Uh, that's that's because um, companies don't want to make the failures public, so they, you they don't get the the data. But uh, with cybersecurity, it's a bit different because uh, usually public gets uh, get some 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 hints about uh, what, what is happening. Usually with market driven infrastructure uh, software, so. You, you, you will be aware of such uh, failures, uh, um, but with uh, customer-oriented software, uh, usually you will not get these, uh, this data. Yeah, it's the, yeah. That's, that's true. And that's one of, one of the things that I struggle in my research quite a bit with, right? It's like the um, companies don't like to, to tell you when, they are, um, when, when their systems are unsafe. On the other hand, many cybersecurity issues become relatively quickly public knowledge. And uh, from what I've seen, other authors, not only the case studies that I wrote, but also the case studies other authors wrote, heavily rely on popular media and website and reports from, um, like from uh, you know, uh, Kaspersky, for example. They are a very good resource to find about cybersecurity issues. Well, I guess I have to put myself back into the moderator role. 
much as I enjoyed talking about this topic and move on to the next speaker. Um, and please, if, if you have further questions, uh, contact me, Bastian or Ann, and we'll be glad to, or all of us, and we'll be glad to answer them. Uh, so our next speaker is Joel Kaufman, who is an associate professor at the US Air Force Academy. He teaches a variety of courses, computer science, databases, and software engineering. He'll be presenting the paper, Using a CTF activity to teach cloud and web security. Uh, it's a joint paper written with students from Johns Hopkins University. So, uh, Joel, if you're ready to screen share and um, unmute your microphone, we're all set. All right. Can people hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so thank you very much for that introduction. I'll be uh, talking about some work. Uh, I teach part-time for Johns Hopkins and a team of students created a nifty assignment in summer of 2020, which I used in a course that I taught last spring. And so that's talking about uh, those results as part of uh, this presentation. So, uh, as stated previously, um, right, cloud misconfigurations are very common. In the latter half of 2019, three of the companies uh, that were had cloud-related security misconfigurations are listed on the slide, and these affected uh, well over 100 million individuals, releasing uh, private information, including credit card applications, social security numbers, and even text messages that were sent privately between uh, individuals. Now, my students at Johns Hopkins, if, as part of a course that I was teaching uh, in summer of 2020, they uh, hypothesized mm -hmm. that one of the reasons that these types of misconfigurations are common, and we keep seeing them in the news, is a lack of educational resources. And so as they dug into this, they looked at curriculum guidelines and found cloud and web computing uh, I'm sorry, cloud computing and web security are typically elective courses. And at least at the undergraduate level, the learning outcomes only require familiarity with very important topics, such as risks and benefits of outsourcing to the cloud and describing various types of vulnerabilities. Um, conspicuously absent, we might say, is how do students learn how to secure these applications um, so that these types of attacks aren't occurring uh, as frequently as they are. The students also looked at existing courses um, where they found that most courses at the undergraduate and graduate level focused on building, but not so much securing applications. So in an introductory course, many times security is completely omitted. Um, and they also noticed a lot of instances where best practices are ignored where something as important as identity and access management would be the exact would be the very last uh, module or lesson in a course, meaning students were using administrative account access in order to do everything uh, for a project in the interim. Um, in addition, a lot of these courses are more theoretical than uh, applied. And so there's very limited number of hands-on activities. Uh, the students decided, as I mentioned previously, to create uh, what they called a nifty assignment. And the idea was they would create a capture the flag activity hosted on Amazon Web Services. And this would be centered around the premise of an online election platform. And anyone with basic knowledge of web applications and cloud services could presumably attack this application and realize the real life uh, implications of security misconfigurations. And so the students created this website um, and they actually presented the uh, platform itself <laughs> as part of a work in progress paper at Frontiers in Education in 2021, um, but they were unable to collect uh, data on how effective this was in terms of uh, 
uh, teaching students. And so that's where I became much more involved due to my role as a full-time faculty member at the uh, United States Air Force Academy. Um, in terms of that CTF, uh, all the vulnerabilities are based on the OWASP top 10 list. And uh, you can see a quick rundown of the things that a participant would have to do. Uh, hints are provided for all of these. Again, it's designed to be an introductory capture the flag activity. Um, so we pretty much tell them you need to uh, use an SQL injection in order to compromise this web form. Um, we don't tell them exactly how to conduct that attack, but we're pretty clear in pointing them to resources uh, so that they can work through this activity in the matter of one to two hours is what we estimate. Um, so in terms of the evaluation of the effectiveness in teaching cloud and web security concepts, uh, I integrated this CTF activity in a course that I taught last year at the United States Air Force Academy. It was CompSci 364, databases and applications, had 38 students, and we cover a series of lessons on web development and also touch at the very end of the course on cloud computing concepts. Um, from prior semesters when I had taught this course, uh, students had generally struggled to defend web applications. Um, and by that, I mean a lot of times they would remember to secure most of their forms against SQL injection, but they would uh, miss a number of them. And so um, what I wanted to see was, is this CTF activity effective in helping them uh, improve the security of code that they're actually writing as part of the class. Um, now to make sure that there wasn't coercion, we offered the CTF activity as extra credit. There was an alternative activity that required students to research and summarize OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities uh, or risks, I should say. And um, they could do either of these in order to replace a lower quiz grade that they may have earned previously in the course. Um, starting into some of our results here, um, we asked students their initial self-perceptions. Um, and the first four questions are really control questions. Um, and we had 25 students out of 40 respond, or 30, 25 out of 38 students respond to this pre-survey. Um, these first four are really control questions uh, because these are all topics that we cover in the course. Um, and so we would expect students to say that they were fairly familiar with them. But the latter four questions focus on really web security concepts that we were interested in. And here we see students are much less certain about how to compromise a vulnerable web application and also how they should defend web applications against attacks. Um, interestingly, that next to last uh, statement that they recognize the importance of defending web applications most students do agree, or they say that they agree with that statement. Um, and so that's really a measure of the theoretical piece, right? They, they agree it's reasonable or something important that they should do, but not necessarily that they know how to do it at this point. We also asked them to identify whether or not they were interested in these extra credit activities um, before we actually offered them. Um, 15 out of 25, so 60% said that they were interested in the CTF activity. A much lower percentage said they were interested in that OWASP activity requiring them to summarize risks. Um, when it actually came time for them to participate, we saw the participation numbers were very similar to uh, this survey. About 40% of the class did the CTF activity, just under 20% did the alternative activity. And scores were fairly comparable across both of these. Um, people, some students did get stuck on the CTF or were unable to find or exploit one of the vulnerabilities. Um, and so it's a little bit lower, but all the students did benefit from the extra credit. So our research questions are summarized here on this slide. Um, the first is how does a CTF activity affect students' self-perception of their abilities? The second is, can we actually independently assess that and verify it using test questions and their class project that they were working on as, as teams? 
And then the last are whether or not they enjoyed and thought that the activity was valuable and would recommend it to others. And so on the next couple of slides, I'm going to walk through these with the results that we found. So the first is students' self-assessment of learning. And what you're looking at is a pairing of students who completed both the pre and post survey and did the CTF activity. And so unfortunately, we didn't have universal participation in these surveys. Uh, students could do one, but not the other, but we asked them to do both obviously, but if they didn't fill it out, we have limited data. Um, so of those students who did, right, you can see that there is a marked shift towards the right where students are saying that they uh, can better uh, both exploit and in many cases defend applications. That third question as well, recognizing the importance of defending web applications using defensive programming, whereas most students agreed with that statement previously, all but one after completing the CTF said that they strongly agree with that. And so completing a CTF, even in a fairly contrived environment where they know it's made up, um, right, it still seems to drive home many of the lessons that we're talking about uh, other times in the semester by putting it in a real world context for the students. Um, unfortunately, we don't see nearly the same improvement uh, when we look at independently assessed uh, learning outcomes. So this graph is showing a number of test questions related to identifying vulnerabilities, uh, inputs that will exploit an SQL injection, and how to successfully mitigate an attack against a web application. And for most of these, CTF participants performed similarly to students who did not do any of the extra credits. Um, there's a little bit of improvement for the mitigations, but this is not a statistically significant difference, unfortunately. Um, when we look at the class project, uh, the results are actually worse for the CTF participants, interestingly enough. Um, students who were on a team that didn't have any CTF participants earned on average 75% credit on the web security or the security rubric of the, pro or sorry, the security subscore of the final project rubric, whereas uh, we don't see nearly as high achievement for the CTF participants. Now, with these results, I feel that I do need to caveat them. There's lots of potential confounding factors. Um, which I will get into when I talk about some of the future work that I hope to do this current semester. Um, students' impressions of the activity were fairly favorable. So we asked them if they thought it was valuable, challenging, enjoyable, and whether or not they would recommend it to others. Um, and this is all in comparison to that alternative OWASP activity. Again, estimated, both of these were estimated to be one to two hours of total time. Um, but there's a statistically significant difference for everything but the challenge of the activity. Um, and I actually think that this is a fascinating result um, because the OWASP activity is essentially just summarizing information that you can find readily on the OWASP website, Wikipedia, other online resources. But apparently the act of writing is surprisingly challenging for computer science majors. Um, as a result, right? That's one conclusion that we, we might draw from this. Um, but overall students were very positive in terms of the CTF activity. So to summarize those research questions uh, briefly here, um, there was a statistically significant difference in self-perception of participants ability, but we don't see that when we independently assess it. But again, when we compare it to an alternative activity that covers the same topics, we see a statistically significant increase in the perceived value, um, uh, enjoyment, and also whether or not students would want to recommend this activity to others. So to conclude, um, students did deem the CTF activity valuable and enjoyable. Overwhelming percentage would recommend it to others but it really didn't improve students' learning to the degree that we hoped. Um, in terms of future work, um, our limited data uh, does limit our ability to uh, understand some of these factors. And so I hope to repeat this 
in the current semester at the US Air Force Academy where I'm teaching another group of uh, 35 students this semester, same course. Um, and one of the small changes that I'm making is I'm going to try to improve the alignment between the CTF activity and the course outcomes. Because right now, when the assessment questions that we used to independently assess, they're very uh, coarse and fairly granular. And so hopefully by tweaking them a little bit, we can actually identify things that they are learning as part of that CTF activity. The other thing I'd like to be able to do is investigate the potentially confounding factors like background, demographic data, or performance in the course. Um, it's entirely possible that our results are skewed because students who wanted to do the extra credit were already performing worse, and therefore they did better than they would have otherwise uh, when we independently assess them, but it wasn't enough to overcome uh, where they were previously compared to their peers who chose not to do this, uh, either of the extra credit activities because they didn't need to, uh, or felt they didn't need to to earn the grade that they wanted. So hopefully we'll be able to collect more data and understand more about where this CTF activity is particularly useful. Um, and that is my last slide. So I will stop sharing that. And I see some comments in the uh, chat, um, but also answer questions. I'd like to jump in with a, a quick comment before I turn the floor over to everybody else. And that is uh, perhaps one of the confounding issues is that students may be working toward a certain grade point average and if they think they're doing okay in your course, they may not put in the extra effort to get that A grade rather than a B grade or whatever, and rather focus on something else because they, they feel comfortable with the grade that they have. Uh, and without looking at all those, those factors, it, it's hard to assess what the reasons are. Just my opinion. So with that, um, I'll be quiet and let anyone else Make anyone um, go go ahead and address the things that were in the chat, Joel. Uh, yes, so I see a question about where did they get the vulnerability. Um, the students from Johns Hopkins actually seeded the vulnerabilities in the application that they created. Um, so that would, they were all by design. Um, another comment was, um, yes, a CTF activity doesn't actually teach uh, how to secure uh, a, an application against those same types of attacks. That's something else that I'm uh, working on for this semester to make that connection a little bit stronger with the CTF and, and what's covered in the rest of the course. Um, and um, the statement is, is well taken. Um, I was doing my best in coordination with what the students at Johns Hopkins had created to find a way to collect data on its effectiveness. Um, and so yes, right, again, it's not a perfect tie-in with some of the other things that we were looking at uh, in the course itself. Great. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I'm sure like everybody else, we'll be glad to entertain um, questions and comments later on. Uh, with that, we'll move on to the, um, the next speaker who is probably dealing with a big time difference in being with us here today. And that is Farhad Alam Boyan, who is the head of data team at Prava and also an adjunct faculty member at Green University in Bangladesh. He's presenting the paper, Tools and Techniques Adapted for Teaching Software Engineering Topics Remotely During the COVID-19 Pandemic, which as we know is still with us. And that's why we are all remote instead of on site in Hawaii. So far, it's all yours, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for the introduction. And yes, uh, pretty early good morning for everyone from Bangladesh. So yeah, our paper title is Tools and Techniques Adapted for Teaching Software Engineering Topics Remotely During the COVID-19 Pandemic. I'm Farhad on behalf of the team presenting this 
uh, paper. Yeah, so the motivation we got uh, for this paper uh, that because so software engineering education and training is actually uh, those topics are generally project based and mostly team oriented and requires lots of lots of uh, human interactions among the among different stakeholders. And sadly, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, classes switches from in-person to remote uh, online modality. So yeah, so instruct instructors did not have much choice but to adapt new tools, techniques, teaching environments. In, I mean, it's, it's also in an ad hoc basis without proper training, right? So yeah, that's the motivation we got and we tried to come up with some of uh, questions that what tools and techniques did seed educators adapt to handle some of those uh, transition challenges and what lesson uh, did seed educators learn and what are the improvement suggestions that they can give. So as we, we already know that the in this digitized world, the online teaching is already existed before this uh, pandemic. So all of our related work uh, is related to online and uh, distance learning. So we gave all the uh, related reference papers on this uh, distance learning. And, uh, and that range actually from software engineering education to also the other subject areas. So to come up with the setup, so we actually first uh, try to uh, contact the participants from international conferences um, uh, between 2019 and 2020. And we actually requested them for an interview on a semi-structured uh, Zoom interview actually. And we actually uh, made some criteria uh, for for that uh, for those interviewees. So they have to taught an in university level seat course during the pandemic, and previously taught that same course in person, and had to switch to remote online mode due to the pandemic. So we actually interviewed. Uh, uh, 16 uh, educators and they were from 11 different countries across five continents. They were 35 minutes long and we actually uh, get their consent to record those videos. And the educators were across, you know, uh, from lecturers to the full professors. And we actually, uh, enable that feature of uh, Zoom's auto transcriptions. So based on the survey questions, we actually, you know, uh, divided in three parts, three sections. So we had some questions, some basic demography and background related questions, and uh, questions regarding their experiences, challenges, and tools that they use to overcome teaching or taking uh, those courses online, and we ask for their suggestions. So all those uh, survey questions and responses for this paper is uh, linked in this presentation. Uh, yeah, so uh, the survey duration, we, uh, we actually randomly picked uh, two universities from each country to send out more than uh, 380 emails soliciting survey participation from both the educators and the students. Our surveys were open for uh, three weeks, um, the late September of 2020. And the results were uh, pretty much good because 320 survey participants, uh, uh, participants were uh, actually took the survey. So among them, 268 had actually thought or taken a seat course online during the pandemic, yielding an approximate 84% uh, completion rate. So the educator student issue was 16, 80, uh, 16, 84%, uh, 
uh, among the educators, 58% of educators had their first time online teaching experiences. And among the students, 66% of the students had their first time online class experiences. So among the educators, 72% were male, 28% were female, and they were highest from the USA. Students were 80% male, and they were highest from Germany. Educators identified their courses as mainly sophomore or junior level courses. And uh, class sizes range from five to 700 students with a median of 91. So as you can see, uh, the tools uh, for, I mean, for the online classes, video conferencing tools is the most important uh, tool. So as you can see the results uh, and among the survey questions, the options were, you know, to choose multiple uh, options because uh, since we, uh, since the switch of teaching modality was abrupt and most of the educators did not have proper prior training, many were forced to adopt a tool in a trial and error approach. So in our interviews, we came across several educators who reported that they started with one tool and later, be it for a lack of features or support or not knowing the full potential had switched into the others. Therefore, all of our survey questions regarding tools and techniques, we allowed multiple selection of options. So as you, you can see here, 65% uh, of uh, the participants said that they use Zoom. That not necessarily means that exclusively they use Zoom. They might have uh, chosen other video conference tools also. And for learning management system, uh there was the highest was other other is actually consists of many open source tools and 27 percent were actually developed by the university itself and there was canvas google classroom also was there and interestingly seven percent was uh when didn't use any learning management system the student perspective where 68 persons were agreed that they liked recorded live lectures and uh, they love to, uh, I mean, 52% among them was uh, fond of real time lectures. And there was a, there is a concept of flip class where, you know, before the class, uh, we actually upload the pre-recorded lecture so that during the class, uh, students get themselves to ask more questions. And on the teacher perspective, they actually liked the live real-time lectures and uh, that the number is 61% and 39% uh, where uh, they liked actually, uh, they want to record live lectures and post it later. Same goes for the flip class. The changes educators made for remote online classes that they gave 30, around 31% gave extra time for homework and other assignment things. They actually, uh, among them, 20, almost 29% change homework and quiz. And among them, 24% actually gave shorter lectures. And yeah, that's the pretty much high numbers. And the perspective, uh, I mean, the change students prefer for uh, remote online classes that they, among them, 36% actually uh, want, uh, prefer shorter lectures. And 25% actually uh, prefer extra time for homework and quiz activities. And 13% actually uh, wanted to have some easy on the grading systems. And the other numbers are there back. So the suggestions from instructors and students are given in a table, but they are mostly similar because students uh, wants the thing, uh, every class and lectures make it to online, but teachers wants uh, clear guideline policy and direction from university to make their life easier. 
students and teachers both want shorter classes. And interestingly, students one, uh, they actually prefer final project instead of exams because, um, I, I mean, this kind of online exam is actually exhausting for both students and teachers. And teachers prefer pre recorded videos. And yeah, there you go, actually. So, as uh, we can see here, that like any other online service, our study is also prone to many other possible limitations. For example, we filtered out participants if they did not participate in uni university level seat courses online during this pandemic. But there is always the possibility that someone who did not fit our inclusion criteria figured it out and took the survey the second time and introduced noise in the data. Moreover, since the survey questions were in English, many non-English speaking participants may not have understood or misunderstood a question and provided altered input. So uh, as the sample size for education were very small, 16% of the total 300 plus participants and majority of the participants were from North America. We couldn't find much participation from countries from South America, Middle East, Africa, or Asia. And the female participations were, for both the educators and students were pretty much low. So with these limitations, we acknowledge that this study and its finding may have missed many important observations, challenges, and limitations and the corresponding tools and techniques to handle them. The, uh, I mean, uh, after this, uh, uh, I mean, the discussion, we find out that from the both uh, educators and students, internet problem is one of the bottlenecks, but that's the, not the main one. The integrity issues during the exam is another one. And there are some legal obligations, uh, um, I mean, that's mostly, I guess, from uh, Europe area that teachers cannot ask students to turn on their camera during the class. And there were some positive aspects where there also, uh, uh, there were more uh, interaction between uh, the students of um, I mean, who are shy during, you know, in person and students get got better preparation for remote job. And some educators reported better overall student grades, as well as student evolution of teaching was much, much, much better. So overall, the seat educators are doing well in adapting the changes that reflect students' expectations and needs. I guess, yeah, I, I mean, that's all from my side. And we would like to sincerely thank all of the interview participants for their valuable time during this pandemic in virtually sitting down with us, with us, discussing and sharing their experiences. We want to also thank all of the survey participants for their valuable feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Um, questions, comments? Bastian, you have your hand up. Oh, I was using the clapping hands reaction. But, ah. um, <laughs> but anyways, I, I, since, since I'm since I'm here, I have a question. Um, so, g given given these uh, the tools and techniques, if in your opinion, um, someone were to, um, what is the most critical critical advice you would give to people who had to transition their course to online instruction? I think I think. Uh... I mean, for a particular country, I think there has to be some regulation from the university side. I mean, universities have to work together to make a guideline, you know, for the for all the teachers so that um, they can come up with a good, uh, I mean, good way to deal this transition, right? Okay, thank you. Well, I was asking about, you know, if, if someone said, Bastian, do your course online. And I said, okay, boss. And then what should I do? Given someone gave me, gave me guidance, what should I do? 
I mean, your paper is called tool, tool, Tools and Techniques, right? So what, which tool and technique do you find is most critical? I mean, choosing the learning management system is the most critical part because, you know, that's need. I mean, we can choose any uh, video conferencing tool, but the most critical part is to choose the learning management system because, yeah, I mean, it's, it's I think, he who chooses a um, LMS system, he needs to, I mean, find out, I know, I mean, that's actually very person to person, you know. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, excellent talk. Uh, we will move on to the fourth speaker in this session, Dr. Otto Borchardt. Assistant Professor of Computer Information Science at Missouri Southern State University. He will be presenting the paper, Scaffold SQL, using Parsons problems to support database pedagogy. Otto, thank you. Uh, thanks, Nancy. So my talk is going to look at a project right, that I've been developing over a couple of years now, uh, but have gone through some more recent advancements, so Scaffold SQL. Uh, kind of the outline of my talk, if I had the right thing, here we go. Um, I'll start with a background of kind of who I am and why I kind of came to this sort of conclusion. Um, we'll look at some previous approaches towards teaching database concepts, uh, specifically writing SQL queries. Um, and then we'll take kind of the novel approach that I've got here is to in essence add what are called Parsons problems um, into database pedagogy and take a look at that. Um, then I'll go through just a quick overview of what Scaffold SQL is. And uh, despite my better judgment, I'm gonna try and give a live demo uh, of the software. So you can take a look and see at, um, see what it looks like. Then I'll give some anecdotal feedback, which was not included in the paper, um, but was excellent feedback from the reviewers. And I just wanted to say just a little bit, I don't have any like concrete quantitative data or anything like that, but um, we'll talk about doing that in my uh, future directions. So that started here. Um, so I teach um, CIS Computer Information Science 310, which is our database management systems class. It's actually the third semester that a student usually takes. So they'll take programming one, they take programming two, and then they come into my class. Um, and so the idea is that they're going to start learning SQL, um, data manipulation language kinds of things. So select queries, uh, inserts, updates, deletes, that kind of thing. And then take that information and apply it towards, uh, we use C Sharp as our introductory language. And so taking that information and putting it into, uh, an S, uh, into a C Sharp application. Um, and a little bit about my background. When I took databases as a undergrad and graduate student, I think I took three different classes and they were all theory-based. I think I wrote three SQL statements my entire undergrad grad career. Um, and I'm teaching at Missouri Southern. Um, the students there are, we'll say less math inclined, right? So I felt uncomfortable kind of teaching them things like relational algebra, relational calculus, set theory as sort of this background, right? I wanted to kind of jump in, look at some applied things, try and make the course more interesting for them. I, and so the very beginning of this project looks back at uh, summer of 2019 when I developed a uh, interactive textbook in a platform called Top Hat. Uh, and the idea is that students would be able to, in essence, answer a series of SQL quer um, queries on something a little bit more interesting. You might be wondering, well, why do you write a textbook? There's plenty of SQL textbooks. Um, the ones that I found were, they had a lot of business examples. So nothing, nothing wrong with business examples, right? Employee, uh, department, things like that, right? Um, but again, I'm trying to increase interest in the students. And so I used uh, game-based examples. It was a text-based uh, using game-based examples for developing these SQL queries, right? Um, the problem is that when the first iteration, if you will, there wasn't a lot of feedback. So there's an example of a question down at the bottom that would have been answered, asked in that first iteration. Right, uh, write a query that displays all the invoice items. This happens to be a business type question, but um, they're less than 99 cents. Right? Um, and the student would answer the question, right? and many of the times they would be correct. Right, The, the answer would be right, 
but Top Hat would only allow a certain number of answers that could be checked against. And you can imagine that so if there's a you know explosion of number of possible correct answers to this question, right? You have to put the uh, columns in the right order. You have to make sure any kind of equalities they are commutative properly, um, all that kind of stuff. And so I ended up putting one or two answers, and the students would get frustrated, right? And like they're like, well, that that's that seems right to me, and it it seems to come up with the right answers. And so uh, I would manually grade them, right? They would all get their points and all that kind of good stuff. But uh, it, it left me um, feeling uh, not not quite. I, I wasn't meeting their expectations, right? And so you go and uh, my approach was to dive into the literature a little bit, right? So what kinds of approaches are there for uh, SQL teaching right now, right? And some of these are older systems and that's okay. Um, this is uh, X data, uh, not, I should say right away that this is not an exhaustive uh, review of all possible uh, SQL pedagogy uh, things, but just a couple to kind of guide towards how I got to scaffold SQL. And so this was getting a lot closer to what I wanted to do, right? So there's a instructor query that's up at the top, a student query down in the middle there, um, and it would sort of grade things for you. And I thought, hey, that would be that would be fantastic. I, um, the problem is it required, um, first of all, it was old. I couldn't actually, I don't think I actually found a uh, implementation of this one. And it required quite a bit of server side uh, implementation for it. And I wanted that to be kind of easy, right? I, I teach four or five classes a semester. And so trying to make sure that I could do something and, and not have to worry too much about it was a goal of mine. So there's that. Uh, another one, uh, SQL Tutor. Uh, you can tell this one's a little bit older. The, the Firefox screenshot or Netscape, sorry, Netscape Navigator screenshot there is pretty old. Uh, but it still kind of got to the point of, of something that I was looking at. So how do we try and reduce student cognitive load when they're trying to write these SQL statements? And you can kind of see it gives you the select from where and I'll group by uh, having an order by all in the correct order and everything. So they just sort of have to fill in the right-hand side, which uh, decreases the amount of, uh, like I said, cognitive load that they have to have. It had the same kinds of problems that XDATA does, right? You have to have some kind of backend server infrastructure um, and that kind of um, thing. So, so those are, you know, other things. Now, heard in relatively recent conference that I went to about Parsons problems, right? Um, the idea behind Parsons problems is that they are used typically to teach imperative programming, right? So if you wanna learn how to, uh, it's a way to reduce cognitive loads, learning languages like Java or like C Sharp, like we do here, or um, Python, things like that. Um, and the idea is, you can see a screenshot down there at the bottom. The idea is that you take individual lines of code, code and click and drag them into the appropriate places on the right-hand side, put them in the right order, um, click on check me, right? You get immediate feedback. Again, something else I was looking for in a uh, database teaching solution. And like I said, this is typically used for imperative programming. So the idea was, well, what if we use this inside of uh, teaching SQL? And that is uh, the idea behind scaffold SQL. So a student starts in that middle uh, grid there, Right, so they'll start by writing out an SQL query of some kind, right? So select blah from blah, right? And it will run that SQL query against a series of test cases. So does the data that comes out of their query match the test cases that uh, I added ahead of time? Right? If it doesn't, right, it gives them that feedback. Again, sort of this immediate feedback, well, that's not right because it's not returning the correct, the, the data that it's expecting. Uh, if they get it wrong often enough, or if they click on a hint button, what happens is they'll go down to the bottom box there, right, where uh, they can answer a Parsons problem, right? So now they're given some structure where they were trying to do it free form before. I right? put everything in the correct order, right? Click on buttons in order to change uh, options, which we'll see here in a second. And, you know, ideally at the end of that, they're able to finish. Right? Um, there are a couple other pieces that I'm gonna try and go through really quick because I know I might end up over time here. Uh, there is a tracking database, which will, in essence, track which of those um, questions they finish or not. Uh, on the right-hand side, there is a question maker interface. It's sort of a standalone thing. It's kind of difficult to create these test cases, um, create the Parsons problem test case as well. So there's kind of two different sets of um, things that need to be created in order to use the system. Right? So, uh, I mean, block diagrams are fun and everything, but I figure it helped to kind of take a look at, like I said, a live demo here of what this looks like. 
So if we, I'm gonna pull tab over to, let's look at this. So this is in essence scaffold 1.1. So this is actually a top hat tool. Uh, and down here at the bottom is a particular question that I'm asking the student about how to do a cross join. Uh, and the idea is that the student has a interpreter built into the textbook. So I'm gonna scroll up here, don't get nauseous. <laughs> right. And I try to use my keyboard instead, there it goes. Right. And so they are able to run an SQL query against this game database, right, which has in this particular question, there's a set of guilds that a uh, player can belong to, um, their items in the guild treasury, right? So trying to make it yeah, more interesting for them. And if I just hit execute right now, so sort of the, the default SQL query I have in here, we're gonna fail all the test cases. And you can kind of see, right, well, a bunch of red here, it obviously didn't answer the question, um, but we can see the results of what performing that SQL query uh, on the database that we have um, would do. This is a fairly late, it's on you see it's kind of episode six. So this is a little bit later on in the, uh, in the, in the classroom setting. But right, we can, what we do is we can think about how a student might answer this. Well, I have to do a cross join, so I can start with something like that, right? That's obviously not right, right? It's gonna give us way too many answers, but it kind of points to that we can see that we're getting closer, right? It's in essence saying, well, this first one's good where there are too many rows, we got the right number of columns, the names of the columns are correct and they're in the right order. Um, but then we're failing on the actual data is what's down here. Okay. Fast forward of 11 tests. So we're getting a little bit closer. Um, so the next step a student might do is I need to make sure that this uh, is, uses a particular guild name. So I looked at the question before, Let me run that. Again, a little bit more, but again, this is a fairly common student error is that there isn't a um, join condition in this particular query, right? So in essence, we're getting the full, all possible combinations here. And so again, we got way too many rows. Go ahead and add that in here. Where guilds got guild ID equals guild treasury. And hopefully I spelled everything right. There we go. Right? And the idea is that when they're all the way done, what they get now is a code word, right? So what I call a secret word. Right? So there's this bloom word here, which we only got once we correctly answered everything. And that is what we put down inside of this answer blank here. So I'm no longer, you're no longer grading individual SQL queries. You're grading whether they ended up getting to that keyword or not. Um, and so that's, uh, 1.1, right? So, and this would, I should say, talk a little bit more about how the class works. So this uh, interface is actually given before class, right? Because there's, um, they can kind of guide themselves along to getting the correct answer. So they get some, um, so you get some practice, right? Um, before they come to class, where I give them the more open-ended kinds of questions like the invoice items questions we saw earlier um, in, in class, right, sort of the flipped approach where you're doing more complex things out of class and learning about the initial material in class. And so that's that's 1.1. And then 1.2, which I haven't actually used in class yet, is right here, right? Um, looks the same, get a little bit bigger. Um, this, so this exact is in essence exactly the same, right? The uh, execute button will run the test cases. You'll be able to see the results at the bottom. But right in this case, there's a hit button, right? Which will take them to what the Parsons problem looks like. And again, now they don't have to try and remember all this extra syntax, right? They have sort of the syntax here, but they have to try and think about what belongs in what order and what things do we click on here in order to um, get the correct SQL query. So I can pull this over here, select from where, and this is actually an and right here. And we can click on this and it will cycle through the various choices for what columns to show. Um, inside of here, we get the um, various tables that can occur. Right? So we're in essence doing the, this is the same query as uh, we saw the free form there. And we can put in, you know, there's different choices here. I'm clicking on this. Uh, so maybe check and make sure that the IDs match instead of the item ID and the guild ID, which you sometimes see. Right. And then again, we got the different logical operators and checking to make sure that students put um, quotation marks around strings, right? that kind of thing. Right. And so in essence, what happens is a student can is gets 
hints about the syntax, right? And it actually executes the, this query now against the very same set of test cases uh, of the previous one. And one thing that's a little bit interesting about this is that they get a different code word here um, for whether they finish the uh, Parsons problem or whether they finish the free form answer. Right? And so this gives us a little bit of, my ultimate idea would be that you wouldn't necessarily need the internet to do this, right? You could actually use these code words as a way to uh, have some kind of way of uh, telling the instructor, hey, I finished this one or this one because you've had different words that you were using. Right? Um, so that's kind of the two different interfaces. Like I said, this is this I have not used in a classroom before. It is the, the new thing I wanted to try. Um, developed primarily by capstone uh, students that my uh, co-author has uh, worked with. So let's my demo. Um, like I said, just a little bit of anecdotal feedback. And, uh, I'd like to say they, they definitely appreciate that immediate kind of feedback from the textbook. So uh, I got way less complaints, right? Well, the very first time I did this, I had the manual grading and needing to make sure their queries were right and they did not like that, <laughs> right? So being able to have this sort of more immediate, oh yeah, I got this, this I got this right, um, was more uh, useful for them. Uh, and again, another sort of anecdotal feedback that when I, I mentioned that the capstone students uh, in my co-authors, uh, co uh, institution had built some of this and they're like, man, I wish I had this to work with when I was learning SQL, right? Um, and so those are kind of the anecdotal things. Um, but, right, see that I do definitely want to have a, more of an experiment. I'll teach the class again this coming spring um, where I'll integrate that, uh, the Parsons problems into the, into my classroom. Um, we'll take a look at things like, well, how often do students need to go back to the Parsons problem? Is there a difference in how students do if they if they have to go to the Parsons problem or um, just being in the free form? So there's all different kinds of ways we could look at um, just and looking at how they it is just their attitudes towards um, the scaffold SQL project. Uh, and so that's my hope, sort of the immediate term uh, um, directions. Uh, but also being able to have some kind of learning management system integration or integration into more than just sort of top hat, which is what I've got right now. Uh, kind of organizing these secret words. So if there was a, a case where I want to do this using without having an internet connection, um, being able to organize large batches of these secret words would be difficult. So adding some kind of system like that. Um, you can also imagine making this even more interesting for students by building some kind of gamification interface for the secret words. So I don't know if any of you have uh, used a Mad Lib before, right? But there's like a story and then there's a blank with a, a, a type in there. So uh, start of the story, underscore noun, right? And so in essence, you could take those secret words and plug them into this Mad Lib that the students would in essence learn the story as they go through and their story would change a little bit depending on whether they did the uh, free form answer or whether they did the Parsons problem answer. Uh, other possibilities would be to create sort of standalone modules. So this is definitely integrated into a course, but could you um, use it separately to sort of um, tell whether someone understood the, the SQL concepts or not? And then integration with other tools. So there's other things in the literature review that I found that looked really interesting, um, but I haven't integrated them at all. So things like visualizing SQL queries, right? How does a join look like? Right? How does the data actually put together? Uh, another interesting one was taking an SQL query um, and then in essence, the software product would create a natural language, would, would actually translate it to English. Um, and so that was kind of an interesting kind of concept too. So trying to figure out what combinations of tools, right, would work best for um, teaching SQL um, queries. So uh, I think that's it. Yep. It is an open source project. If you want to take a look at um, my GitHub repository for um, the students have been using, it's still there. Well, if there are questions, my email address is there, but also obviously I'm willing to entertain any questions that you have now as well. So um, thank you. I don't thank you very much. Uh, we've um, actually overlapped quite a bit into the, the next session. Oops. So I think we're going to have to hold questions or perhaps uh, chat offline so that I can hand off to my co-chair, Elka. Um, a live demo is always interesting, but sometimes it, it does put us a little <laughs> bit behind. So I'll hand off to Elka, who is going to be moderating for the remaining set of speakers in the IQSI uh, mini track. Thanks.
Thank you, Nancy. So welcome to the last session of today. Uh, we will have three papers. And the first one will be given by Philip Garrison, uh, who is uh, studying information and communication technologies for development, which is a new uh, study program at the University of uh, Washington. And we'll hear um, uh, about the uh, deferring social impact conceptions of ICTD and computing careers from the perspective of students. So uh, what we heard from, from Ian uh, today, uh, maybe we will hear similar things, uh, what, what, what is expected from, from us uh, uh, from the point of uh, students. Uh, well, if it's boring what we are doing or not. So the floor is yours, Philip, just share your screen and uh, maybe you can stick with uh, the 10 minutes presentation such that we have uh, still five minutes for, for discussion. All right, can you see my slides here? Yes. All right, thanks so much for having us and thanks everyone for being here. So the study is in collaboration with Lucy Pai from the University of California, Irvine. Uh, she studies tech for good initiatives and she is also here today. So um, for the last couple of years, I've been mentoring students who contribute to, uh, they contribute code to an open source project that my advisor leads. And our focus here is on their experiences. So, um, the study is about uh, students working on this cold chain information system. Cold chain here means the refrigeration equipment used for vaccines. Uh, I guess that used to be unknown jargon, but uh, maybe it's a, a bit more visible with the pandemic now. Um, it's an open source data collection and visualization platform for managing cold chain equipment. Um, it's the, I guess, the subject of my uh, thesis work. This project actually started from a, a sabbatical that my advisor did at a global health NGO. Um, it's kind of a medium-sized project with a substantial code base and collaborators across multiple organizations. We got undergrads involved first through a capstone course that my advisor taught in 2019. Um, at our university, each student needs to take one capstone course. These are usually project-based engineering courses. Um, so this capstone course was about our subfield information and communication technologies for development or ICTD, which combines software engineering, HCI, and international development. Within ICTD, this type of global health software is pretty normal. So uh, a little background on the capstone course. Uh, students there were given choices from a pretty wide set of software engineering problems uh, where there was just one of the groups in the course who chose to build a prototype of a visualization dashboard for this cold chain system. Um, after the capstone course ended, four of the five students who had gotten started on the research uh, project through that continued as research assistants. Um, and then I've personally mentored about eight additional students uh, who weren't connected to the capstone at all uh, over the last couple of years. So uh, as an aside, uh, I'll add that both the in the capstone and in mentoring research assistants, we're doing a lot of what Ian Somerville talked about in the keynote. The, um, the students are building software that they care about. Um, we're you know, I teach them to use Git an issue tracker to write tests for their code. Um, it's a very practical uh, educational experience. And we have some students that are so into it that they continue to stay involved for multiple years. So uh, for this study, we conducted interviews in 2020 with nine of the students. Um, 
and oh, the overall project is still going. There's a much delayed national deployment in Uganda coming up later this month. Um, so, um, oh gosh, sorry, having okay. Um, with that background out of the way, uh, our motivation for this study was to understand what it meant to our students to contribute to the cold chain information system. So that's research question number one, how do undergrads understand their involvement in ICTD research? We're specifically interested in what the students think of this subfield because it's uh, it has these connections to international development and to social good. Our second research question is a little more concrete about their careers. We ask, how do they reason about their career goals in computer science and engineering? Uh, computer science and computer engineering are the two degrees offered in my department. So uh, to keep things short, uh, I will just summarize our findings by discussing four quotes uh, from uh, our students. For more details on the methodology, uh, please take a look at the paper. So one of the students from the capstone told us, it's not like industry because it here meaning uh, their work on the cold chain information system. It's not like in an industry because compared to my previous internship experience, it's kind of different from this one because for this, we kind of work for social good. An ordinary computer science path will be after you graduated, you will be working like a software developer. Um, so the main point here is that uh, she sees ICTD as being about social good and that that's very different from ordinary computing. Um, and this was incredibly consistent across the students. Um, you know, other students, for example, like, described their exposure to work in international development as eye-opening. So uh, they all see ICTD as very distinct. Um, Katie, who these are all pseudonyms, uh, who joined the project after the capstone course was over, uh, made a similar comparison, but took that took it a step further. She told us um, actually that ICTD might be one of the only parts of engineering that aligns with her values. She said that before working on this project, quote. I was considering if I should drop out of engineering because everybody's so into making the next biggest thing to become richer. To me, it's unimportant things to make the world better for people who are rich. And I'm like, oh, maybe I should just not do this because I don't think my values align with the work that I'm doing. So uh, Katie articulated this the most clearly of all of the students. She's very critical of the dominant orientation towards profit and engineering and uh, in telling us the story it really very nearly made her leave and totally change majors um this is related to other research that's argued that uh, minoritized students find this type of tech for good education more compelling um you know that we can have more women in engineering uh, by incorporating this type of uh, work. Um, I guess anecdotally, that kind of matches this uh, project. I mean, this is we're really uh, this is a small study about one group of students doing one project, um, but from so we had nine interviewees. Those they were six women and three men. They're mostly of students of color in a predominantly white university, and they're all very positive about the project. Um, so now to finally get to the, the title of, a pap of the paper, we, we had a curious situation um, among the students where um, they're enthusiastic about ICTD or tech for good work, and they see it as clearly distinct from ordinary software engineering. But almost all of them are planning to get 
what they call an ordinary job. Um, so why is that? Amy continued working on the project uh, after the capstone, and then she graduated, got an engineering job at Microsoft. She told us, I don't know, I'd like to continue doing ICTD. At the career fair, there seemed like there were some companies that had an option like that, but most of them were more not like that. If the opportunity arises, I think that'd be really cool. I don't know, I'm just starting my career. So we'll see where it takes me for a little bit. I was worried about computer science not being fulfilling and feeling like I'm not, like I wouldn't be giving back. So I think if I start to feel that, I might try and return, see what's out there. So here she's really expressing a lot of ambivalence. She's interested, but only if the opportunity arises, but she might be content for now, or maybe she'll find her Microsoft job unfulfilling. So um, this fit into a broader pattern that we saw across most of the students where they described themselves as wanting to have a certain uh, sort of social impact, but uh, deferring that dream until later. So I want to do it, but not right now. A big part of how the students think about this is their perception that there are limited opportunities for software engineering jobs in a social good or international development space. As Priya told us, I also feel like the opportunities in this field are pretty limited as far as I know. I really don't know if I would pursue a PhD or a master's or continue in a lab or continue this research or try to go into industry. So I feel like if I go down the research route, there are so many opportunities for computing and development, but if I go down the industry route, it might be difficult for me to continue this because I don't know if there are a lot of companies. So this is again, kind of echoing what Amy had said that um, because the, you know, they've worked, the students have been working on an academic project. And so it's clear to them that you could do something like this in academia, like I am, or, but um, it seems more difficult to find a job in industry. Um, and I'll add that, I guess, from my experience in the area, there are software jobs uh, in international development, say, but they might be hard to find, they might not pay as much, so. Okay, uh, finally, to get back to answering our research questions, um, in response to the first one, we find that students narrate their involvement in ICTD in terms of social impact. They describe this in contrast to the default values of computing, which several students critiqued for being overly invested in profit and for serving privileged people. The rest of their computing education did little to unsettle this view of software engineering as serving the privileged, and students described their encounters with ICTD as eye-opening. In response to research question two, we find that the students tend to express ambivalence about their career choices. All of the students expressed the hope to continue to combine social impact and computing work, yet they often chose to take mainstream jobs at big tech companies where they were concerned about not being able to make such impact. Several students voiced a plan to defer social impact until a later time when they have more resources and skills and others sought academic paths. So I'd like to thank all of our, uh, all the students who uh, contributed to this, who let us interview them and to all of you for listening. Thanks. Thank you. Um, you already have one question here in the chat, Otto. It was less of a question, more of just sort of a, uh, linking things together. So Ian had talked about the this uh, about younger people staying on teaching, right? And so would maybe the reason that people like me say <laughs> would 
uh, stay teaching, right, is because it's almost more fulfilling, right, rather than sitting in a cubicle, you know, the eight to 10 hours a day uh, to be sitting and helping students for those same eight to 10 hours a day. So it's more of a linking this project with, um, with previous talks more than a question, but really, really great talk. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Otto. But I agree. So, so at least the students uh, think that we uh, faculty members uh, are doing social impact, are having so, <laughs> social impact, <laughs> but uh, don't uh, get much money. <laughs> okay, uh, other comments or questions? You, you just talked to, to, to nine persons, uh, is it why, 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 why only nine persons? You have uh, not that many uh, students uh, doing the courses or what? what's the reason behind that? So we only talked to students who had contributed to this uh, research project. Um, I think there was one other student at the time of the interviews who had contributed who uh, we weren't able to get a hold of, but basically we talked to all of them. Um, we conducted those interviews in 2020, and since then uh, there have been new students who have come and contributed, but um, at the time that was basically all of them. I'm wondering where, where does this data, now that we know all of this, what are we going to do with that? I mean, what what am I... What, what, what's the next step here with this knowledge? Um, well, I don't know what the next step for you is. Uh, one of the next steps for me maybe is um, to, uh, that I'd like to make the students that I work with uh, more aware of the career opportunities in the field. Um, that was sort of one of their their barriers to remaining okay. involved. Um, so I'd like to, to try to help with that. Um, so as, to, to guide advisement for, for these graduating seniors. The, uh, that's, that's one of the options, yeah. I think um, another, another mm, point would be, I guess, to, that I think educators should be thinking about whether and how they want to incorporate uh, tech for good types of projects into their courses. And maybe to know that it might have some successes, but also there are challenges. Okay. Okay, so. Thank you. Thank you. I think if there are no more questions, thank you very much. Well, uh, then we have the next talk about a chatbot tutor can lessen the gender confidence gap in information systems learning. And I think Geraldine will give the talk. Is that true? Yeah. Uh, so um, the authors are all from Brigham Young University and uh, try to share a screen and uh, Tell us about your findings, please. Okay, and we pre-recorded our presentation, so I'm just gonna share the video. Um, can someone tell me if they can see this video screen? Yep. Yep, okay. We're excited to present our research on how a chatbot tutor can lessen the gender confidence gap in IS learning. I am Shirley Levitt, a second year master's student in the Information Systems Program at Brigham Young University and will be presenting my team's research today. To start off, I'll provide a brief background to set the context of our research before diving into our theory and methodology. Afterward, I'll discuss our primary findings and the relevant implications, then wrap it up with an overview of what the next steps look like. The percentage of IT women workers has declined in the past 45 years, 
and the rate of females leaving IT roles is 45% higher than that of men. This problem isn't only seen in the workplace, it's clearly evident in universities as well. For example, of all tech grads, only 25% are female. We hear a lot of similar statistics thrown at us regarding female onboarding and retention within STEM fields. But why is this gender gap emphasized over and over again? Well, the absence of women in any field introduces ethical and moral dilemmas. It limits industry diversity and the inherent benefits that come with it, including positively affecting teams, management, and organizational levels. This gap also suggests that women are likely suffering to some extent if they're leaving. So what explains this gender gap and what can we do about it? A review of research up to this point suggests a myriad of explanations for this gender gap. College and work cultures aren't sufficiently inclusive and female confidence is lower often than male confidence, though performance differences are non-existent. One attempt to explain the confidence level differences between males and females revealed that women often avoid seeking help because doing so may imply incompetence or failure, something women seek harder to avoid than men. In our efforts to help mitigate this gender gap, we ask the question, how can we positively impact female confidence, specifically of IS students? To start off, we decided to introduce another form of help seeking to see what effect it would have on student confidence, namely a chatbot. If IS students have access to a chatbot programming tutor, how will it affect their confidence? More specifically, how will it affect female confidence? In our study design, we measured confidence using creative self-efficacy or CREASE, a construct adapted to the IS field defined as the ability in one, the belief in one's ability to creatively solve unstructured problems. CREASE is composed of five different independent factors. Affect, or the student's emotions and attitude toward, toward creative problem solving. Business skills, a person's knowledge about the current business domain. Technology training, or technical skills. People skills, the ability to collaborate with others to develop solutions. And finally, intelligence, or a student's cognitive ability. We hypothesize that first, chatbot interaction would increase the crease of all students. And secondly, that chatbot interaction would increase the crease of women more than men. Because women often have lower levels of self-efficacy, we believe that providing them with an additional source of help that doesn't expose their uncertainties to other humans will allow them to get the help they seek and consequently boost their self-efficacy. Our target population for this study was, were students enrolled in an IS Intro to Computer Programming class. At the start of the winter 2021 semester, we surveyed 136 students on their level of crease based on a seven point Likert scale, as well as their coding abilities using a series of conceptual and pseudocode questions. We then built a chatbot named Skylar with tutoring capabilities on JavaScript and HTML, which were the topics covered in this programming class and integrated the chatbot to Slack, which was the messaging platform the students used in this course. Chatbot functions included learning about topics, drilling programming concepts, such as what's an array, or how do I code an array, or questions concerning an array, providing practice project ideas, and then finally providing exam reviews for final exams and midterms. Students were made aware of the chatbot upon taking the pre-semester survey and by their instructors at the beginning of the semester. The students interacted with Skylar at their own discretion and individual time spent interacting with the chatbot did not directly affect students' grades. At the end of the semester, students were once again surveyed on their crease levels and reported the time they spent using the chatbot. So what were the results? We were eager to, dis to discover what they were and what the connected implications were. Our study confirmed two results from prior research and discovered two additional and important findings that we want to highlight. First, we confirmed the following. Number one, that women have lower levels of confidence than men in some factors of crease. 
specifically in intellect, people skills, and technology training, but not in attitude or business skills. And then secondly, despite confidence differences between men and women, there aren't any actual performance differences between the genders. Our additional findings revealed that first, chatbots can increase confidence among all IS students. And secondly, that the chatbot interaction had a greater positive effect among the women than among the men. These findings have significant implications for both the way we think in our research and the way we behave in the workplace. The primary implications we want to mention are first, STEM fields similar to IS face a unique gender confidence gap. Men scored higher confidence levels in three of the five dimensions of crease, intellect, people skills, and technology training. The other two dimensions, however, attitude and business skills, showed no difference, suggesting that the nature of the confidence gap in the IS discipline is unique. For example, for a general business major, business skills and attitude will likely contribute to overall self-efficacy. And this study showed that men and women's levels of these two subdimensions of crease showed no difference between the genders, suggesting that both genders are equally confident in those areas. However, a confidence gap does exist between genders in the technology training subdimension of crease, which comprises a significant portion of the IS field, which demonstrates that among IS majors, men likely have higher confidence than women overall. Our second Important implication is that chatbots may help IS programs increase female retention by positively impacting female confidence. So looking ahead, we want to say that, as we mentioned previously, the chatbots, the student chatbot interaction time was self-reported, which is a limitation in our study that we want to eliminate. We're doing another iteration of this study this upcoming winter semester in which chatbot logs will be recorded to a database. We found that confidence was improved in an introductory course, but we're also curious to see if this effect is maintained in more advanced courses in the IS program. Another question that has come up while doing this research is what the long-term effects will be on the help-seeking habits and profiles of students who use chatbots. Will students be equally reluctant to reach out for help from humans if they've learned to rely on chatbots? Or will they be even more willing to get help from any source? And then finally, though we observed a positive correlation between chatbot interaction and confidence, chatbot interaction didn't affect actual coding performance. So in our next iteration of the chatbot, we plan to implement a chatbot with different functionality to observe the effect on coding performance. We're excited to learn more as we continue this research. Thank you so much for your attention. Please reach out to us with any questions you have at profganderson at byu.edu. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, that was in time, so that was nine minutes. Very good. <laughs> Great. The advantage of pre-recording. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, questions, comments. I have, a, yes, I have a question and a comment. Um, so first of all, I really like this work. Um, really nicely done. I'm, I'm the advisor of women in computing at my institution, and I can tell you that you're right. You know, the, I mean, I don't need to tell you. You know that already. But uh, I can attest to the fact that um, confident many, many women um, struggle with confidence in IT degrees. But I'm wondering, I have a question for you about this. Um, I noticed that your chatbot was, was female. What would happen, do you think, if the chatbot was male? So we actually intentionally picked a name that um, is pretty gender neutral. So we didn't give it a gender. And Skylar, it's totally debatable if you consider a girl or a boy. Well, I just finished watching Breaking Bad, so I know I have her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it kind of depends on, like, if I have a friend named Skylar who's a girl, I might already kind of assume that the chatbot is a girl. But in our post-survey, we asked the students if they thought that the chatbot, if they were considerate, male or female, or no gender. And there was pretty consistent responses among um, 
a lot of them considered it men and female evenly. So we thought that was interesting. And that's something that we had considered before implementing the chatbot is if it was a boy or considered male, would females be less likely? And we just kind of wanted to level the ground, at least initially. We and lost you there, Shirley. Oh, there we go. For the last time that we lost you there. You got it? Back. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so we did that intentionally, at least for the first iteration, um, not giving it a gender and letting the students assume their own, the gender that they wanted, so. I think it's really cool. And I think it gives an, a unique opportunity and you're, you're already providing this data, right? You're already providing the thoughts on not just, well, is there a difference in confidence or, you know, I, I, I tell, I'll tell the ladies in our, in our club, arrogance right and regarding regarding the how arrogant the, your average computer science student is um, but you're also providing some interesting insights into into the the different dimensions of the depth of the gap here and I think this is really interesting and I'm wondering what would happen if if, the, if it were a male or a female um, chatbot if perhaps the the opposite sex would then be less likely you know oh I'm a guy I'm not gonna ask the girl chatbot Right. I mean, dudes are weird. They, don't, they totally see that happening, you know, but very interesting. Very good work. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for your questions. Well, this is Nancy. When I was in grad school, I had a, a female professor for uh, partial differential equations. And um, at, at one point I asked a question and uh, I said, I'm not sure I think this might be a dumb question. Keep in mind, we're talking about being in a grad course on partial differential equations. <laughs> and she said to me, women are always afraid of asking dumb questions. Uh, granted, this was a long time ago, but I think that perhaps some of that pattern is still there. And it may indeed figure into this question of male versus female voice in the chat bot. Yeah, I think it's definitely still there. And that's actually kind of what a lot of this research stemmed from is we were seeing in a lot of our introductory courses that women weren't asking questions. They would rather suffer in silence than get help. Yeah, and be held back, right? They are they are they are being demotivated by the fact when when even your most average. I'm sorry if I'm speaking like this, but you know, if even your most average guy student, typical white male student, would arrogantly move forward and believe that he is perfect and he's right, and therefore, and, and I've seen this quite a bit, um, demotivate a much more capable um, a female student or non Caucasian student. Because they're just, they don't feel empowered enough to speak up against the arrogance of the idiot, right? So it's almost like there's an inverse correlation. Some, the more idiotic of a person you are, of a, of a student you are, the more bolsterous you are, right? And and this is really demotivates some of some of the, of the students that I deal with. And so this this, I would strongly encourage you to keep to keep researching this and teach us how to do it right because we don't know. I, I want to interject. This is a great time for me to adver or advocate on Shirley's behalf. She's, we're trying to encourage her to look at PhD programs. She's considering them. She's not a PhD student. She started this as an undergrad, wrote the chat bot herself along with uh, Maddie Sherwood, another student, uh, and is now in our master's program where we have a PhD prep track. So if you have a good PhD program and you're looking for students, strongly recommend her. She's done 95% of the work on this project uh, and has earned her spot as a first author. So uh, she's done very well. Congratulations. I would encourage you to pursue a PhD program most certainly with if that's something that you're interested in researching. Also to help perhaps help you along the way, I'd like to remind you and everyone else here that if you want your video featured on the, uh, on the CC YouTube channel, um, please do let us know, or actually me, I guess, let me know and I'll, I'll make it happen for you. Sounds good, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, that brings us to the last talk, um, which will be given by Pamela Flores, 
Uh, she's associate professor at the National Polytechnic School in Ecuador. And uh, her research area is in computer science education research. And uh, the title of her talk will be Empirical Study on the Difficulties of Software Modeling Through Class Diagrams. Pamela, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm, I don't know if you are hear me very well. Yes. Okay, thanks uh, everyone for staying until the end. <laughs> I know we are a little late, but I will try to be uh, brief. I will share my presentation right now. Okay, I don't know if you can see it. Yes, we see it. Yes. Okay, as, as um, we... Uh, we know the, the paper is empirical study on the difficulties of software modeling through class diagrams. I am the first author. And um, this is the content of the uh, presentation. As you can see, first of all, I will talk about the motivation. Uh, I will skip the related work because uh, later I will talk about it. Uh, the research questions, the method, uh, the setting of this case study. Um, I will talk about the process of analysis qualitative and analysis quantitative part, the findings and the end of the conclusions. Um, the motivation, um, this research aims to explore and discover the problems or difficulties students and the undergraduate level face in their face attempts at modeling software. Uh, in this article, we report the results of an empirical case study that analyzes class diagrams expressed in the Unified Modeling Language, UML, by students enrolled in the lectures related to the computer science and the undergraduate level. Um, you can see the related work, but I will not talk about in this moment. Uh, you can see the reference at the end of the slide. But I will talk about the contribution of this research. Uh, in order to contribute to the literature on this topic, an empirical study was carried out. And uh, we um, identified uh, two contributions. The first one, uh, it identifies the difficulties of the students, specifically in the modeling of a problem through class diagrams. This is uh, the, the, the particularity. And second one, it permits a discussion of the frequency of problems that the students have when performing software design exercises. The first one is the difficulties in general, and the second one is the frequency of the difficulties. Um, the research was conducted by two research questions. The first one is what are the difficulties that students present when designing through class diagrams. And the second one is what are the most frequent difficulties that the students show when designing through class diagrams? Um, the method in this research um, uh, was, uh, con uh, was constituted by two parts. The first part is the qualitative analysis uh, through thematic analysis. Um, with, with this part, we um, identifying, analyzing, organizing, describing, and reporting uh, themes around three exercises applied at the beginning of the uh, academic period. And the second part is related with the frequency of problems. Uh, for this, it was necessary to make a quantitative analysis. And uh, it involves a process of abstraction of, from the qualitative uh, analysis uh, make it before. The setting. Um, first of all, the subject uh, was modeling and software design. It thought six hours per week for 16 weeks. Uh, 29 participants, the students of this subject, uh, the, lex the lecture structure, as you can see, uh, I show you the main themes in this subject. The tests uh, were conducted in the seventh week of the semester and consisted of the three exercises. 
the first exercise is related with the betting, betting exercise. Uh, this exercise involves the use of inheritance and decomposition. The second one, uh, circle exercise, uh, it was related to graphical objects that allows to understand how the uh, students conceive design problems. And the third, um, uh, third exercise, exercise hotel, is a transactional exercise. Uh, uh, this exercise was character characterized uh, the understanding how students use classes and relationships. Uh, the qualitative data analysis, analysis uh, took five steps. The first step was um, data collection from the exercises, from the three exercises. Uh, after that, we use a, sol a qualitative software, Atlas, uh, Atlas T. Uh, we conducted a deductive coding, was carried out based on the problems of the students identified by the authors previously in a previous paper that was published. Um, after that, uh, all calls obtained in the previous phase were reviewed one by one and subsequently matched or separated. And finally, we group of qualitative data conducted by two research questions. Uh, we obtained 266 refined codes were grouped into 15 categories. And with these 15 categories, we analyze uh, in qualitative way. Um, the findings, uh, can be summary in 15 sentences, as you can see. I will not read all of one, but I will try to explain the most frequent difficulties at the end. Uh, but uh, it's important to say that the 15 problems we uh, found in the exercises that the students uh, uh, realize in, in, in at the beginning of the of the academic period. For quantitative data analysis, uh, as you can see in this example, uh, the student number seven has been chosen to explain the analysis as part out with all the students. Uh, you can see in the figure in the graphic and the axis, the categories generated in the previous qualitative analysis. And the y axis, you can see the number of the occurrences of problems in each exercise. And in this example, you can see the student number seven, and you can see the three exercises, bed exercise, circle exercise, hotel exercise. And the blue color represents the exercise betting, the yellow color, the exercise circles, and the green color, the exercise hotel. After the analysis, uh, we analyzed uh, the 29 participants in the study. And the four more common problems found are ATR. ATR is related with attributes, I will explain later. Um, lead, L I S, uh, com, and whole. So, uh, in this graph, you can see the general summary of the old problems by category for each of the three exercises. Um, but I will talk about the general findings. First of all, um, the first difficult is the incorrect use of multiplicity between classes. Um, the difficulty is related with the multiplicity and it was persistent in a problem, um, a persistent problem in students. Um, a possible cause, uh, we cannot see the cause, uh, is uh, uh, the confusion in, in between ER model, entity relationship model, with the class diagram. And many students confuse the object or classes with the entity. Uh, because for this, uh, the multiplicity, uh, multiplicity was considered a difficulty. Um, it's possible 
uh, the difficulty caused by a lack of, of understanding of the concept of object, rather than not understanding how to construct UML class diagram. The second difficulty is uh, called COM. Uh, it's um, related with the classes with an inappropriate or insufficient behavior. It means uh, the concept of a class and object are very narrow. Uh, uh, however, an object is a concrete entity uh, that it exists in, in time and space. Uh, it has um, a space and a memory, while a class represents only an abstraction. Uh, in this case, students in this study have difficulties in giving the class the right behavior, and this has been represented in different ways, in three ways. The first one is sometimes uh, methods associated with the class do not correspond to the concept that uh, this class represents. The second is uh, sometimes there is an overload of methods with low cohesion between them and class without any behavior. The third difficulty found in our research is uh, called defining attributes that could be a class. This problem refers uh, to defining a concept as an attribute of a class instead of a, a class by itself due to its complexity. Uh, participants show a clear lack of an um, ability to abstract the, by not being able to conceptualize a class with its own behavior and reducing it to an attribute. And finally, um, not considering the problem from a holistic perspective, in this case, the exercise uh, was not considering the, in the holistic perspective, in the integral perspective. Uh, this category is related uh, to the fact that the students not conceive all aspects necessary for the resolution of the problem. Um, the conclusions, the, the main conclusions of this research is, as you can see, uh, we found 15 categories of problems for undergraduate students when designing software. Um, we uh, found four most frequent problems are assigning multiplicity between classes, defining classes with behaviors not related to their concept, uh, creating attributes that could be classes because of their complexity, not considering all the aspects required to solve a problem. Uh, with these two conclusions, we um, answered the research questions and uh, we we can see that probably the students face a lot of these problems because they were accustomed to the structure approach. It was very evident and neither uh, better understand the object oriented concepts. And we hope that these results allow to software design teachers um, to be more aware uh, of the difficulties of the students and apply more time in these difficulties. The future work is a study that was done. Uh, we examine, uh, we, um, we study this uh, test at the beginning of the academic period and the end. Uh, answer these questions, do the most frequent problem persist after training? Because uh, as you can see, uh, this test with the three exercises was applied at the beginning. So uh, the reference you can found in this slide. And this is the uh, last slide for my presentation. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, maybe before I uh, start uh, with asking for, for questions. I, I have a comment on, from my point of uh, view, because I'm, I'm teaching object-oriented analysis and design 
uh, with UML. And uh, you use the class diagrams just for design because it's a design lecture you're, you're talking about. Uh, but the class diagrams can be used through this, all the stages of, uh, let's say, software production. As uh, say Ian uh, says, we are doing software, producing software, not just development. Uh, and um, so uh, there might be some problems in which, which um, occur in, during design, which are not problems uh, in an early stage like analysis, for instance, a class uh, without any behavior. Because uh, behavior usually uh, coming up uh, during design when you design the when 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 you describe the solution space when you describe the the, the problem domain then you might have um, well uh, different uh, problems and also the the um, the concepts might might evolve from the problem domain towards the solution domain um, objects or classes. For instance, if you have an, um, a derived attribute in the, in the problem domain, then you, will, might, you might come up with a method uh, delivering a value for, for this uh, attribute in the, in the design. So that's uh, also, I think, uh, quite an interesting uh, view, uh, looking also at the um, other stages of development and problems with, with class diagrams, if you're focusing on class diagrams. But that's really very interesting. And uh, you're finding in, regarding design um, uh, are similar than, than we, we uh, um, experienced, yes. Thank you. Other questions, thank you, comments? Thank you, thank you for your comment because uh, it's not easy to study this part because uh, uh, the software design implies many concepts like, for example, abstraction. It's, it's not easy to, to teach these this concepts of these principles yeah. and it's not, it, it, it's very important I think for for development of the software, this stage, but um, not always uh, the, the students see in this way. Yeah, some problems in the design are also analysis problems because you kind of start from design, you have to start from, well, uh, analyzing the problem and then go towards the solution. So, so that's uh, maybe also um, origin of the pro problems. Uh, yeah, Bastian. Um, oh, maybe I have, have yeah, let's let's have a, have a question more of a comment. And I really appreciate this work, I must say, Pamela, Pamela very nicely done. And um, I noticed though, <laughs> you did the same thing that everyone else under the sun does, and the study in class diagrams, right? <laughs> And, and um, one thing that I deal with a lot is activity diagrams, much to the chagrin of, uh, of, of my PhD advisor, for example. But I would wow. encourage you to, yeah, he, 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 I don't know, doesn't matter. Um, what um, I would encourage you to, um, to keep going with this and consider perhaps other, di other diagram types, maybe, maybe not activity diagrams, but other kind, kind of diagrams, because what's missing and what would be invaluable, not just for instructors, but also for, well, modeling researchers would be some kind of a database of common errors, right? And their relative frequency. And I think I've seen a couple of years ago, there was the, the vague attempt of something like this at, uh, at RefSQ or at RE, I don't remember, uh, uh, or ER, I believe it was one of the conferences and I don't think they have continu continued with this, and I would. I think you have in a you're in a great position to to do this here, and this is great. Good job. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, at the beginning of the of the is research, uh, it starts with my PhD uh, work, but uh, I I was thinking to take another diagrams. Uh, I, I was thinking to combine the class diagram with another diagram, and I really appreciate your, your vision because uh, I know that the big picture uh, is better when you complete with another thing of the students uh, throw. 
uh, another diagrams and uh, I really appreciate your comment. Yeah, per perhaps, perhaps, you know, sequence diagrams, honestly, because, you know, they are, they are close to enough to a formal to ITU's message sequence charts, which are formal. And, and, and um, they are, their expressive power is much lower than, let's say, something like um, uh, activity diagrams or things like this. And their relative, the relative ambiguity is much lower than an activity diagram. So I think it would be a quick win to do something like sequence diagrams. Um, I will take into account. <laughs> but, but hey, listen, you know, what do I know? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for uh, to all of you. Um, maybe Nancy will give us a closing statement for for Xeed as a whole. <laughs> I wasn't expecting to do that, but uh, I really appreciate everyone who has uh, stayed with us. Um, all the conversations that I heard were great. I think that a lot of us are really missing being together in person. And so, and so we're really happy to have the opportunity to be together, even if it's just virtually. Uh, I heard a lot of excitement generated by the talks and the interactions today. Um, and so with that closing out our mini track, I'll hand it back over to Bastian, I guess, who is still hanging in there after a very long day. It's, it's been a long day indeed, but it's it's been a very very thankful day for me, and I must say thank you everyone for for those of you who are still around. Thanks for the interesting discussions, which is a staple of the CCD community. Every time um, uh, CCD happens, doesn't matter how it happens, online, virtually, or in person, part of C Hicks or every uh, every third year as part of the uh, joint software engineering education and training track at ICSI. Um, we have a very dense community of very enthusiastic people who would like to share ideas and are open to new ideas and not perhaps so ingrained into this is the one way to do it like, you know, some conferences sometimes are. Really appreciate this. My friends, thank you very much um, for, uh, for, for presenting, for participating, for bearing with us in these uncertain hicks, how is it going to happen times. Um, before we conclude, um, I would like to encourage you to please do two things. Um, firstly, um, well, three things really. Firstly, if you really want to, you know, send me your your um, your um, uh, the video of your pre-recorded presentation, and I'll put it on the YouTube channel for you. Uh, I'll let you know even know, know the link that that I produce. Then, uh, if you haven't done so already, please join our mailing list. You'll see on your screen right now the link to it. Um, I promise you, we will not send you spam. We will send you maybe two or three messages. Okay, fine. Maybe four messages a day, a year. I'm sorry. Oh, my Lord. A year in a year, giving you newest and latest um, uh, uh, news about when the next conference will happen. As you know, every third year or so, Hicks will join, uh, uh, CC will join Hicks. Uh, and every uh, when, when CC will happen in 2023 isn't quite decided yet. But when, once the steering committee decides, we will post it on the mailing list. So please stay in touch. And until then, if you haven't gotten enough yet from software engineering education, I'd like to point out the SEENG, Software Engineering for Educating the Next Generation Workshop that happens in May at ICSI. The submission deadline for research papers are is uh, January 14th with a not unreasonable chance of it being extended by a couple of days. Um, but, you know, ICSI is very, very strict about these things. So don't tell me about Bastion said. Okay. So please consider submitting a paper there. Please consider joining our mailing list. And please consider joining us again by submitting your paper next year. With that there, being said. Also, if I can jump in on that, um, this in 2022, we share the uh, software engineering education track with ICSI. So uh, obviously yes. the papers have already been decided upon, but it's yet another opportunity to uh, see what's going on in, in part of our community. And um, I can't remember if they are all virtual or are hoping to be hybrid. 
either way, there would be an opportunity to participate probably at, at low cost uh, if, if you want to keep tuned on that. And of course, the workshop will be in, in conjunction with the conference itself and the software engineering education track. That's my last word for now. That was a good word to end the conference with. Everyone, thanks for joining us. See you soon. Okay. Thanks, bye-bye. Elke, you're a trooper, bye -bye. good night. <laughs> Thank you, it's, here is still, it's already tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> bye. Good night, bye.